passed along. Uh, Paula, stand by for, for a moment, if you would. Ed O'Keefe is also at the Capitol here. Uh, Ed, what are you hearing? Well, uh, Jeff, what, footsteps sort of uh, came calling about uh, 12 minutes ago. We were getting word here that Justice Department officials were headed to Capitol Hill to formally uh, tell members of the House and Senate Judiciary Committees that the report was complete and in the Attorney General's possession. That's following the law. That was what was expected. Congress is on recess, not returning until Monday evening, but their staffs have been here waiting for the possibility of this. Washington really uh, has been waiting uh, for, for the last several days on, under the anticipation that it would be arriving. And so we don't yet have a media congressional reaction, but we know this, that no matter what this report says, Congress is pushing to see as much of it as possible. The House, just before its recess, unanimously voted calling on the Justice Department to publicly release the entire report to the American public, saying that it should be seen. And regardless of whatever the Justice Department concludes through this investigation, investigations will continue here on Capitol Hill of a political nature. That's why you saw Michael Cohen up here in recent weeks testifying. While there will be other people involved in these, uh, in these various affairs testifying in the coming weeks, while Democrats are still debating whether or not to go after the president's personal tax returns, his business tax returns, the business records and, and other information regarding his children and other administration officials. All of that rests on whatever might be in this report and whatever the American public may learn about it, either in the coming hours or at some point next week. All right, Ed, please, you stand by as well. Paula, the, the president has showed a reasonable amount of optimism this week about what he believes is going to be in that final report. That's right. And he has every right to be optimistic because so far there has been no indication uh, that there will be evidence of criminal wrongdoing on the part of the president. I've not seen any evidence of a criminal conspiracy involving directly involving the president. Now, there were also questions about possible obstruction of justice and whether or not the president has tried to interfere with this investigation. That's still an outstanding question. But I think the president has good reason to be optimistic uh, that he there will be no evidence of criminal wrongdoing on his part. But he still should be very concerned concerned about what's going on with federal prosecutors in New York and all these other investigations going on across the country. All right, Jonathan Turley from uh, George Washington uh, Law School is standing by with us as well in our D.C. Bureau. Um, Jonathan, did you expect this this afternoon? I did. Uh, it makes sense. Often we have these types of submissions on a late Friday, and so it follows a, a course of pattern. Uh, but uh, I think what we're going to see unfold next could be quite fascinating within the Department of Justice. Uh, Rosenstein has said in the past, that's a deputy attorney general, that he does not believe that the Justice Department should reveal information about people who are not charged. Uh, that was the whole controversy involving former director James Comey, and Rosenstein came down very hard against Comey in a previous memo. So there may be a lot of discussions happening over at the Justice Department of what to do with this report. But the next step, which is required under the law, is that Bill Barr, the attorney general, will have to give a summary of the findings of the special counsel to Congress. That is all he's required to do. But that doesn't mean that he can't release the report in some form. Right, so, but in terms of the, the, the process now, in releasing that then. Jonathan, take us through a little bit more. We talked to Paul a bit, a bit about it. How long do you expect that process to take? Well, it depends a lot, as Paula indicated, on the length of this report. If the report itself was given to Congress, it would most certainly have classified information, Rule 6C or grand jury information, even Privacy Act protected information. All that has to be scrubbed out if it's going to be made public. That can take time if it's a long report. Now, clearly, Congress can be given a classified report under seal. But the first step, as soon as this weekend, will be that Bill Barr will brief them on the summary of the findings and, and what, it, what, in fact, the, the special counsel was able to turn over. Then we'll have this debate, I think, first within the Justice Department as to whether it's appropriate for prosecutors to give more about an individual like President Trump or others when they are not indicting them. Now, we don't know what this report says. For all we know, the summary could say we found crimes. But the expectation, judging from past filings, is that they didn't find a crime connected to collusion or direct collusion with the Russians. And we're going just 
solely on the speaking indictments filed by the special counsel. All right, Jonathan, stand by if you would uh, as well. But back to Paula Reed at the White House. Paula, we've got three possible outcomes here, right? I mean, one is there's a finding from the report that says the president broke the law, uh, which would be the worst outcome for the president's. Um, in this case, uh, Robert Mueller concludes that the president either obstructed justice or colluded or both. In that case, um, right now the Justice Department does not believe they can indict a sitting president, but they have to make a determination about what happens whether when he's in office or, or after he leaves. Second conclusion, he didn't break the law. Best possible case for the president. The third is that murky outcome, though, right, where, where there's no charges but some misconduct. And that's right. And that is really the most likely scenario here is that perhaps Mueller lays out some evidence of not criminal wrongdoing, but perhaps poor decision making or decisions that the president should not have made in that report. But then Barr has to decide whether or not he would release that because, again, the Justice Department policy is that you do not release information about people who are not charged. So that would be a very difficult spot for the attorney general. What to do with any evidence uh, against the president? Ed O'Keefe, back to you on Capitol Hill. Uh, talk, talk about the process of, um, of Congress then digesting this information. Well, part of why they're so eager to see what exactly was concluded and, and what exactly can be consumed publicly is because Democrats need to then figure out where are there potential avenues that Mueller either did pursue and for whatever reason didn't complete or perhaps other blind spots that they will determine should be explored in whatever way. And, and, and that's part of why there's been a delay up here uh, among the committees that many people thought would have launched almost immediately into investigations. They're waiting. Uh, one example for uh, the, the Ways and Means Committee over in the House, the Tax Writing Committee, has uh, really been uh, distressed over exactly how much it should look into the president's tax returns and, and there are calls from some uh, in the liberal democratic wing to perhaps go after his business records as well. There's some resistance among leadership to do that, at least not until they see the report. Then of course remember you saw House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi say last week that impeachment is something that's just not worth it uh, unless there is overwhelming evidence and bipartisan support to pursue that. And that is a very high bar and one that Democratic leadership has been holding to. Notably there was a poll out this week that suggested that among Democrats the support for impeaching the president has actually dropped, whether that's because Pelosi has convinced him of that or because Democrats now realize perhaps it's just not worth it, that remains to be seen. But so much of where things could go up here will determine, will, will be determined by what exactly is in that report and what exactly the Justice Department shares with the country. All right, I have a copy of that letter now that um, the new attorney general has now passed along to Congress. In it, he says, the special counsel has submitted to me today a, quote, confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions he's reached as required by 28 CFR. I'm reviewing the report and anticipate I may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. That's where we talk about this weekend. Um, Paula, at what point do we hear or, or see from Robert Mueller in person? Likely when he's subpoenaed by congressional lawmakers. It is expected within the special counsel's office that no matter how much Barr releases, it won't be enough, specifically for Democrats. They've said that they will try to investigate the full report. They will try to subpoena it, even potentially subpoena Robert Mueller. It is likely, it is expected, based on what sources have told me, that he would comply uh, with that subpoena, and he may be called before Congress to testify. I think that is most likely uh, the next time we will see him. We are, though, getting some more details, Jeff, though. I just received an email, some details from the Justice Department about exactly how this all went down today. I'm told that the report was delivered by a security officer from the special counsel's office to the deputy attorney general. Within minutes, it was brought to the attorney general's office. Now, the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, he's the one who appointed the special counsel. He has overseen the investigation through its entirety. Um, he continues to be the liaison between the Justice Department and the special counsel's office. You and that he will have a big part to play as Barr makes all these important decisions about how much, if anything, can be made public. Right. So let's be clear here again. We don't know what's in this report uh, right no. now, Paula. We do know the report is still confidential. We do know that it marks mm -hmm. the end of the probe um, mm -hmm. and certainly sets, sets the stage for um, a good number of public fights here right now. It is worth reminding people the court filings that we've seen so far have certainly made one thing clear that, that the special counsel is evidence that Russian operatives were involved in an effort to help 
the Trump campaign. Um, we know there have certainly been indictments. There have been guilty pleas. Uh, many people have been pulled into this net, into this investigation so far. Uh, the question is how high that goes, and the question is how long it takes to get there. Uh, we mentioned uh, we had Jonathan Turley standing by. He said he wasn't surprised by the timing this afternoon. Paul, I have to ask you, um, the fact that it comes at 5 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, does that surprise you? Nothing surprises me with this investigation, uh, Jeff. There has been a pattern with the special counsel uh, dropping things on Fridays, but I can tell you they drop things every other day of the week as well. What we've been seeing, though, with this investigation are all these signs that the investigation was wrapping up in a matter of weeks or even days. We haven't seen the Mueller grand jury in over a month. Uh, we know that they've been passing a lot of work off to local federal prosecutors, and recently several of the top investigators on that team stepped down. So we were expecting this. A lot of momentum sort of building here in Washington anticipation. But the fact is, Barr doesn't have to make any of these findings public. Today we get the letter. We know that he has the report. But now the big question in D.C. will be, well, how much will we get to see of this report? All right. And Sarah, I'm just seeing, uh, excuse me, Paul, I'm just seeing this, this tweet in from uh, the president's uh, press spokesperson, Sarah Sanders. She says, uh, the tweet says, the next steps are up to Attorney General Barr, and we look forward to the process taking its course. The White House has not received nor been briefed on the special counsel's report. Uh, Jonathan Turley, back to you. You said you're not surprised on the timing at this point. What would surprise you? Well, there's a lot of questions out there, a lot of torpedoes in the water. I mean, first, there's the big C question of collusion. Uh, did they find any evidence of collusion running between the campaign and the Russians? But there's also the question of obstruction. Even if there's not an underlying crime connected to collusion, you can still commit obstruction. Uh, it, it's sort of hard to do, but you can do it. You can try to stop an investigation into what proved to be not a crime. There's also collateral crimes, and whether this, the special counsel will get into that. There is a very difficult campaign finance allegation against the president, one that was treated as a criminal matter with his former personal attorney, Michael Cohen. So there's a lot of, of scope that could be covered by the special counsel uh, in this report. Now, the key to keep in mind, though, is that even if the special counsel is called before Congress, he's not an independent counsel. He is part of the executive branch. He's part of the Justice Department. He's a subordinate to the attorney general. So whatever he might say to Congress is entirely controlled by Department of Justice policies and ultimately Bill Barr. Ed O'Keefe remains on Capitol Hill. You have, you have some new information rolling in here as Congress prepares to get this um, briefing potentially here this weekend. What are you hearing? Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Um, you know, and this, again, speaks to the calls from Democrats, especially Republicans also in the House, to have this full report released. Within moments of its release, one of the presidential candidates on the Democratic side, Cory Booker, tweeting, simply, this report should be made public immediately. Separately from that, uh, Mark Warner, the vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, t uh, sent out a statement just a little while ago saying, quote, Congress and the American people deserve to judge the facts for themselves. The special counsel's report must be provided to Congress immediately, and the attorney general should swiftly prepare a declassified version of the report for the public. Nothing short of that will suffice. That shows you, that lays down the marker of what Democrats are now expecting in the wake of this uh, completion of the report. It's also critical, Warner says, that all documents related to the special counsel's investigation be preserved and made available to the appropriate congressional committees. One of those congressional committees is the House Judiciary Committee, led by Jerry Nadler, congressman from Manhattan, and he just tweeted a short while ago that Attorney General Barr has confirmed the completion of the special counsel investigation. We look forward to getting the full Mueller report and related materials. Transparency and the public interest demand nothing less. The need for public faith in the rule of law must be the priority. That demand by Democrats is going to fly in the face of Justice Department guidelines that say they're not going to release information about people whom they did not necessarily charge. Democrats want to see everything, the raw material that didn't make it into the report, plus the report, and every person that might have been interviewed. That's a high bar, and it's setting up a significant political conflict potentially here in the coming days. In other Jeff. words, an open, ugly fight over secret documents. Absolutely. All right, Ed, thanks very much. Uh, Jeff Pegues is with us now. He's our justice correspondent. Jeff, you have some new information here on. So how does this report then get delivered? 
uh, from the special counsel's office to the attorney general's office? Well, that's a good question. Obviously, a lot of this process has been shrouded in secrecy for the most part, but today now we're getting uh, sort of a readout of how this report was turned over to the Department of Justice. We're told sometime this afternoon it was handed off to the uh, deputy attorney general, that of course being Rod Rosenstein, who's overseen this investigation for the last almost two years. He then immediately delivered it to the attorney general. And so now it is the attorney general, of course, who will take the process from here. Letters, the letter that we've been talking about was, of course, delivered to the Hill at about 5 p.m. So that is the, the best and latest information that we have now about how this report was delivered. It was handed off by a security officer who came from the special counsel's office and then delivered the report to the deputy attorney general. Jeff. What sort of heads up is given, Jeff? Well, it, it, it seems like there was some sort of uh, warning that this was coming at some point this week. Of course, you remember the president's uh, remarks throughout the week about the report and how he felt about the report and, and how he felt John McCain uh, enabled some of this process. Yeah. So there seemed to be some inkling that something was coming uh, either yesterday or today. But as far as when exactly the report was to be delivered. Uh, apparently it happened this afternoon. We don't know if DOJ was, uh, if the Department of Justice was given some kind of warning that it was about to come. Paula, is the special counsel's office then now, Paula, read back to you at the White House, is the special counsel's office then now closed? Essentially, yes. Even if it isn't physically shut down, uh, their investigation is now concluded. His obligation under the law is to present this report to the attorney general when his work is done. Now, there are still some outstanding cases. Of course, you have some issues uh, related to Paul Manafort. He has some restitution he needs to pay. And what's interesting is you've sort of seen in the court documents, they've already kind of handed that off to federal prosecutors to handle the rest of that. There's also the outstanding prosecution of Roger Stone. But sort of one of the first signals that we saw that this was all winding down is when Roger Stone was charged, not only was it the special counsel, they also teamed up with a local U.S. attorney's office here in D.C. It was the first time we had ever seen that. And that was a sign that the special counsel was perhaps preparing, if they were to wind down, a way to pass off their work. So the U.S. attorney's office here in Washington, they will now uh, proceed with the prosecution of Roger Stone. So, yeah, the special counsel's work is done. Any outstanding issues will Will likely be handled by federal prosecutors. Since Robert Mueller's appointment, his team has indicted or gotten guilty pleas from 34 individuals mm -hmm. and three companies. That includes 25 Russians, as well as Michael Cohen, his former personal lawyer, Michael Flynn, uh, Mr. Trump's first national security advisor, and also Paul Manafort, his former campaign chairman. Uh, we should note the president has, of course, repeatedly referred to the Mueller investigation uh, as a witch hunt. Uh, he says there has been uh, no collusion with Russia. But Paula, part of this then uh, begs the question, as some of these cases now continue, um, what happens to those, whether it's Roger Stone, whatever else? Roger Stone's case could potentially uh, wind up as a guilty plea, and he may not have the resources, either emotional or financial, to go through a trial. But then there's the outstanding question of what happens to all of these plea deals and convictions that the special counsel has secured. The president has signaled that he is open to possibly pardoning some of these people. But again, a presidential pardon does not insulate you from state level charges. And some of these folks, including Paul Manafort, do face state prosecution potentially. So even if the president does offer them a pardon, uh, they may not be out of the woods in terms of their criminal liability. But there are these other investigations percolating, uh, specifically the ones in New York. Uh, the president's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, uh, is one of the cooperating witnesses. Uh, prosecutors in New York have already secured guilty pleas from AMI, the publisher of the National Enquirer, and its chairman, David Pecker. They've all pleaded guilty to campaign finance violations, and the president has been implicated in that case as individual one, as having directed these crimes. And it appears that the president's potential exposure is greatest in that case. Now, he was just asked about that this morning on Fox Business. Uh, he said he didn't know anything about it. His lawyer said it's not a problem. Well, the fact is he has been uh, implicated in court documents and in congressional testimony. So, well, I think everyone is suggesting, oh, the special counsel investigation's wrapped up. This is the end of the president's legal troubles. No, his, his legal troubles are far from over. To reset what we know right now, Paula, special counsel Robert Mueller has concluded his investigation into Russian election interference and possible coordination with associates 
of the president. The White House was notified between 435 and 440 this afternoon that the Justice Department had received this report. The letter was has been delivered by now to members of Capitol Hill. Rod Rosenstein was expected to call Robert Mueller on Friday to thank him for his work these last two years. As that work has now concluded and as uh, lawmakers react, Ed O'Keefe remains on Capitol Hill. Ed, I have to assume that uh, reaction just continues to roll in. What do you have? Jeff, were you talking to me? Yes, I was. What are you hearing there, Ed? Sorry, Jeff. Uh, uh, we're just receiving uh, a joint statement from uh, Speaker Pelosi and, and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, the two who really would guide the Democrats' response to all this. I'll just read it verbatim because it was texted to me by one of their aides. Now that Special Counsel Mueller has submitted his report to the Attorney General, it's imperative for Mr. Barr, the Attorney General, to make the full report public and provide its underlying documentation and findings to Congress. Attorney General Barr must not give President Trump, his lawyers, or his staff any, and they put this in quotes, sneak preview of Special Counsel Mueller's findings or evidence, and the White House must not be allowed to interfere in decisions about what parts of those findings or evidence are made public. The Special Counsel's investigation focused on questions that go to the integrity of our democracy itself, whether foreign powers corruptly interfered in our elections and whether unlawful means were used to hinder that investigation. The American people have a right to the truth. The watchword is transparency. What, reading between the lines there, first of all, amazing that they would even have to say out loud that they believe there's a possibility that the attorney general would ever give a sneak preview to the president before informing Congress and the rest of the American people. That shows you how raw uh, things are here between Congress, the White House, the Justice Department, Democrats and Republicans. But what that also signals is that whatever Barr does now in the next 24 hours, 48 hours, as he reviews that material and then formally informs Congress of the findings that he can share, that might be the most critical moment now uh, to determine how exactly the American public and certainly Congress respond to all of this. If there's any sense that he's delaying things, trying to button it up, uh, whitewash any of the findings, uh, Democrats are certainly going to pounce on him. And remember, he vowed during his confirmation hearings to follow the letter of the law, which was obviously, and, and the guidelines that are set by the Justice Department, which was a signal that that doesn't mean everything will be released. And nothing short of everything being released will upset every single member of the House of Representatives that voted before their recent this week to call on the Justice Department for the full release of the entire Mueller report. Uh, Elizabeth, the Democratic candidates for 2020 also reacting very quickly as well here at on Twitter. Uh, Elizabeth Warren saying Attorney General Barr released the Mueller report to the American public now. Julian Castro, the American people deserve to know the full truth about Russia's interference in our democracy. But Paula, the notion or the hint or suggestion um, from, from Chuck Schumer's office or Nancy Pelosi's office that some sort of sneak preview would be given is a pretty serious charge. Well, absolutely. And so far, there is no evidence to back that up. Right now, Mueller's only obligation was to deliver this report to the attorney general. We've confirmed that has happened. But again, he says he may be able to provide additional information as soon as this weekend. But really, that's just the beginning. As Ed noted, he's absolutely right. This just sets the stage for more partisan fights on the Hill and many subpoenas that are likely to go out, uh, not only to the special counsel, likely to the deputy attorney general and the attorney general. All right, those are the political fights. I want to circle back to Jeff Pegues as well uh, for more on the investigation itself and more on this process of how all of this happened, because it's, it's, it's received so much extraordinary attention here, um, Jeff, on exactly what happened this afternoon. What other insight do you have on what happens, not just tonight, but then over the weekend? Well, over the weekend, there will be this rush to try to gather as much information, uh, especially on the part of reporters, about what is in this document. There's going to be so much anticipation uh, about what the attorney general will tell members of Congress. And, of course, are here in Washington and certainly among law enforcement types. They understand that when you tell members of Congress, there's a good chance the story is going to leak out. So uh, over the next several hours, over the next 24 to 48 hours, there's going to be this rush, Jeff, to try to get as much information about the conclusions in that report uh, as fast as possible. Hey. Jeff Pegues, thank you very much. Uh, our justice correspondent, Paula Reed, was at the White House for us. Also, um, Ed O'Keefe on Capitol Hill.
Uh, but to recap what we know at this hour, Special Counsel Robert Mueller has concluded his investigation into Russian election interference and possible coordination with associates of President Donald Trump. That report has been submitted. Now the question is, what happens to it? How much gets released and when? That is up to the new attorney general, Bill Barr. He likely will be briefing members of Congress this weekend. Then he will decide how much of that gets released to the public. We wait for all of that to play out tonight, this weekend, and into next week. That is the very latest of what we know right now. Again, the special counsel investigation is over. Much more on the Mueller report on your local news on this CBS station, on our streaming service, CBSN, and a full report on tonight's CBS Evening News. Until then, I'm Jeff Glor, CBS News in New York. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Dennis. Thank you for joining us. The so-called witch hunt is over, and now Washington waits. After 22 months, special counsel Robert Mueller has finished his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election and has submitted the final report to the Department of Justice. The probe has resulted in dozens of indictments for federal crimes, reaching members of the president's inner circle, his campaign, and Russian citizens. The findings are now in the hands of Attorney General William Barr, in a letter to Congress, Barr said that he is reviewing the report and that he could advise them of the special counsel's conclusions as soon as this weekend. During his confirmation in January, Barr said that he would try to be as transparent as possible about the report, but stopped short of promising to actually release it. All I can say right now is my goal and intent is to get as much information out as I can, Thank consistent you. with the regulations. So in the minute that I... Earlier this week, the president said that the public should see it. Let it come out. Let people see it. That's up to the attorney general. We have a very good attorney general. He's a very highly respected man. And we'll see what happens. With all of that being said, I look forward to seeing the report. Well, Mueller may be done with his report, but talk of potential Trump campaign ties to Russia looks far from over. Nicole Killian is traveling with the president in West Palm Beach, Florida right now. Nicole, have we gotten reaction from the White House yet? And from Sarah Sanders, uh, the White House press secretary, it reads as follows. The next steps are up to Attorney General Barr, and we look forward to the process taking its course. The White House has not received or been briefed on the special counsel's report. So uh, that statement from Sarah Sanders. Now, right now, the president is at his uh, Mar-a-Lago estate. Uh, at this point, his day, for the most part, has concluded. But uh, White House reporters uh, with the president, uh, otherwise known as the pool. Uh, we're told a uh, short time ago uh, that uh, there is a lid until 730, which means it's possible we could see from or hear from the president uh, later on this evening. Uh, we do know that there was a Republican dinner scheduled tonight at his club. It was unclear if he planned to attend or stop by. Sometimes he has in the past. Uh, so that is something that we will be looking to to see if maybe that might be the venue for remarks. Uh, or if something else is planned or if we get a further statement uh, from the president this evening. Being there with the president, did you feel any sense that he knew that this was actually coming? Well, he certainly talked about it before arriving here in Mar-a-Lago. Uh, he told reporters, you know, he had no idea uh, when this report was coming out. He also said, we'll see what happens. And he continued to insist, as he's been doing for uh, months now, uh, saying that there was no collusion, uh, that this was a big hoax uh, and a witch hunt. Uh, so uh, really not tipping his hand if he did know something. Uh, one thing I will just say from observation uh, that's 
been interesting is that certainly there has been a flurry of news uh, surrounding the president. You know, we've been chasing one headline after the other, for instance, uh, regarding the sanctions about uh, North Korea uh, that the president tweeted he was uh, ordering the withdrawal of those sanctions. And then there, uh, prior to that, he said that he was going to nominate a new Fed chair. And uh, he also, when he was traveling down here to Mar-a-Lago, talked about uh, ISIS. Uh, and when he got off the plane here, uh, said that the caliphate uh, had essentially been eliminated and uh, was explaining that. So, you know, he certainly uh, was trying to uh, convey a lot of different news to reporters. And so one may wonder if maybe that could have been perhaps a distraction of something to come. But that is purely a speculation. But uh, certainly a lot of reporters have been spending the better part of this afternoon chasing down uh, these various uh, news nuggets, uh, more or less, uh, that the president has been putting out uh, this afternoon. We are seeing a flurry of tweets coming in right now from presidential candidates, the first, uh, the Democratic candidate, Cory Booker saying that this report should be made public immediately. And I've got Elizabeth Warren, all uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, they're all kind of echoing the same sentiment. What comes next? And do you think that it actually will then be released from what you're hearing? Well, certainly the president has been asked about that on numerous occasions, and he has uh, pretty much kept uh, a pretty uh, fair line on it, saying that it is up to the attorney general to decide. Uh, the White House has also uh, essentially said that. So at this point, uh, certainly what comes next is, as we're all doing, is we just wait. Uh, you know, now that we know that this report has been concluded, and now that we know that uh, Congress has been notified about this, the next step again is for the attorney general to decide how much of this, if any, should be released. And that really depends on the volume of this report, how uh, detailed it is, how long it is, uh, you know, how much, uh, how long it may take the attorney general to uh, make those kinds of decisions. As you said, uh, perhaps some of those conclusions could be reached as soon as this weekend. Uh, but certainly uh, that is a big question uh, right now. All right, Nicole, thank you so much for your insight. I'm sure we will be checking back in with you. Just wanted to touch a little bit on something that she just said as far as the weekend. We are hearing talks about this. It's a one-page letter that the attorney general has since released. And in it, he says, I remain committed to as much transparency as possible, and I will keep you informed as a status of my review. What was given to him was basically the review um, that Mueller found all of his conclusions. Then Attorney General William Barr will write his own review and inform Congress of exactly what he has been finding. But he also says that the special counsel has submitted to me today a confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions he has reached as required by 28 CFR. I am reviewing the report and anticipate that I may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. So we are waiting to hear more about what will be in that report. But remember, there is actually no law that says he has to release all of it. And that is why we are having so many candidates saying that they would like transparency. We also have uh, the press secretary here for the president, Sarah Sanders, saying that the next steps are up to Attorney General Barr. And we look forward to the process taking its course. The White House has not received or been briefed on the special counsel's report, which brings in another point. We heard from Nancy Pelosi, also Schumer as well. Uh, I'm just kind of generalizing what they said here in a statement. They said, please don't give a sneak peek to the president. They were speaking uh, to the attorney general in doing that. So that's something that's very interesting. They want to make sure that everyone uh, in Congress is informed prior to the president having any type of insight as to what was actually found in this report. But this is the breaking news that we are following this evening. Came out just about 40 minutes ago or so that the Mueller report is now complete. We are talking two years of an investigation starting back in like May of 2017 that the attorney general Barr must release the full report to the public is what others are calling on. The American people deserve to know the facts. So again, we've been watching this closely. We um, heard that this was all going down around five o'clock this evening, and that has been the timeline that we have found. This is basically now the Mueller report is giving a summary of decisions to the attorney general. Not necessarily all of the findings, all of the investigative steps, but a report that he wrote. We assume that it's not very long because this was delivered to the attorney general's office around five o'clock. And then within 15 minutes or so, we received this other statement that said that the attorney general would be able to then 
probably brief everyone by this weekend, but he is only required to brief Congress, not release it in its entirety. Some of the other things that people are saying here, um, Vice Chairman of the Senate Select Committee saying that uh, the Congress and the American people deserve to judge the facts for themselves. The president saying, yes, go ahead, release it. I would like everyone to be informed. It's also critical that all documents related to the special counsel's investigation be preserved and made available to the appropriate congressional committees. So let's go ahead and talk to Joseph Moreno, joining me now by phone. He is a former federal prosecutor and former special assistant U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Joseph, thank you for being here. Big night. This has been long awaited. What happens next? Alex, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've had so many false alarms in the last two years with what's happening, and now the day is finally here. And so th that's exactly the question. What comes next? I mean, it's interesting to hear the calls from, from certain you know, members on the Hill to say this, the report should be released immediately. That's not really realistic. Right? We have no idea if this is five pages or 500 pages. We don't know if it contains classified information. It probably does. So my guess is Bill Barr will have a bit of a grace period. I mean, we waited almost two years. Another two or three or four days, I think, won't be the end of the world. However, the public's patience will be limited. He's not going to have a lot of time to sit on this. So hopefully, as he mentioned in his letter to Congress, he will be in a position to at least brief Congress at a high level, perhaps as early as tomorrow or Sunday. But then we'll see from there, it's going to be an epic battle over what exactly happens and whether or not the public will be will be uh, uh, you know, okay with just a summary or if they want the actual raw report itself. And so the attorney general has said before that he wants to be as transparent as possible. But from my understanding of this, this report that Mueller gave him is a summary of decisions. Then the attorney general will actually write his own report to brief to Congress. So he is going to be pulling excerpts out of the entirety of the report to then disclose to Congress. That's right. So in the short term, that's probably what we're looking at in terms of what's Congress going to hear. It could be a very brief executive summary, effectively. It could be bullet points as to the, the major findings and the major decisions, and that's it. So the question will be then, will Congress be satisfied with that? The answer most definitely is no. Then the question is, will the public be satisfied with that? And the answer most definitely, again, is no. So I think it's going to be really an issue now of what is the information flow going from the Justice Department to Capitol Hill, how quickly and how thorough is it going to be? And I want to read a section of Barr's letter to Congress saying, quote, the special counsel regulations require that I provide you with a, a desperation and an explanation of instances, if any, in which the attorney general or acting attorney general concluded that a proposed action by a special counsel was so inappropriate or unwarranted under established departmental practices that it should not be pursued and that's for 28 CFR 600.93, there were no such instances during the special counsel's investigation, unquote. Can you explain really what that legal jargon means to us? Sure. So we know that Bob Mueller was responsible for the probe on a daily basis, but he still had to check in with the attorney general, or in, in the case of most of this time, the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein. So that means that for any kind of major decisions, perhaps a charging decision or a subpoena or uh, an opening a new avenue in, in the investigation, he would have to check with the deputy attorney general to get permission. And so what this provision in the regulation says is if at any time, any of those decisions or any of those requests to the attorney general were denied, let's say they were not allowed to pursue a lead or not allowed to bring charges, then those decisions would have had to have been documented and reported to Congress. So what this letter is telling us is that in the course of the last two years, it seems like no major request by the special counsel's office to investigate or prosecute or bring charges or settle a case were denied by the attorney general or the deputy attorney general. That's a good thing because that was a concern all along that the special counsel would be hamstrung or would be limited in, the, in what he could look at. And it seems, based on this letter, that didn't happen, which is a good thing. In the nearly two-year probe, yes, we know it shadows Trump's presidency, but it's also resulted in felony charges against 34 people, including six people who serve as Trump's campaign. So will more uh, charges come out of this, do you think? And then who would be deciding who actually is charging? 
So the special counsel's office is effectively done, right? They can basically go home now and get a well-deserved break. It doesn't mean that they won't pop up on Capitol Hill for testimony, but they're finished. So if any charges are still to come at the federal level, that could be either different components of the Justice Department or it could be individual U.S. attorneys' offices. And we've seen some of those cases, like in the case of Michael Cohen up in the Southern District of New York. So if there's going to be any kinds of criminal charges, it'll be the Justice Department, but it will not be, most likely, Special Counsel Mueller or his team. Of course, state charges are also a possibility. And then, of course, Congress could take action against the president if they feel that there was some kind of high crime or misdemeanor or other behavior that deserves impeachment. So you could see further federal charges, you could see state charges, or you could see congressional investigation and possibly action. I heard another legal analyst say that it's not atypical for a report like this to be brought out on a Friday evening. To me, I didn't expect it to be on a Friday evening as we head into the weekend. Why does this seem to be a common practice? So, it, 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 honestly, in my experience, it's largely an innocent kind of thing. You set a deadline for yourself. You say, look, we want to get this done by the weekend. And then, sure enough, the week flies by. It gets to be closed of business on Friday, and you cut yourself off and say, let's go forward with this. So I, I think it was probably less a pre-planned effort to drop it on this particular Friday. It was probably aiming for this week. And just it's human nature. You want to make the product as best you can, cross every T, dot every I. And most likely, they said at some point, you know what? cut it off. Let's get this thing done. It's close of business. Let's get it out the door. All right, Joseph Samrana, thank you so much. Hang with us because I'm sure we'll be talking to you again. I also want to bring in right now CBS News Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Begays. Jeff, you've been on this. It's been a two-year wait. Here we are. So what are we hearing now from the Justice Department? Well, we're hearing from CBS News sources that the special counsel is not recommending any more indictments, which, you know, if you're in the White House, you might see that as a win. But you still have to look at what's in the, the nuts and bolts of that report that was just handed over to the Department of Justice. Uh, so, you know, after all of this, to get to this point and to your question, Alex, it's, you know, we're waiting to see what is in this report. If it's a multi-page report, if, it is, if it's 10 pages, 20 pages, 100 pages, we just don't know. And that is the big question now. What is in that report? Okay, so we now know that uh, the special counsel's office is not recommending any more indictments. So does that clear the president? Well, we just don't know because obviously uh, you, you may have heard by now that the Department of Justice has this policy where you you cannot indict a president. So uh, is it just that uh, Mueller is sticking to that policy or did he find that there was no wrongdoing on, a, on the part of the president? And so these are some of the questions that we will have until this report in some fashion is released to the public. Do we have any idea what or how the Justice Department is going to decide what they will choose to release? Well, it depends. I mean, this is a national security counterintelligence investigation. And what that means is there is likely a lot of information in that document that is uh, classified, that is not meant for the public to see. Uh, you, If you follow the investigation, there have been some uh, court papers where some of the information has been redacted, uh, in part to preserve the in investigation, but also to protect uh, some of these secrets. Uh, and so when you look at this report and its final uh, phase, you have to wonder how much of it will be free of any sort of uh, top secret classified information that the public cannot see. Uh, and so that's what is at play here, too, as the attorney general goes through this document. He is committed to, uh, he has said, transparency. So as he goes through this document, how much of it will he be able to reveal? That said, there is this thing in Washington, D.C., where leaks are as common as potholes. So, <laughs> you know, you can try to keep all of this information uh, from the public. However, somehow, some way, it always ultimately gets out. And I think it's important to note, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but information isn't typically released about individuals if they are not indicted specifically. So there may be people mentioned and things uh, that went into the investigation that won't be released specifically to protect that person. Well, exactly. But if you recall in 2016, during the, the uh, election, 
uh, James Comey, the former FBI director, came out and he made that statement about Hillary Clinton, who was not indicted, but he essentially scolded her for her use of private uh, a private email server. And so that sort of set a precedent back in 2016, one that James Comey has had a hard time living down. But in a way, it set a precedent for this investigation because you have this uh, very important national security related investigation that 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 discusses some of the activity that, that occurred during the 2016 campaign that obviously involves people around now President Trump, who was a candidate back then. So there is this public Absolutely. desire to to see what this special counsel mm -hmm. has concluded, because this is a high profile investigation. This is, you know, we, we've been talking about it every day for the last two <laughs> years, yeah. essentially. But this is a history uh, making investigation. We haven't seen anything like this ever. And that's why there is this desire, uh, certainly on the, on, the, on the part of uh, Democrats on Capitol Hill, to get this information out. They have their, their political uh, reasons as well. Uh, but you also have a public, uh, both Republican and Democrat, who want to know what the conclusions are uh, by the special counsel. They say this, this is an investigation that the public paid for. Uh, and so the argument is, well, they should hear the results of the investigation. There's certainly a strong appetite for every nugget of information that you can, you know, certainly get. But I wanted to touch a little bit to the attorney general kind of laying out a timeline here, saying that he hopes that he would be able to advise Congress or give some sort of a briefing by this weekend. So when should we learn more, the public, about the contents of the report if he sticks to that timeline? Listen, I know you, you would be a guessing <laughs> game for you if you could no, look no, in that no. crystal ball, but what do you think? Well, listen, as, as an experienced reporter, I, I re it's going to be hard for this information, at least some of it, not to get out before Monday. It is just, it's just the way things work in this town and, and the way the system seems to work. You have the, the press uh, and hundreds, thousands of members of the press looking for information, pressing their sources, who will, at some point, some of them will have some of this information, whether people within DOJ, even though a small group of people within D DOJ have, have access to this final report, but once it gets to Congress, that's when people uh, in law enforcement here uh, in Washington, that's when they expect information to leak out. Once it's handed over to members of Congress, that's when they expect this information uh, to, to leak out. And so to your question, I, I think it's, it's within 24, 48 hours, we will start to hear little pieces and nuggets of of what is in this report and, and what it might say uh, as it relates to the White House and President Trump. And I should say, you know, all week long we've heard the president either on Twitter or in these, uh, these uh, meetings with the press as he runs to Marine One or walks to, to Marine One talking about this investigation and talking about John McCain and how he felt John McCain was a part of this process by handing the, the dossier over to the FBI director, who was then James Comey, even though that wasn't really the, the correct chronology of events. Mm -hmm. But you heard the president, he kept talking about it this week. Uh, and, and as someone who has observed this investigation, observed the White House, reaction to this investigation over the last two years. It just seemed curious that he just kept talking about it, kept talking about it. And here we have the report uh, has now been delivered to the Department of Justice. So, you know, we don't know yet whether the president had got, uh, was tipped off that the mm -hmm. report was coming. We don't know that. But it just seemed like things were building uh, toward the end of this week, either yesterday or today. And here we finally have it. Now, the question is, how long will it take before the information, the conclusions in that report start leaking out? And you know, you said something that was very interesting. After 22 months, we've been watching this unfold. People really do want it like now. Well, they do. I mean, this is, you know, this has been a, a real time soap opera, if you will. I mean, you have, you have the president of the United States who uses Twitter to his benefit, who has been talking about the investigation. And then you have people the, the public has come to know over the last two years, whether it's Michael Flynn, who was the former National Security Advisor, whether it was Michael Cohen, 
who was the president's uh, former personal attorney, Paul Manafort. You know, you've had these people uh, going to court, pleading guilty, all of this playing out on TV. Uh, and so the, the public feels uh, as if it has a vested it, interest in this, in this investigation and its conclusions. You know, just like any good drama, frankly, they want to see how this ends. And so do we. All right. It'll be here sooner rather than later. Jeff Gase, thank you so much for your insight. I'm sure we'll talk to you again in a little bit. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us. I'm Alex Dennis. We are just getting word here that the so-called witch hunt is now over. And now Washington waits. After 22 months, special counsel Robert Mueller has finished his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election and has submitted the final report to the Department of Justice. The probe has resulted in dozens of indictments for federal crimes reaching members of the president's inner circle, his campaign, and Russian citizens as well. The findings are now in the hands of Attorney General William Barr. In a letter to Congress, Barr said that he is now reviewing the report and that he could advise them of the special counsel's conclusions as soon as this weekend. And you may remember back during his confirmation in January, Barr said that he would try to be as transparent as possible about the report, but stop short of promising to release it in full. Well, I can say right now is my goal and intent is to get as much information out as I can, Thank consistent you. with the regulations. So in the minute that earlier this week, the president said that the public should see it. Let it come out. Let people see it. That's up to the attorney general. We have a very good attorney general. He's a very highly respected man. And we'll see what happens. With all of that being said, I look forward to seeing the report. So Mueller may be done with the report, but talk of potential Trump campaign ties to Russia look far from over. The investigation has lasted two years. And for a look at how we got here, here's CBS News Washington correspondent Paula Reed. In May of 2017, the FBI was investigating contacts between Trump associates and Russia during the presidential campaign when President Trump abruptly fired Director James Comey. The president initially cited Comey's handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation as the reason for his dismissal. But two days later, he pointed to the Russia probe, calling it a, quote, made-up story. Over the next six days, there were more revelations the president had privately asked Comey for his loyalty and to drop part of the investigation. That led Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein to appoint Robert Mueller on May 17th to examine Russian interference in the 2016 election. That investigation would grow to include whether the president had obstructed justice. Since then, Mueller has charged six Trump associates for crimes ranging from lying to the FBI to tax evasion. They include former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, former campaign chairman Paul Manafort, the president's former personal attorney Michael Cohen, and longtime confidant Roger Stone. All but Stone have pleaded guilty and cooperated with the investigation. 25 Russian nationals have been indicted on charges related to hacking or the dissemination of false information. During the campaign, Mr. Trump said this amid the controversy surrounding Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. According to Mueller's court filings, that same day, Russian hackers went after the emails of Hillary Clinton staffers, emails that would eventually be leaked. The president's family has not escaped scrutiny. Of particular interest, a meeting at Trump Tower in June of 2016, where Russian lawyer with ties to President Vladimir Putin met with Manafort, the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., and Mr. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. All the while, President Trump has denied any collusion with Russia. I didn't need Russians to help me win Iowa. He has also consistently attacked the special counsel and the Justice Department. No collusion, no nothing. Called the phony witch hunt. Phony witch hunt. And Kim Whaley joins us from Washington. She's a CBS News legal analyst and author of the forthcoming book, How to Read the Constitution and Why. Thank you for being here, Kim. What do you make of the timing of this report? The fact that it comes out on a Friday, I don't think it, there's a lot to be uh, gleaned from that other than they were busy. I do think that Mr. Mueller has got to be acutely aware of the pressure to resolve his portion of this longer investigation. I don't think 
the sort of broader question of whether there was wrongdoing relating to the 2016 campaign and people close to Trump is necessarily over because other parts of the Justice Department still have a jurisdiction over certain matters. So we've been following this now for about 22 months, and we are seeing that this briefing, the attorney general saying that they could be briefing Congress as early as this weekend. What do you think happens next as far as the general public is concerned? When will we know a little bit more about exactly what is in this report? Well, the one-page letter that Mr. Barr gave to Congress is actually sort of jam-packed with information if you've been following this carefully and if you understand the regulations. And, and let me just uh, summarize what I think is important to take out of the one-page report. One is that it looks like Mr. Mueller's investigation itself is finished. And I say that because under the regulations that govern him, he has to tell Congress when it's finished. And that is what this particular piece of paper is, his obligation to tell Congress he's done. The second thing that it does is was also required in the end of the regulations is to tell Congress if there was any conflict between him and main justice about a decision. So for example, it looks like Mr. Mueller did not decide to indict President Trump, for example, over the objections of the Justice Department. If that existed, that would have to be turned over to the Congress. And Mr. Barr could then make that piece of information public. He decided to make public the fact that there were no conflicts. That's number two. The third thing that this says that's not in the regulations, not required, Mr. Barr says, listen, I'm going to tell you, Congress, the principal conclusions that are in the report. The report itself, under the regulations, is confidential. That does not have to be made public. It looks like Mr. Barr has decided to take the extra step and make the principal conclusions at least public to Congress. No doubt that will be made, made clear to the American public. I don't think there's any indication that absent a court battle, the American public will get one other piece of information at this point. It's interesting to hear you clarify that because I have a flurry of tweets and printouts here from uh, potential Democratic candidates. Uh, we've got and specific Democratic candidates. We've got Cory Booker speaking out. We have Bernie Sanders, um, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Kirsten Gillibrand, and they're all basically saying the same thing. They want transparency. Uh, the American people have the right to know its findings. But you're really being clear, and I'm seeing it in this letter that you're saying as well, that these principal conclusions does not mean that the Congress itself will even read this report in full. That's correct. I, I think that Mr. Barr's made very clear that he's going to comply with the regulations, which he has done with this piece of paper, that he believes in transparency, which I think giving the Congress basically bullet points, summaries of the principal conclusions would be a measure of transparency. And third, he has said he's going to comply with Department of Justice guidelines, which generally do not historically mean that declination decisions, that is decisions not to prosecute, that is generally kept confidential. Um, of course, the wrinkle here is with this president, with any president under DOJ guidelines, if there is an evidence to indict, they can't. So it's a bit of a checkmate. And that's just something that that Barr might have made a determination, listen, if this is going to be resolved beyond the scope of the regulations, I'm not going to be the one to do it. It has to be done by a constitutional branch of government. Perhaps he's seeing this go to the courts. Congress could subpoena the, the report, and then it'll be up to a federal judge, an Article Three federal judge, and presumably it'll go to the Supreme Court of the United States to make that major constitutional decision. And if that is Barr's thinking, frankly, as a constitutional scholar, it makes sense to me that he, a non elected member of government who was appointed by this particular president is not going to make the ultimate call in this moment as, as far as uh, how much the American public knows beyond what the regulations actually require him to disclose. All right, Kim Whaley, joining us from Washington, thank you so much for your insight. My pleasure. Let's go ahead and join me now with CBS and political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns. Caitlin, this has been something that we have spoken about almost every single day yes. for 22 mm -hmm. months, and now mm -hmm. here it is. 
Did you mm -hmm. expect it to come out today on this Friday? Did you hear any rumblings earlier in this week that, that this was the, the plan? Well, everybody has been on high alert waiting for this report. And we have seen in Washington especially that when you want to break news, uh, a lot of times it does happen at 5 o'clock on a Friday. But as Paula uh, Reed has noted, that invest notes from this investigation have come out at all times, at all days. Uh, the, everybody has been waiting for this report, namely the president of the United States, who, of course, is in Mar-a-Lago this week. It was very interesting to see the statement come out from Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, who uh, said, of course, that they want this report to made public, but they don't want the Justice Department to brief the president in any way uh, before everybody is made aware of the principal findings. And the reason for that is they don't want the president to come out and make a conclusion about it himself. We know that he is busy on on, on Twitter, he has very much been watching this investigation and thinks that it has been uh, hindering his administration. What we're also seeing is several 2020 presidential candidates who have been on the campaign trail for the past several weeks calling for this report to be made public. We also have others who, like Kamala Harris, sit on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate asking for Barr, uh, the new attorney general, to come in at some point and testify in front of Congress to show what exactly those findings are. So you're having a lot of people weigh in here. The consensus seems to be release the report, be transparent as possible. You're also hearing from some Republicans, and it would be in some their interest to have this laid out for the public as well, particularly if there is nothing that is negative towards the president. Remember, they have been very defensive, uh, by and large, of this president, uh, especially and, and when it comes to this finding. Saying it's mm -hmm. a witch hunt, that there was no collusion. Absolutely, you've seen a lot of Republicans echo that sentiment, and so you could imagine uh, a Lindsey Graham, for example, who chairs the Judiciary Committee, wanting uh, perhaps uh, hasn't said it yet, but would perhaps want uh, all of this to be made public uh, and and have people testify if it finds that the president uh, was not implicated here. It's also really important to note that the House just last week passed uh, a measure to demand that this report made be made public. It was blocked in the Senate uh, by Lindsey Graham uh, for political reasons, presumably. So those are kind of the dynamics happening now. You also have, of course, the, the specter of impeachment that Nancy Pelosi has been warning against, but members of the base uh, have wanted to move forward with, and then 2020 candidates kind of walking that fine line, asking for voters to weigh in eventually on the president at the ballot box. So a lot of factors kind of going into this big day that everybody's been waiting for. So, Caitlin, don't go anywhere, because we have more that we want to discuss, but also we want to bring in Nicole Killian traveling with the president in West Palm Beach, Florida. We know that the White House lawyers are with the president right now. Do we have any idea if they knew about this and maybe what they're discussing right now, Nicole? Well, what we can tell you, Alex, uh, as you mentioned, and uh, this was told to our Paula Reed, is that a White House official does confirm uh, to us that White House lawyers Emmett Flood and Pat Sablone are with the president here in Mar-a-Lago. Uh, we also know from the Justice Department, from an official there, uh, that the Attorney General's Chief of Staff actually notified Flood about uh, this report that had been completed uh, just before 5 o'clock this evening. Now, also on the president's legal team, of course, we know is Rudy Giuliani, and he gave an interview to the Washington Post uh, that was uh, published uh, earlier this afternoon, where he basically said that he spoke with the president uh, this morning. Uh, we have not been able to confirm that uh, independently from the White House, but again, he told the Washington Post that he spoke with the president this morning to talk about uh, strategy in terms of how to, they might deal uh, with the special counsel. He also told the paper that in preparation uh, for this report uh, that the president's legal team has been working on a counter report. Uh, also, we know, which is pretty interesting to note that right now, uh, from our understanding and from, again, uh, this Washington Post report, uh, Giuliani said that he is staying behind in Washington uh, in the event that this report were to come out on Friday, which, of course, it ultimately did, uh, that he would stay behind to kind of handle matters there. Perhaps he may be making some appearances on the Sunday shows, he told the paper, but he did say uh, that he was planning to come here uh, to Mar-a-Lago, so now he will be staying uh, in Washington instead. It's interesting that they are already making a response. Uh, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders tweeting out earlier that the next steps are up to the Attorney General Barr 
and uh, we look forward to the process taking its course. The White House has not received or been briefed on the special counsel's report. We are also seeing Pelosi and Schumer tweeting out and making a statement, but please do not give, quote, a sneak peek to the president. Do you believe that maybe he has gotten any information? Well, you know, that's something a uh, question we'll certainly have to put uh, to the White House. I mean, we do have to take uh, Sarah Sanders uh, at her word when she says uh, that the White House has not been briefed. And look, you know, based on the protocol, that's essentially how it should work. Uh, that's why you're seeing this concern, especially among congressional Democrats, uh, that they not be tipped off or have the opportunity to try to correct the record, if you will. Uh, so we have to assume that the White House was not briefed on that. But going back to that Giuliani interview with The Post, uh, you know, he did say that that uh, there certainly seem to be signs that this investigation was wrapping up, that his last kind of exchanges uh, with the special counsel's office have been relatively mild uh, compared to, for instance, when they were negotiating over the terms of the president's uh, interview. Uh, I remember all those written questions uh, that he submitted to the special counsel, which uh, those negotiations stretched out for months and were quite contentious. So just like we've been reading the tea leaves, uh, one can imagine certainly that the president's legal team has also been reading uh, the tea leaves leaves as well. And of course, uh, the president uh, just this morning said he had no idea when it would be coming out. Nicole, what do you make of the timing of the release of the report? Five o'clock on a Friday evening. Do you, do you surmise anything from that? Well, I agree with Caitlin in the sense, especially those of us in the news business know about the Friday evening news dump. Uh, we're pretty used to it. Uh, certainly a lot of times uh, that happens on big stories like this. But look, I don't think that the special counsel was trying to uh, release news uh, at a time that, uh, you know, we may be speculating mm -hmm. about. Uh, but certainly, as I said, you know, the media has certainly been reading the tea leaves on this one. Uh, we knew that there were certain conditions uh, that had to be set for this uh, release to come out. For instance, we know several members of the special counsel's team has been departing in recent weeks. Uh, you know, folks that were on the investigative team that have been going back to their day job. You know, we've kind of seen a drip drip of uh, news reports about that. So that was kind of one indication uh, that tipped us off. Uh, certainly the Justice Department this week had been giving us guidance to, hey, stay close, don't go too far. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things uh, when Mueller is finished, Mueller is finished. And uh, now it really appears to be and now reality, he is. of course. Right. Yeah. Have we heard anything else from the White House uh, in addition to Sanders' tweet? Has there been any other statements released from where you are? I know you're right in it and clearly in it in another way as well as you have something going by you here. Yeah. And, you know, look, uh, we certainly have been reaching out to members of the White House uh, to see if they do plan any further comment. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, at this point, uh, all we can go is based on the information that we're told. But one can imagine that if the president is currently with his lawyers, that uh, certainly they may be, uh, you know, again, uh, plotting their strategy and their next steps and how they will indeed respond. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we do know that it's possible we could see the president again. Uh, we do typically, uh, when it comes to following the president, we get something called a lid, which means we're not going to see the president for the rest of the day. Uh, but we have that until 7.30 this evening, which means after 7.30, it's possible maybe we can hear from the president. Uh, but again, we have not been given that guidance. Uh, we do know uh, that there is a Republican dinner taking place at his club this evening. So again, that is something that we're watching to see uh, what, if any, reaction uh, we might get. Interesting insight for the timeline, too, for the president. That's uh, something that we're all interested in as well. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. We'll chat back, chat back in with you in a little bit. also want to bring in <laughs> Joseph Moreno, joining me now by phone. He's a former federal prosecutor and former special assistant U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Thank you for joining us again. Wanted to touch on something that we just heard. A DOJ official has indicated now that no additional indictments are coming from Mueller. So what is the significance of finding this out now? Sure, Alex. So let's assume that's true. Right? Let's assume this is a, you know, a take-it-to-the-bank statement that we can rely on. It, it still leaves some room for... Okay, we're going to check back in and get more information because that's an answer I definitely would like to know. But firstly, we have two guests joining us here in studio. Studio Kier Dougal is on the phone with me now. 
Well, you're right here with me now, aren't you? <laughs> CBSN legal contributor and former assistant U.S. attorney in the New York Eastern District. And we wanted to talk a little bit more, bringing Caitlin in as well. Um, as we see all this unfold, we've got this flurry of papers, everyone weighing in. It's been 22 months that we have been waiting for this decision. Is it now a sigh of relief for some or maybe for some and really now and it begins for others? Well, I think you could look at it two different ways, uh, depending on what we find out. Remember, we don't know anything about what is in this report right now. But what we do know is that it is unlikely that this is really the end. And what I mean by that is there are many people in Congress in interested mm -hmm. in seeing uh, what else could come out of this. Remember, Democrats now control the House and these various committees that have been interested in this investigation and looking for ways to expand uh, beyond what the Mueller uh, mandate has been. So you better believe that a lot of these uh, chairmen and women are going to be digging through this report uh, in addition to what the um, t kind of top lines are to see any kind of threads that they could find to continue uh, this if, po sure. if possible. You're also, if, as we mentioned, if, if nothing comes out that is incriminating against the president or involves him uh, in the way that has been speculated, Republicans will likely be wanting to uh, talk more about this as well. So, Kate, let me ask you the question that I, I was going to ask Joseph here about the indication that no additional indictments are actually coming from Mueller. What is your take on that? Well, that's um, a consequence of the fact that Mr. Mueller has concluded his investigation. That's what, as other guests have said, that's what this means. This, this report is at the conclusion of the investigation. Um, but to tie in what you were talking about, whether it's really the end or the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning right. kind of thing, um, what we don't know yet, of course, is what the report reveals. Okay, so there is a Justice Department policy that um, counsels against indicting a sitting president. The report still could possibly contain incriminating information with respect to uh, Mr. Trump. And then you, I think, you would start to see uh, the end of a beginning, but with more to follow, because I'm sure that Congress would follow up. Um, and then, of course, there are others um, as to whom uh, Mr. Mueller may have just d found information that is incriminating, but is not within his mandate. Remember, his mandate was limited to the, the collusion, as it's been called by the, by the president or as a prosecutor, I would call it conspiracy, um, and related crimes of obstruction. So he may have discovered uh, other information relating to some of the peripheral people that may lead to further charges, but not by Mr. Mueller's team itself. So I want to ask you a follow-up about that. Is that type of information that maybe won't be given to Congress, is that would you say a, an example of something that would then be lifted and removed because it's sensitive and doesn't relate to what the parameters of the investigation was? I'm, I'm trying to determine myself, like, what would be edited? How would we know which pieces would be selected? So I, I can start on this one. Um, I, I think what you want to do is sort of start with the, the basic rules. And I've heard several of the guests on, on the show already say that the basic rule is that the department does not reveal information about an unindicted person. And that's, that's an important rule, and it, it's designed to protect people's privacy. However, there has been, for a long time, an exception to that rule in cases of, a couple of cases. If the public safety is, um, is at issue, if the, literally there's a, a, somebody who's dangerous running around and the Justice Department needs help, they will go to the public and ask for help. That's the first exception. The second exception is in a case where there is tremendous public interest um, in, in, in an investigation. That's certainly the case here. And there have been a number of examples in the past where the department has made statements relating to an individual who was the subject of investigation but not charged. I, I can date myself and go back to the 1996 Atlantic, Atlanta Olympic Games where there was a bombing, an individual whose name I'm not going to say right now because he's suffered a lot from this. I think, he, I, I think he's passed away. But um, this individual was identified in the press, ultimately never charged, and the department um, made statements exonerating him. We saw it in the, the, Mr. Comey's uh, decisions uh, to, to disclose the findings about Hillary Clinton. And in between those in her two... her email. Right. 
private in, server. Exactly. In between those two dates, there were several other examples where the department, relying upon that exception, um, made public statements about people who were not indicted. So um, the, 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 the rule that I've heard described is correct, but there is this very narrow e exception in a case like this where the public has been clamoring, as you've all noted, for months mm -hmm. um, for information. Let's talk a little bit about the length of what we think this report may be. Uh, it was brought and delivered at about 5 o'clock, and so 20 minutes later or so, we have this one-page draft. In it, William Barr, the attorney general, is saying that by this weekend, he thinks that he's able to brief Congress. Does that indicate that these uh, bullet points that Mueller has provided to him was only a couple pages long, or how do we We're all that? wondering, what was the packet? What did it actually look like? How many pages is this? We, ca we know that this is how the president is going to be looking at this. He wants to know what the headline is and whether he is exonerated from collusion. That's what he has been interested in this whole entire time. And at each iteration, at each increment that we've learned more from this Mueller probe, the president has taken that and uh, kind of tweeted out or blasted out the headline, no collusion. So that is what he is going to be looking for. I am wondering, though, because this whole process has been so incremental, and I think the public is kind of trying to take a step back and think about, okay, well, what else is there to learn from this? Yes. Remember that list of, of people who have already been indicted. It's a huge list, and you've had that on the screen. But I'm wondering, I mean, Kira, maybe you can answer this. What else, what are the remaining threads uh, that we need to be looking at here? What else is left to decide from this beyond the main headline of, of collusion? Sure. So we don't know, we don't, those, that's a great question, and we don't know the, the follow-up to the Trump Tower meeting, for instance, that's something that I think we've been very mm -hmm. interested in. Um, there's been a lot of um, speculation about whether and how, if so, Mr. Trump may have known about it in advance, may have, um, may have re reacted to it afterward. There's the, um, uh, there's the August meeting where uh, Mr. Gates and Mr. Manafort met with Mr. Kalimnik, where um, there was a discussion about um, polling data, and, and, and the subtext of all of this is whether or not uh, there would be relief uh, from sanctions that Russia has wanted uh, very much. Those are two sort of key issues that, while they may not specifically result in additional charges, that narrative, that story to complete, um, basically, um, if somebody else was involved, what they knew and when they knew it, those are sort of sort of core questions about whether or not um, the Trump campaign um, coordinated with, uh, with, with anybody in Russia. And then the final piece is through WikiLeaks. Um, th we don't know whether or not um, uh, Mr. Mr. Mueller connected that up um, and, and connected up direct communications and the timing of them. So all of those, all of that part of the story, which may be um, um, exonerating, it may be damning, but it may also uh, not have yielded charges, but it's all something that we would all still, I think, be very interested in knowing. We keep hearing the word impeachment being tossed around by some, others saying, like, absolutely not, they don't feel like this is where it should go. What would, and I'm not saying I don't know anything, we have not seen this report, but what would be the next steps if that was an implication as to what was to come? So, um, it's important to remember, I, I think, um, and I think it's reflected in both what um, uh, Jerry Nadler, who's a House mm -hmm. Judiciary uh, Chairman, has said, and also what Nancy Pelosi has said. Impeachment is a rule-bound thing. It's in the Constitution, and we talk about treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors. So there's some rules on it, but it's not a legal proceeding in the way that I, you know, I used to do as a prosecutor. It's also inherently political. And so when you hear um, Nancy Pelosi saying, you know, it has to be something, if we're going to start down this road, it has to be something that is a really serious and something that is going to garner bipartisan support. Uh, that all makes sense because it's this mixture of legal and politics. How it is going to start, if it's going to start, and that's a giant question, is, well, I guess you'd say the process, if it's going to end up there, has already begun. Because, you know, we've, we've got uh, Mr. Mr. Mueller's investigation. There, there will be findings. Congress will certainly hear, um, I think, the bulk of them, subject to some claims for um, executive privilege, perhaps. Um, but then the next step after that is to absorb that information 
And then the Judiciary Committee in the House, which has the, the role in, um, in voting on articles of impeachment, uh, will then take up its investigation. That's, that's how an impeachment would progress if that's going to occur. But we're, we're nowhere close to that based on what we're hearing from people like Nancy Pelosi. Absolutely. Okay, so Caitlin Keir, stand by. Let's first right now bring in Jonathan Turley, a CBS News legal analyst and a professor of public interest law at George Washington University Law School. Joining us now, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So we know that Special Counsel Mueller is not recommending any further indictments. We've been discussing it a little bit here. That's according to the senior uh, uh, DOJ official. Is this good news for President Trump then? Well, it's too early to say that. It would be very good news for former Clinton White House counsel Greg Craig if there's no other indictments. A lot of us were wondering whether he was about to be indicted for foreign agents registration problems. Now, they may have referred that case to another office, uh, but um, certainly he would be delighted if there were no other indictments to come down. But for the president, it's not that easy of a question because the Department of Justice has a policy not to indict a sitting president, a policy I disagree with, by the way. Uh, it's not enough to say, well, we didn't indict him. You know, Mueller could say, look, we found evidence of criminal conduct, but we're barred under that policy. He could even refer the matter to uh, the U.S. attorney in D.C. or to the attorney general himself for if, if the period following uh, the president's term of office. So there's a lot of possible permutations here. There's also a lot of different crimes in terms of the potential scope. But the one thing to keep in mind is that the scope of the Mueller investigation is narrower than these investigations in Congress. Much of the stuff being investigated by Congress was peeled off and given to the Southern District of New York. When you talk about not supporting the policy of indicting a sitting president, why is it for you something that you disagree with? Well, I've disagreed with it uh, for decades. I testified in the Clinton impeachment hearings on the constitutional standard and said at that time that a sitting president could be indicted. I don't see any evidence in the Constitution or the Constitutional Convention that the framers ever thought they were giving immunity to a sitting president. An indictment goes to the person. Impeachments go to the office. Now, does that mean that Bill Barr is likely to change that policy? <laughs> no. I mean, I, I testified at Barr's confirmation hearing, and I told the Senate Judiciary Committee he's the last guy that would change that policy. I mean, Bill Barr has a robust view of executive power and privilege. But I think it's fundamentally wrong. But if you take a look at those memos that support the policy, they actually didn't say that a president couldn't be indicted. Um, they said that there are people on both sides, some like myself saying you can do it, some saying that you can't. And they just decided as a policy reason, uh, they would just not indict a sitting president. Uh, that's not exactly the strongest basis for a policy of that kind. And the attorney general has said that he would like to be very transparent. That is his efforts and has said that repeatedly. So what do you think that maybe he will choose to release from the report and then maybe not release? Well, it's important to keep in mind a couple of things. Um, first of all, I've known Bill Barr for three decades. And he's if when he says he wants to release as much as possible, he means it. But... Uh, he can't do what, what some Democratic members are demanding tonight. He cannot release that report tonight. The, there are federal laws that require that he remove things like grand jury information, Privacy Act information, uh, executive privileged information. All that has to be scrubbed away. So that's one issue. The second issue is that under the special counsel regulations, he is only required to give Congress a summary of what was investigated and what was determined. There is no provision in there for the release of the report, but that doesn't mean that he can't do it. It certainly doesn't mean that if the president himself has said, I think the report should be made public. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. We also want to talk about Congressman David Cicilline, the chairman of the House Democratic Policy Communications Committee. He is joining us now on the phone. Congressman, thank you so much for taking time to talk about this. It has been a hot topic for the past 22 months, and now it is time. This report has been 
two years now in the making. What are you expecting to be released uh, today and throughout the weekend as well? Well, I think it's clear that the attorney general intends to release uh, quickly the sort of summary of who has faced criminal prosecution and uh, what individuals he may have declined prosecution and maybe some explanation. But I think uh, what, what really is important is that really the full report and all the supporting documents, uh, of course, absent any classified materials protecting sources and methods which need to be uh, redacted, but the balance of the report uh, the kind of full transparency I think the American people are demanding uh, needs to take place. We should be reminded that this report belongs to the American people. It was initiated when there was compelling evidence that a foreign adversary of the United States attacked our democracy. And uh, to find out exactly what happened and whether or not there was any uh, cooperation or conspiracy or uh, facilitation with members of the Trump campaign. So th this is important that the American people learn exactly what the special counsel found. Uh, the, the evidence and the conclusions he came to, um, so we can make decisions as a country either to take some corrective action, to continue investigations that may be necessary, and to hold individuals accountable. But, uh, you know, we've all protected the special counsel's investigation, wanted it to be completed free from political interference, and be certain that he could finish his work. And now that product belongs to the American people, and it's very important that they see the full contents of this report. So I hear you strongly saying that you are hoping that a lot will be released here for review. I just want to be clear that Mueller gave a summary of decisions to William Barr, the attorney general, and he is only required to brief Congress, not really release it to the public or even in full. So what will your reaction be if you only receive snippets of what's released here? Well, I, that's not acceptable. I don't think it will be acceptable to members of Congress. It won't be acceptable to the American people. Uh, we voted overwhelmingly, uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, in an expression of our position that this full report should be released to the American people. Uh, I think there are a number of ways we can make that happen. I frankly think it would be very useful for the special counsel to come before the Congress in uh, open and to testify before the Judiciary Committee and walk through the report and explain his findings and the evidence that he collected in support of those findings to the American people. So, uh, you know, we're going to make sure that this full report and all of its contents uh, are shared with the American people. They have a right to know what happened. Congress has a responsibility to understand what happened and to take appropriate actions to make sure it never happens again or to take legislative actions that may be necessary uh, as a result of what the special counsel has found. But, but this is an unusual circumstance. This, this is too important. This is not just sort of a regular investigation of an individual. This is about a foreign government that attacked our democracy in a very sophisticated way with lots of evidence that members of the Trump campaign interacted with Russian and Russian nationals. And we have a right to know exactly what happened here. So what do you believe in what should be happening in the next coming days and then even weeks? Well, I think it's important that Mr. Barr complete his review quickly. Uh, I do not think it's appropriate for the president or his lawyers to review it and decide what they want released. That's not the standard. Uh, so I think Mr. Barr should review it quickly and make sure that there is no uh, release of no materials which are classified or which must be protected in order to protect sources and methods. And then the balance of the report should be released to the American people and to Congress. And uh, we should then have an opportunity to absorb it and and uh, uh, take whatever action it requires. But, you know, the idea that after two years of a, a thorough investigation with 199 criminal charges against 36 individuals and organizations, seven convictions, five, you know, people going to prison, that the American people are going to simply accept the idea of, well, you can't actually see what we concluded and what we found that relates to the attack on our democracy is something the American people are just not going to tolerate, and they shouldn't. And we're going to fight hard to make sure that as quickly as possible the full contents of this report are made available to Congress and to the American people. All right. Mr. David Cicilline, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I want to bring back in CBSN legal contributor Keir Dougal and CBSN political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns. Both have been here and giving us insight. Let's talk about a little bit more what we can expect in these next coming days. What fascinates me is people keep saying that they want to see this full report, but that's not really going to happen, right? The American people are never going to see this full report. Yeah, I, I mean, I think everybody knows that there, there are some things that are going to have to come out of the report at least for public consumption. The um, national security stuff, obviously, uh, that, that's key. 
Um, there are circumstances where some of that information can be released, um, but you, 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 when you may reveal sources and methods, as others have said, you, you want to walk very, very gingerly. Um, there are also potential questions about executive privilege that Mr. Barr will want to review, I suppose. Let me interrupt you real quick. Yep. Senator Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is now speaking in New York City. Let's go ahead and listen in. ...for the report to be made public. There is no reason on God's green earth why Attorney General Barr should do any less. We're only going to take one question or two. Any? The indications are that there are no new indictments. Uh, that's the word coming out. Do you think that that is the case, that there's an apology to be made to the president? I think we should wait, to the f wait for the full report to be issued before jumping to any conclusions. Senator Schumer, I, I, I should say that again. I think we should wait for the full report to be made public before jumping to any conclusions. Senator Schumer, how confident are you that we're going to get the full depth of that report with a Trump appointed attorney general? I think the demand of the public is overwhelming to see the report when it's on such a serious matter, and it will be made public. Public pressure will force it to be. Any sort of time frame you can foresee? No. Thank you, everybody. Last question to the Yankee fan. Look, I'm not going to draw any conclusions until we see not only the whole report, but the underlying findings and documentation. Thank you, everybody. Where, is, uh, where are you from? You just came in. Yeah, Let's talk a little bit about that statement here. Public pressure will force it to be made public. That's a little bit about what we discussed before. There's certain precedents that forced uh, people's hand to have to inform the public. So. How long do you think that would take and what would that look like? Well, it's in Democrats' political interest to force transparency here. They are saying that, look, this investigation, as you mentioned, has taken up, you know, several, several months, uh, has captured national attention, has been uh, on the mind of the president and has involved taxpayer dollars. So they deserve to know what these conclusions are. Now, if, if there is nothing incriminating about the president that comes from this, De Democrats are going to want the full report out to be able to have more threads, perhaps, to uh, find as they're doing their own investigations in the House. Republicans, it could be in their best interest, too, to have this final report come out if there is nothing damaging to the president, because they could continue making the argument that they have been trying to continue, which is echoing the words of the president. Now, again, we have no idea meaning what is no in this report. Meaning no collusion, meaning... Right, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you're seeing Chuck Schumer and Democrats, and especially those running for president, calling for transparency. They're also calling for uh, the people involved in this investigation to testify in front of Congress eventually. That means the attorney general, that means the special counsel himself, uh, to get more information about this process, about the findings in the report, and find out any way that they can uh, look into anything that they need to further. We've heard the president say before, this is a witch hunt, a witch hunt, a witch hunt. And now, looking at the stack of papers that I have here on the desk, and we're showing you even on the screen here, uh, the dozens of tweets that have come out from Democrats, uh, some of them that have already entered the race, is this going to be uh, part of their agenda to try to write their ticket to get elected? Well, it's really interesting because you have Democrats who are on the campaign trail arguing to, uh, first of all, arguing the fact that, you know, we have to remember that Russia interfered in our election, so they want to make sure everything is secure before this next election. Uh, but they also have been kind of walking a little bit of a fine line here. You know, I've been out on the campaign trail a lot over the past couple of months with these candidates, and what we hear from voters over and over is not about the Mueller report. It's not about this special counsel investigation. It's more about issues like the economy and health care. So these candidates are trying to balance that with this call for uh, uh, the democracy to kind of work uh, work itself out. You do hear a lot of people very concerned about the status of institutions and what this would mean for that and what the president has done. So again, walking that fine line, and that's why you saw uh, Nancy Pelosi just last week come out and say, let's let's hold our horses on impeachment. We don't want to go that route. Um, depending, again, on what comes out of this, and we don't know what is in this report, uh, that will help to color how, how that changes, if at all. What now for Mueller? He has more time on his hands. What's the next step for <laughs> Vacation, him? Vacation, right? Right. Well, it sounds like he's going to be uh, getting ready for some testimony. But right. I, um, I, I want to come back to what Caitlin just said, because I, I think it's important what she said. 
that um, looking at it from a political angle, both parties have their interests about what this report is going gonna, is gonna to show and, and sort of what the follow-on is. But there's also, I think we'd all agree, a, a larger principle at stake here, which is whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, one of the core things that our country is founded upon is that no one is above the law. And so tying back to what Senator Schumer just said, the public pressure here is going to come from the fact that you have the chief law enforcement officer is, who is the subject of an investigation. He, he's just wrapped up in this investigation, whether it goes in his favor, whether it shows problems for him. The idea that uh, we would not have public disclosure uh, relating to him under these circumstances, I think it runs contrary to the, everybody's instincts. It's just not, it's just not right. And so uh, there's a much larger principle at stake that I think, you know, uh, if you step back out of the heat of the moment, um, you realize, well, wait a minute, Nobody wants a president who is potentially compromised by a foreign adversary, if that's the case. If the president, if, if there is no evidence uh, that, that that's true, we want to know that also, because we all have an interest in knowing that our president is working for us and not for some other, for some other interest. So I think we can draw, hopefully, this moment for us as a country um, will reaffirm that principle that no one is above the law. And I just want to recap that the nearly two-year-long probe has shadowed Trump's presidency. It's resulted in felony charges against 34 people, including six people who served on Trump's campaign. And there could be more to come. Am I right in understanding that? Sure, there could be, um, because uh, at, we've just seen new charges against Mr. Manafort brought by the uh, New York State authorities, the, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. There could be other state charges. Um, a lot of the threads that we, we with that are dangling that we don't yet know about um, may have been referred to other components of the Justice Department um, because Mr. Mueller's mandate is limited to this question of Russian interference with the 2016 election um, and the counterintelligence uh, aspects of that. So it's entirely possible that even though Mr. Mueller won't be the source of additional charges, more shoes could drop. And I it's really just striking seeing this graphic on the screen about how many people in this president's orbit have been already uh, indicted and charged. It's also important to note that the White House has actually acted on, recommend, uh, on evidence produced by the special counsel. You see those indictments of Russian nationals. You saw the evidence that uh, how the extent to which they interfered in the election and the White House has issued sanctions. So it is interesting that, you know, the president is very focused really only on this issue of collusion, this question of collusion, um, and has also acted upon some of these findings. We just received a statement, too, from Peter Carr, special counsel spokesperson, who said that uh, the special counsel will be concluding his service in the coming days. A small number of staff will remain to assist in closing the operations of the office for a period of time. So we'll see that whole entire operation basically shut down after 22 months of labor intensive work. For people that are just joining us, let's break down again. The attorney general has released this one page statement, came out at about five o'clock uh, uh, today, and we were anxiously awaiting this. We got word earlier in the week that this may be coming. And again, it did. It was delivered here uh, by a special chauffeur and it was delivered to the attorney general's uh, deputy office and then brought over to William Barr, and he says that the special counsel has submitted to me today a confidential report explaining that the prosecution of declination decisions, it has been reached as requested by 28 CFR. I am reviewing the report and anticipate that I may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. So in this report, from what we understand, there are basically bullets that surmise the investigation that was given then to the attorney general. The attorney general, in return, will then make his own report and give that to Congress. So we're waiting this weekend. Will Congress be with bated breath at the doors waiting to get this? Or you think it will take a couple of days? Do you truly think it will be this weekend? Um, I think it could be. Uh, I mean, I'm, Mr. Barr seems like... He didn't uh, mince words. And he, but... and he does his homework, and I think his reputation is one of uh, extreme seriousness, so that if, he, if he's suggesting in the letter that it may be as soon as... If he's setting that expectation for the weekend, I would uh, bet that he's going to meet it. So let's go ahead and right now, joining me now on the phone is former U.S. Deputy Assistant Attorney General Bob Litt. Thank you for, for being here, Bob. Uh, a lot of unanswered questions right now. What are you going to be looking for in the next few days? 
Well, I think that um, Attorney General Barr is going to have to review this report and make determinations on how much of it can be made public consistent with the law and policy. And I would hope that one thing he does is be very transparent about the process he's using to make those determinations. Um, I think that at the end of the day, if he chooses to withhold any portions of the report, it's going to be important for the public to understand why that is and that it's not being done for political reasons. So I would hope that we would hear that relatively soon from the Attorney General. The president's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, as you know, has said his legal team wants to look at the findings before they are made public. Is that standard operating procedure? Well, it's difficult to talk about standing, standard operating procedure in what is an entirely unique circumstance. Very true. Uh, I, I will say, however, that there, that I, in my view, at least, the, the there is a potential for a claim of executive privilege here, which might or might not ultimately be sustained by the courts, but that the only person who in the law is allowed to assert executive privilege is the president. And it's difficult for me to understand how that determination can be made without somebody at the White House looking at the document. That's a different thing from saying they should have some sort of editorial revision rights over the document. But I would anticipate that there would probably be some White House review of the document to determine whether or not they want to claim it's uh, executive privilege over any any testimony or, or statements about communications with the president. Now, it may be that there are none in there, um, or it may be that the president determines that the, he's not going to assert executive privilege, but I think that review is going to have to take place. There's going to be a lot of public pressure to force this to be made public, I think possibly on both sides. But once the report is released, just manage expectations for the everyday person how much of this is going to be redacted? Do you think it's going to be heavily redacted? Will we actually be able to read what's going on here? I would expect that uh, Mueller and his team wrote this report with an eye towards having as much of it released to the public as possible. Um, and that, I mean, they are sensitive to issues of grand jury secrecy, of classified information, uh, and that they would have written the document that they would expect could be released to the greatest extent possible. Um, as I said earlier, if, if the attorney general determines he's not going to release it, he's going to have to put forth a very convincing explanation of why certain portions have to be withheld and what the rationale for that is. Bob Litt, thank you so much for joining us. I want to bring back our contributors here on set with us just to touch a little bit on what he was just saying here. How long do you think that this legal process may continue on? Well, um, again, we just, it's the big unknown. It's the, because we don't know what's, what's in the report. Mm -hmm. So um, let's just remember that Mr. Mueller has had, although he's, he's had 22 months, that's relatively short, I think, for such momentous issues. But he's also had access to the very best um, evidence and uh, evidence gathering, uh, in, you know, uh, stuff. So um, what we just don't know, we don't know whether he's concluded that there's, you know, that, that there isn't, that the, all the threads we're worried about, they're all tied off, or whether there are a bunch of other, are there a bunch of other threads that are still open that he didn't pursue because they're outside of his mandate or he couldn't pursue because of DOJ policy. And so there's another very, very large, you know, uh, set of information and, and moves that we all have to digest. We just don't know at this point. Caitlin, your final thoughts, too. The country has been so incredibly divided. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe now with this report being released, it will answer some unanswered questions and maybe calm things down? Or do you think it's going to ignite an entire new rage in people? Well, it really depends. But I think the conclusion of this investigation, to Kira's point earlier, shows that at least for now, what we know about how this has all uh, concluded, gone to the Justice Department, Everybody in Congress has been made aware. And so far, according to the White House, the White House doesn't have any information about what's in this report so far, shows at least at this point that the institutions are holding. And that is, to your point, a very important to note. It's also important to note how relatively short this has been, because I think right. the public has been seeing all this information released in increments and mm -hmm. feeling overwhelmed by it. And you also have a president who has been trying to negate the very premise of this investigation from the very beginning, trying to uh, in, uh, change public opinion or influence public opinion, I should say, 
on this issue by calling it a witch hunt, by, by uh, generating support among his uh, base supporters that this is a, a way um, for opponents to go after him. I think and we've that's seen really that, that reflected in a lot of polling. I think that's really important what you said because he has staunch supporters that say this is in fact a witch hunt. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to those people who say this is really all senseless and a waste of our taxpayer dollars? Well, I think that's why we have to wait and see what's actually in this report. And that's why I say the president is going to be looking for that headline to be able to uh, tweet out or blast out however he sees fit. Um, but again, we just don't know what uh, Mueller has found. And I was also thinking about, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we were all glued to our televisions watching Michael Cohen testify in front of Congress. Of course, Michael Cohen, the president's former attorney, um, you know, I'm curious to know from you, why why should we still be looking at, at Michael Cohen? Because he has information that uh, could still go on, right, beyond sure. this report today. Sure. I mean, Michael Cohen's, uh, his information leads back to the president's uh, business and, um, you know, stuff, stuff that, misconduct that may have occurred prior to him becoming the, the president. And that, that may uh, yield real trouble for Mr. Trump outside of, of this sort of um, the, the Russian set of issues. But to get to your question about why people who, you know, maybe this is just a big, just a big uh, waste of time. Look, our intelligence community determined that Russia interfered with our election. And um, there have been enough sort of threads, the call from Mr. Trump on the campaign trail for WikiLeaks to dump, the meetings, there's enough there that, uh, that, that they're real concerns. And so that's why I think it, this hasn't been a waste of time. We need to get the answers to all this. One way or the yes, no, mm -hmm. or somewhere in the middle. And I think we just have to wait a couple more days. And after 22 months, we will finally see it. Thank you both for being here. Your insight is so helpful in explaining all of this. Coming up next in our next hour, continue to analyst, uh, and we will continue to analyze Robert Mueller's report. We've got a team of correspondents in Washington on Capitol Hill and at the White House. We're going to discuss what's next and what this report means now that it is finished and whether or not we will get to see any of it at all. But before we go, we want to play some of President Trump's comments on the Russia probe throughout the past two years. The entire thing has been a witch hunt, and uh, there is no collusion between certainly myself and my campaign, but I can always speak for myself and the Russians, zero. There was no collusion. I didn't need Russians to help me win Iowa. I didn't need Russians to help me win the great state of Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. No president should ever have to go through what we've gone through in the first two years. It's a hoax, it's a disgrace, and it should never be allowed to happen again. There was no collusion, there was no obstruction, there was no anything, so that's the nice part. There was no phone calls, no nothing. We have a, uh, I won a race. You know why I won the race? Because I was a better candidate than she was.
This is extraordinary. This has altered your life. This is the worst of Florence. This is bigger, though, than opening up the border. This is historic. This, this. This is America's latest superhero. Don't forget to show love. This is his kindergarten class. This one-time school administrator is now architect. This is just some of her army. I want other people to know what they can do to their neighborhoods. This is doable. This history is still living. This is a miracle! So this is working. Oh, it's working. This is extraordinary. This is fascinating. This is... This is... This is... This is real. This is bigger than opening up the borders. This is exactly what fire crews were afraid of. This is what it's like covering a story here in China. This is an explosive investigation. This is amazing. This is all campaign 2020. This is what an ISIS retreat looks like. This is where the eye wall passed over. This. 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 The answer is this. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Dennis. Thank you for joining us. The so-called witch hunt is now over and now Washington waits. After 22 months, special counsel Robert Mueller has finished his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. The probe has resulted in dozens of indictments for federal crimes reaching members of the president's inner circle, his campaign, and Russian citizens as well. The findings are now in the hands of Attorney General William Barr. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer called for the report to be made public. Now that Special Counsel Mueller has submitted his report to the Attorney General, it's imperative for Mr. Barr to make the full report public and provide its underlying documentation and findings to Congress. Attorney General Barr must not give President Trump, his lawyers, or his staff any sneak preview of Special Counsel Mueller's findings or evidence, and the White House must not be allowed to interfere in decisions about what parts of those findings or evidence should be made public. CBS News Washington correspondent Paula Reed reports from the White House on the timeline of what we've seen as this progressed. The report was delivered by a security officer to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein this afternoon. He passed it to Attorney General William Barr within minutes. The White House and the president's lawyers were notified beginning at 4.30. And at 5 p.m., this letter was delivered to the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. In it, Barr wrote, The special counsel has submitted to me today a confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions he has reached. Barr added, He may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. The report is described as comprehensive, and very few people have seen it. The Justice Department would not comment on its length. Washington has been anticipating the report for weeks, with camera crews watching every movement outside special counsel Robert Mueller's offices in a nondescript building in downtown Washington. Even the president didn't know when it was coming. He spoke to reporters on his way to Mar-a-Lago this morning. I have no idea about the Mueller report. I'm going to Florida. But that didn't stop him from criticizing the probe. Uh, there was no collusion. There was no obstruction. Everybody knows it. It's all a big hoax. It's, I call it the witch hunt. In a statement, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said the White House has not received or been briefed on the report. The president's attorney said they were pleased Mueller had delivered his report and said Attorney General Barr will determine appropriate next steps. According to the law, it's up to Barr to decide how much of the report to make public. Earlier this week, the president said he should release the whole thing. Let it come out. Let people see it. But before Congress, Barr has only promised to follow the law. My goal will be to provide as much transparency as I can consistent with the law. Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, it is imperative for Mr. Barr to make a full report public, and the White House must not be allowed to interfere. And 2020 presidential candidates took to Twitter to demand the report be released now. 
So let's talk about all of this in a little bit more detail. CBS Washington correspondent Paula Reed there you can see at the White House. And we have CBS News Chief Washington correspondent Major Garrett here on set with me. Thank you both for being here. Let's first talk about the unprecedented uh, report that has now been passed along. Right. Major, let's, let's talk about this. This is a moment in history that we need to pause and right. just take in. It's a legal moment, and it's a moment where our institutions are under intense scrutiny, not just the presidency, the Justice Department, the special counsel. And should the rules that we've always followed in this country apply, even in the case of President Donald Trump? Well, we're going to test that proposition. What do I mean by the rules? Paula Reed, my colleague, just perfectly elucidated what the rules are. If you're not charged in a special counsel investigation, you have the right for the public not to know that. Why? Because you shouldn't be smeared as any American citizen with the taint of an investigation that didn't lead to an indictable charge. And even if you are indicted under our system, as we all know, that's just an allegation. You have a chance to have your day in court. So if you're not charged, you deserve privacy and the institutional protections that every American citizen is entitled to. We're going to test that proposition right now because you already heard Democrats say every piece of evidence, underlying material, the whole thing should be presented to public. That's a standard that we don't apply to anyone else. And I guarantee you, in this legal moment, when our institutions are being scrutinized, the president's political allies will say, wait a minute, rule of law applies to everyone in this country, but not Donald Trump? They will come back with that not only political, but institutional pushback on this idea that everything that Mueller ever touched is now fair game. Under our system of law, actually it isn't. And those institutions are going to be tested in a legal context, but also in a political context. And that, for the moment, it just seems like we should pause and say, institutions matter. President Trump's presidency itself has called our institutions and their strength into question. Well, they're going to be tested right now. And I have a follow-up question sure. to that. But firstly, Paula, I wanted to ask you this. We assume that things will be heavily redacted. Do you think that the Congress will even be able to see some of the people that were involved in this that will not be indicted? Will they be privy to that information? And if so, does that op open us up for possibly leaks for the American public to then have that information? Well, many Democratic investigators have already said that if the full report is not released, they will start issuing subpoenas for that report or for special counsel Robert Mueller. But the law, the law here, it errs on the side of protecting the identities of people who are investigated and not charged. Under the law, the special counsel is only required to deliver a report to the attorney general, who is then required to brief, a limited briefing, uh, to Congress. But ultimately, there is absolutely no requirement for anything to be made public and certainly not the full report. So I do think you're going to see this as sort of a proxy partisan battle in Congress to get the full report released. But even if that goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, there is no actual precedent on this. But I do think that the justices will look at the special counsel regulation and they will say, you know what, ultimately, this was not designed to be a public document. Uh, this was not designed for congressional lawmakers to get their hands on the names of people who are investigated and not charged. So even if congressional lawmakers want to try, I do not think they will ultimately be successful. Now, in terms of leaks, I got to tell you, I've covered this investigation for almost two years. There are no leaks out of the special counsel's office. I've talked to folks inside the Justice Department. Only a limited number of people will see this full report. They are not leakers. Trust me, I have tried to get them to give me information. And it is highly unlikely uh, that this would leak the full report that's only in the possession of the Justice Department that that would leak. Anything provided to Congress, as we understand it, will also be made public, though. And a couple things on this. Mm -hmm. William Barr, former Attorney General, he served for George Herbert Walker Bush as Attorney General. He's a down-the-line proceduralist, institutionalist. So is Robert Mueller, the special counsel. One of the reasons that the president's lawyers cooperated so consistently with Robert Mueller, whatever President Trump was saying about it on Twitter, the White House lawyers provided interviews, more than 20,000 documents. In many respects, those documents were discussed with the special counsel's office collaboratively so they could be most responsive. So the White House wouldn't just do this blind document up and say, you swim through a million documents that we've handed you. That's cooperation and respect for institutional prerogatives on both sides of this legal question. One other thing our audience might be asking themselves, wait a minute, Ken Starr delivered a whole book. It was a bestseller on Bill Clinton. Why? Ken Starr was an independent counsel created by a statute passed by Congress and signed by a sitting president. It had congressional statutory authority. 
The special counsel is not created by law. It's not like the independent counsel. It's answerable to the Justice Department and the executive branch and those rules. That's why Ken Starr's Star Report, bestseller, available on every bookstore in America for a period of time, is different than this report. I also want to ask you both your thoughts about this. We've got uh, a full list here in my hand. Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, Elizabeth Warren. So all of these Democratic uh, you know, candidates, are they going to be using this as um, a political strategy for them? Will it come up that things have were leaked about uh, Hillary Clinton using her private email server, are they going to say, well, that was a precedent that was set by Comey, and hey, listen, we want to see it all. They might say that. They might say, look, James Comey had a whole press conference without precedent in Justice Department protocol and was later subsequently faulted for that in public, saying, you know what, I've got a public responsibility to tell you I'm not indicting her, but there were things here that were not proper and should not have been done, and there were e e episodes which, in which classified information was transmitted improperly explaining a lot more than had ever been explained before in a kind of investigation mm -hmm. like this. They might say, well, Comey was actually not breaking protocol, or if he was, he was erring on the side of public awareness and transparency, and we ought to use that standard now. We'll see. We'll see. They can make that <laughs> argument, but it's in the hands, as Paula just explained, of the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, and the guidelines. Paula, I want to talk to you, too. Uh, we have the attorney general saying that possibly even this weekend there can be more of a discussion on this. What are you hearing there? And if, in fact, it happens this weekend, how much will be delivered at that time? I was quite surprised to see in his letter that he said he may be able to brief Congress as soon as this weekend because we had some expectation that he would give himself a, a self-imposed deadline, if you will, to brief Congress, basically saying, look, I got the report, leave me alone for X number of days while I go over it. So the fact that he may be able to get through this in 24, 48 hours, that suggests to me that this is not a voluminous report. While well, he describes it as, as comprehensive, I think some people, again, they think of the star report, uh, you know, hundreds of pages, perhaps thousands of pages, but it doesn't appear that that is what he's received. They have not been able to confirm to us uh, the exact length of this report. But just the fact that he may be willing to brief Congress uh, this weekend suggests to me that it's probably closer to around 100 pages or a few hundred pages. He'll go through that and he will make decisions. His only vow has been to be as transparent as possible within the law. And again, the law makes no requirement of him to make anything public. So I think he's going to be very conservative, especially about releasing any information related to people who are not charged. Now, the one thing he is obligated to disclose to Congress is if at any time the special counsel had a disagreement with his supervisor, who would have been either Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker, or William Barr. If at any time they disagreed about a decision, he must disclose that to Congress. So, for example, hypothetically, if Rod, if Rod Rosenstein said, look, you, you can't try to subpoena the president, they would have to disclose this. Now, at one point, there was a disagreement between the special counsel and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein about whether or not you could indict a sitting president, whether or not you could subpoena a sitting president. These were issues that they had to work out, whether or not they wanted to adhere uh, to the standing precedent and the standing DOJ guide guidelines. Ultimately, Rod Rosenstein won out on this. So it will be very interesting to see if there have been any documented disagreements between the special counsel and the Justice Department. And one thing I can tell you, based on my conversations this afternoon with the president's lawyers, they expect a couple of things from this report. Not a lot of requirement for the attorney general to redact things, meaning no national security secrets that are in there that have to be redacted and gone through a whole elaborate national security process of vetting, which would take a lot of time. They also don't expect that there to be any executive privilege hassles in this report, things that the attorney general looks at and says, wait a minute, that, that might tr transgress or trespass on executive privilege things. I better check with the White House counsel's office. They don't expect those kinds of difficulties. So whatever the length of the report, they believe it's something that the attorney general will be able to look at, evaluate, and summarize without these big hassles, national security redactions, executive privilege, and the like. That's their expectation. They haven't been briefed on it. They haven't seen it. And there was, for a fleeting a couple of moments this afternoon, a sense that Rudy Giuliani, one of the president's attorneys, wanted to see it. That's been corrected. They don't want to see it. They have no expectation of seeing it. 
This is in the attorney general's hands, and the attorney general will decide how much to give to Congress. So basically a bulletproof of everything that he had to find in the last 22 months, surmised in some pages for the attorney general to easily review. To, to review and be able to meet what the attorney general and Robert Mueller know is a tremendous appetite and legitimate public curiosity, again, about this legal moment. Mm -hmm. And these are two people who have a long history in the Justice Department, who know politics surrounds the Justice Department. But I do think on the other side of this, Robert Mueller and Bob, Bill Barr want history not to scorch them on their handling of this. And they don't want to appear to be political actors in any shape or form. I think that's their motive and their goal. Whether or not that's going to be the rendered verdict of history, that's going to be for others to decide. But based on my understanding of these two gentlemen and their long history within the Justice Department, it feels the way they're moving and will try to move each and every step of the way. I also want to bring in CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. He's on Capitol Hill and CBS News Chief Justice and Homeland Security correspondent Jeff Begay is in Washington as well. Ed, let's start with you. What are you hearing from lawmakers there? Uh, re repeating what they've been saying now for several weeks, but that, and that is that they expect, they want to see the entire report as conducted by Mueller. But as Major and Paula uh, have outlined, you know, Justice Department guidelines, legal guidelines are such that that may not be possible. I think what's encouraging is that the Attorney General may be working to get something to lawmakers by the time they get back here on Monday morning, if not sooner. Uh, but we've heard uh, what I thought was most striking this afternoon, a joint statement from the Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying essentially that they don't want to learn later that the Attorney General gave a sneak preview, their words, to the White House of what they were going to be eventually telling Congress. And it's telling that we're at a point that they would even have to say such a thing and believe that it is potentially possible. As Major just said, Rudy Giuliani, the president's lead uh, spokesperson or attorney, uh, now says that no, that they don't expect that, they don't want that. But just the, the fact that they'd have to say it at all is a signal that there's a real lack of trust here about how the next 24, 48, 72 hours may go until Attorney General Barr starts to tell lawmakers up here what they want. And remember, there's pressure from both parties, Democrats and Republicans, members of the House and the Senate, to release the findings in full. And there was a vote in the House just before the recess that they took this week, a unanimous vote that Mueller's investigation should be released in full to the American public. So that will be one piece of this. The other, of course, will be what exactly does this say? Where did Mueller go? Where perhaps didn't he go? And that will very quickly outline for House committees led by Democrats where exactly they may want to follow up or where they, want to, where they may want to launch new lines of investigation that perhaps, in their view, weren't properly covered by Mueller and company. And, Major, I want to ask you here, you were with me as we were listening to Chuck Schumer give a press conference here in New York City saying that there is going to be tremendous pressure from the people to release this report right. in full. Sure. And that he would be willing and the rest of Congress or, you know, his counterparts would be willing to take legal action to see more of that come to fruition. Right. Is that something he could do? It's possible. And certainly the House Democratic majority is in a position to issue subpoenas to the special counsel, have him testify, see what questions he's willing to answer publicly. There are ways that this could play itself out. There are political and legal dimensions to this. I would say that in general, the Democrats will be on firm political ground saying, look, this is a taxpayer funded document. Even it's within, the, within the executive branch, there's tremendous public curiosity. There might even be allies of the president who sensing this puts him in the clear would say, hey, let's all see it. Just because the president's in the clear, that's great. That's good for him. Good for us. We've been defending him. And then you yeah. have these institutional <clears throat> pressures to say, wait a minute, just because it's advantageous politically, should we ignore Justice Department guidelines and what we've always done on things like this? You're not charged. You're not smeared in public or relieved in public. You're just not talked about. These things are all going to be playing out. And because this is a moment of worth taking stock of all those things, it will be interesting to see how much the political players actually, not just for this time, but for all time, weigh these institutional dimensions, prerogatives, and precedents, or are we just going to get all dirty, all political, all the time? All right. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. Ed, I know that you wanted to chime in on this. If you wanted to touch on what Major just said, go right ahead. Exactly. There, there are allies of the president calling 
for the full public release of this report. None other than Doug Collins, the congressman from Georgia, the lead Republican on the House Judiciary Committee, who would be the lead Republican in the event there are more, invest more hearings, more investigations, potential impeachment. He said in a statement this afternoon, I fully expect the Justice Department to release the special counsel's report to this committee and to the public without delay and to the maximum extent permitted by law. None other than Corey Lewandowski, the president's former campaign manager, also said on Twitter this afternoon, millions of taxpayer dollars spent, the American public deserve to see it all. But Gaze, I want to bring you in here. What is the process for what the Justice Department will choose to release? How are they going to decide what the public and even Congress will see? Well, keep in mind, this is a national security investigation, so there is classified information potentially in this report also, uh, and I'm sure Major has talked about this. There are these questions about whether the president, the White House, can exert executive privilege over some of the information in there, so there, there are several different factors that they have to weigh. But, and if Major is still standing by, there is something about this that I've noticed. Over the last several hours, in fact, or a couple of hours, really, uh, since we learned that this report had been delivered to the Department of Justice, the White House has really showed restraint. I mean, if you look at the headlines coming out of this, these developments today, you have the the, the report going to the, the Department of Justice, and then the subheadline, if you will, is that there will be no more indictments coming from the special counsel's office. Theoretically, the White House should be celebrating that. Uh, maybe they are uh, privately, but publicly they aren't. And that tells you a lot, in my view, about what may be in this report. Or it tells you that they just don't know what's coming next. Uh, and they don't know what these conclusions are going to be, and that is perhaps why they are showing this restraint. I don't think we've seen any any tweets from the president uh, reiterating what he's been saying all week, that there is no evidence of collusion, this is a witch hunt, things like that. We have not heard that. Uh, and that's why so much is writing, not only for uh, the White House, but also for the Democrats, as far as 2020 is concerned, and Republicans in the House and Senate. So much is writing on what happens over the next 24 to 48 hours with this report uh, as it's delivered to Congress from the Attorney General. And that's why we are just waiting to see, even though we know that the Russia investigation uh, by the special counsel is now concluded, we still don't have those very important answers uh, that this nearly two-year investigation has looked into. Again, looking into whether there was any type of coordination uh, between Russian operatives and the Trump campaign. And the, the missing piece of this really is the president's role in all this. We've already, we've already seen that the president's uh, former campaign chairman Paul Manafort, indicted, guilty pleas. Uh, Michael Flynn, former national security advisor, uh, guilty plea. Michael Cohen, the president's former personal attorney. So, so much has happened over the last 22, 24 months. Uh, but the missing piece there is what type of role, according to investigators, did the president play? All right, Jeff, let's go ahead and move right now to Paula Reed at the White House. And, and actually, just to uh, follow up with you, know the president has not tweeted. His last tweet was at 4.20 this afternoon. And, of course, all of this breaking at around 5 o'clock. Uh, but, Paula, we've seen a number of 2020 Democratic presidential candidates, many of whom are lawmakers, weighing in. I, I mean, I have a full list here from Kirsten Gillibrand to Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. We have exactly. others like uh, Beto O'Rourke. So all this pressure on Barr to make this report as public as possible, do you think he will succumb to that pressure? I do not. I absolutely do not. I think he is going to follow the Department of Justice regulation to the letter. He is going to follow the Justice Department precedent of not releasing details about those who are investigated and not charged. He was pretty clear about this in his confirmation hearing. He vowed to be transparent, but only as transparent as the law allows. So as he goes through this, he's going to be working with the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein. He's the one who appointed the special counsel. He's overseen this investigation since the beginning, and he's actually been the one who's been liaising 
with the special counsel's office over the past several weeks as Barr has gotten settled inside the Justice Department. The two of them, very similar outlook on this issue. I think they're going to be very conservative in terms of how much information they release, but the special counsel may have made that easy for them by not actually giving them that much information. Uh, he only had to explain why he chose to prosecute some people and not prosecute others. So there may not be too much that they have to go through on this short timeline. The fact that he may be able to brief Congress as, as soon as this weekend, that suggests there's probably not going to be a lot of classified information or too much information in there that is privileged. And we know that the White House lawyers are now with the president in Mar-a-Lago. Do we know the latest from what we're hearing from the White House? So far, they've been deferring to the Justice Department. This has been a recent change of tune over the past several weeks uh, as the president has been asked, hey, what should happen to the Mueller report? He has been pretty consistent in saying what happens to the Mueller report is up to my attorney general. He then endorses his attorney general as a man who is respected and a man of character. But in the same breath, he will, of course, trash the entire investigation as a witch hunt. But in terms of this decision that needs to be made over the coming days, he has consistently been deferring to his attorney general, William Barr. It seems the president has considerable confidence uh, that the attorney general will be judicious in terms of what he releases. We also know that William Barr has a pretty narrow definition of, of what obstruction of justice looks like from a president. So I think that also gives uh, the president reason to be confident that he has little to fear with his current attorney general. All right, Ed, I wanted to bring you in here, too. Um, what do you think here is the next step? Are we just now waiting uh, indefinitely? <laughs> or we wait until we find out what this full report will be? I mean, will the Amer American public ever really see this? Well, we'll see something. What, what we see and whether that's enough for people remains to be seen. But at this point, based on the guidance we got from the Justice Department this afternoon, we will await word from the Justice Department tomorrow as to whether or not Barr was being serious that something will come this weekend or whether we can pack up, go home, and wait until Monday or Tuesday or some point next week. Uh, in a sign that perhaps this isn't being taken as urgently as some might think, we know that Speaker Pelosi, for example, is still home in San Francisco and doesn't plan to return to Washington until Monday. So there's no real impetus to get here faster, at least in the views of senior leaders like her. No matter what is released, no matter what happens next legally, there will be ongoing investigations up here on Capitol Hill. The House Judiciary Committee uh, has already launched conversations with Michael Cohen. Uh, there are other uh, hearings set to be held in the coming week. Uh, the House Financial Services Committee, Ways and Means Committee, uh, Intelligence Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee are all looking into aspects of the Trump administration in this regard, regarding the election, regarding Russia, but also, of course, other aspects of the administration. Is the president violating the emoluments clause by continuing to collect money from the Trump hotel that's run by his family? Uh, what about the communications of Justice, or of uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump with foreign leaders and with other government officials? What about everybody's security clearances? Run the gamut. Think of everything that's come up over the last two years, and Democrats are still sorting out what exactly they might do about it. Much of that depends on what's in this report. One other thing I suspect now will become uh, a line of inquiry if things go sideways this weekend is what exactly happened starting at 4.30 this afternoon when the Justice Department and the White House were informed that the report was complete until Congress is told whenever that is. Who was with the Attorney General? Who did he talk to about this? Who got to see it? What did they decide to put in their summary to Congress? What was that debate about? What did those deliberations look like? All of that now in the coming days and coming months, maybe years, going to be subject of potential legal action by Democrats if they don't like how things go here and congressional hearings if, again, Democrats don't like how things go here. Let me bring in Jeff. Jeff, what is your response to that? Do you think it will continue to take legal action? Do you think it will get to that? Well, yeah, I think this is one of those moments where you will see a, a, a litigated process, so no doubt about that. But I wanted to mention, Alex, that you know, I've been texting with some of the prime figures, if you will, people who've been involved in this investigation, questioned by the special counsel's office. For example, Jerome Corsi, who was interviewed by the special counsel's office. There was a, a plea deal being floated that he denied or turned down. Uh, he texted me and he says that he is feeling vindicated. Also heard from Michael Caputo, who was also questioned uh, by the special counsel's office. He worked 
uh, on the Trump campaign. Uh, as I said, questioned by the special counsel's office, he sent me a text uh, essentially saying the same thing that J Jerome Corsi said, which was uh, marked safe uh, from Robert Mueller today. So there are people who are feeling vindicated now that this investigation is over as far as it relates to the special counsel's office. Uh, and that's why in, in many ways it is notable that the White House has shown uh, a great deal of restraint to this point. We'll see what, what happens on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, but right now, it is notable that uh, there are people who have been wrapped up in this investigation who are breathing a sigh of relief right now while the White House is more restrained, uh, perhaps looking forward to, or ahead to what might be coming in the next couple of days. I guess it decides, uh, depends on what side you're on, Jeff. So Paula Reed, Ed O'Keefe, and Jeff Begays, thank you all for being here. I want to go ahead now and bring in CBSN political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns, CBSN legal contributor Kerr Dougal, who is also here, former assistant U.S. attorney in the New York Eastern District. We've been talking about this uh, extensively about how uh, monumental this is in the history of the legal proceedings here in our country. Just kind of touch on the importance of what is actually happening here. So, um Really, what's at stake is, um, as Major said earlier, our core um, institutions. Will they hold up? They are under the most intense scrutiny, um, you know, in our history right now. Um, and the key principle at stake is whether or not um, no one is above the law. Does the law apply to all of us, um, or are there special exceptions? That's that's really what's at stake right now. So. In addition, you know, do do we is Congress going to step up and take its role of of oversight? Uh, you know, um, you know, do we think that um, that uh, we've gotten to the bottom of these core concerns that we have? Um, will there be transparency? I mean, these are all core functions, core parts of our credo as a Republican form of government um, for 240 years. I mean, we really. It's hard to overstate how important this moment is. Caitlin, let's talk about um, where this may go for Congress. Do you think mm -hmm. they could force the hand of the attorney general to release more of the report if they, if their appetites are not you know, fulfilled with what he chooses to release to them. Oh, certainly. And Democrats control the House now, so they are in charge of the various committees of jurisdiction. And they have been saying for a while now that they want everything to come out uh, from this investigation. You've also seen some Democrats point to James Comey. And when James Comey came out during the 2016 election to talk about his findings about Hillary Clinton's emails, they're kind of evoking that as now the standard set uh, and wanting to uh, have transparency here. You also hear some Democrats calling for uh, William Barr and Robert Mueller to come before Congress at some point to testify about these findings so they could glean more information from that. And then as we've been talking about too, there are all these other threads involved in this from Michael Cohen uh, to other actors involved that we're waiting to see what comes down from those probes going on in the Southern Districts, for example. And you also have little bits of information that have come out that other committees could start to look into further. I also want to bring in CBSN political contributor on Capitol Hill and the reporter for The Hill, Molly Hooper, is here in Washington. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. We've seen a number now of 2020 Democratic presidential candidates. Many of them are lawmakers themselves that have put more mm -hmm. pressure on Barr to make as much of this report public as he can. Do you think that that is a legitimate request? Well, well, they have put pressure on Barr, but again, Barr is somebody who's about procedures and about Department of Justice regulations. And I think what may have more sway with Barr is when you hear or you see six of the the House Democratic Committee chairmen who just in, issued a who just released a statement, including Judiciary Chairman Nadler, who basically said, "Listen, the Justice Department must now release to the public the entire report submitted by the Special Counsel because." Um, 
you know, if, if there is information in that report that the president has engaged in criminal or other serious misconduct, then they cannot conceal that information. And because the Justice Department believes that they cannot um, indict a sitting president, the concern by these committee chairmen is that, for some, you know, in some case, um, they made the president, the information that would be out there that could indict him won't be made public. And so they're saying, you know, to withhold evidence of wrongdoing from Congress because a sitting president cannot be charged is to convert Justice Department policy into the means for a cover-up. Now, that may hold a little bit more sway with Bill Barr, and it's something that I know Adam Schiff and Nadler and these other committee chairmen will be pushing for as they request, you know, a briefing of the, the entire, the entire uh, Mueller report. So, Karen, I want to ask you this. We touched on it a little bit earlier. Typically, people that are not indicted of a crime, if they and their names show up in this report, their identity is protected. But there was kind of a left turn when Comey talked about Hillary Clinton and her private email server, and then she never faced any charges. Do you think that that set a precedent that maybe now we're going to see more information come out and other names released because that happened originally? So I need to be very, very clear about this. We've all been describing this rule correctly, that in the general case, 99.9% .9 of the time, if somebody is the subject of an investigation but they're not charged, the Justice Department says nothing. There is a very important exception to this policy, and it's been on the books for a long time, long before Mr. Comey gave his press release, uh, his press conference in July of 2016, where it's a matter of intense public concern. The Justice Department is, under its own policy, it is entitled and may it's a judgment call, it's a discretionary call, but they can alert the public to a danger, for instance. They can, where there's intense public scrutiny, they can make an announcement about an unindicted uh, individual. And it's particularly here, I just want to touch on what Molly said, right? Uh, turning um, the policy into a, into a cover-up. One part of the policy says the president can't be indicted. That's Justice Department uh, practice or policy. To then turn around and say that, well, because he wasn't indicted, we can't say anything. It just it, it creates a sort of an impossible situation. Um, the, 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 the other core thing to remember here is um, the president is a unique individual because he's the president. He's got this giant bullhorn. He's been using it on, on Twitter. He's been, he's been saying all sorts of things publicly about this investigation. And so now to, to not hear the rejoinder, to hear what the professionals in, on Mueller's team have spent two years doing with the best um, techniques, the best evidence gathering ability, and the best facts to not hear what uh, the result of that investigation um, would be, I think, would be completely unsatisfactory to, to the public and ultimately to Congress. Let's go ahead and bring in now Jonathan Turley, a CBS News legal analyst and a professor of public interest law at George Washington University Law School. Uh, we've seen a number of these 2020 candidates jump in and, and weigh in, many of whom are saying that we need to see this full report. I know that you said personally, you know, Mr. Barr, do you think that he is going to be swayed or feel pressure because of that? No. no I, pushing Bill Barr is a rather silly uh, um, objective. Uh, he's not going to be pushed by anyone, not by the president, not by these senators. Uh, he's going to do exactly what he thinks needs to be done in the interest of the Justice Department. Uh, when he says that he wants to reveal as much as possible, you can take it to the bank uh, that he wants to do that. But it's a more complicated question than these Democratic candidates have indicated. He cannot as a legal matter, release that report without removing any grand jury information, classified information, unless he gives it under seal to Congress, um, and things like privacy protected information. There are laws that he has to comply with. Now, does that mean that would take a long time? Not necessarily. Uh, Bob Mueller might have written this thing uh, with the idea that it could be made public. The special counsel regulations do not discuss the release of this type of report. They talk about the release of a summary, and, and then Congress will get that from uh, Bill Barr. But it also doesn't, you know, uh, prohibit the release of this type of report. This is an executive branch document. Uh, they can waive privileges, they can waive these objections, and they can make it public. Uh, and I think that most people in Washington want to see that happen.
All right, I wanted to ask Molly a question here. Do you think that the White House knew that this was coming? Hey, that's a <laughs> that's a great question. I think I think a lot of people want to know if the White House knew if that was coming, if this was coming. But again, all signs sort of pointed to it wrapping up. You know, with with the with the pretty much the disbursement of a lot of the staffers who had been working on the the special counsel's investigation. It, it was clear that time was ticking and, and it was getting close. But but again, I'm not I'm not sure if they did know. Um, I think that that's going to be a question that Congress is going to want to know. And again, when you have House Democrats in control of these key committees, including the Intelligence Committee and Judiciary Committee, Oversight Committee, um, those are questions that they are going to want to have answered. Caitlin, I wanted to ask you this. Sarah Sanders, press secretary, has now said it, that the White House has not received or been briefed on the special counsel's report. Mm -hmm. We've also heard from Nancy Pelosi, Chuck mm -hmm. Schumer, who have said that they do not want, quote, a sneak preview given to the president mm -hmm. so that he can alter the narrative. Uh, do you feel as though he should be briefed or do you think he is being briefed by any part of uh, someone in this process for him to be aware of what's coming up? Well, the White House has said that they have not gotten any information about what's in this report. And the reason that Democrats don't want him uh, to be briefed uh, before everybody else is is because they don't want the appearance of any kind of coordination. Uh, and of course, the, the White House, as of now, from what we know publicly, is, is sticking to that. But there is this question, as the president has repeatedly tried to undermine this investigation during Barr's own confirmation process, uh, he was asked about you know, upholding the integrity of this, this investigation. You have Republicans and Democrats who have argued uh, that they want to see this thing uh, go to its final conclusion, and it appears that it has. The question now becomes what information is going to be made public from this, and what are we going to learn about this? It's also important to take a step back and remember that this investigation has been going on pretty much the entire uh, duration of this president's, uh, at least the, the, sure. uh, so far. Uh, this has this is a huge story. Uh, this is a huge deal for him, as we know his response to it. Uh, and so this is a big moment uh, that it has finally reached its conclusion, and we're waiting to see what exactly that is. And Jonathan, I want to ask you this. This investigation has gone on for nearly two years. What do you think of the timeline? How does this compare to other investigations in terms of pace and actual charges, keeping in mind, of course, that there's never really been something of this magnitude? No, I think that this was uh, about the time frame that you would expect. Uh, many people wanted it to happen sooner. A lot of people try to measure the special counsel uh, by how many people he's indicted. That's not his job. His job was to find out what happened, uh, and he has done so. Now, the question is going to be the extent to which we all learn uh, what he found. And, and this is going to be a tough issue for someone like Rod Rosenstein, uh, Stein, who um, vociferously objected to James Comey, the former F uh, FBI director, uh, for his, his uh, press conference involving Hillary Clinton. Uh, Rosenstein uh, really did support uh, his firing. He didn't call for it. He was not the reason for it. But his memo left no question that he thought that Comey violated that core duty. So there will be some rank and file who say, you know, this is not what we do. We don't uh, you spill the beans on people that we're not going to indict. But there is an added issue here. The Justice Department has a policy that it won't indict a sitting president. I think it's the wrong policy, but it's the policy. So for them to say that we're not going to release this information because the president wasn't indicted um, seems a rather forced explanation. I mean, th by their own policy, they can't indict him. Uh, and so that's not very satisfying for a special counsel report. And finally, Mueller is not Comey. Comey was looking for a criminal uh, charge, if there was one, uh, for Hillary Clinton's actions. The special counsel was, was designed to find out the truth and to inform the public as to his conclusions. And Kier here nodding his head in agreement with you. 34 people have also been charged by the special counsel in connection with the investigation. Does that provide us any insight as what may be to come in this report, maybe more people? Well, one of the key things about about uh, Mr. Mueller's mandate is that in addition to the criminal investigation, he's involved in a counterintelligence investigation. Um, in, in other words, 
you know, are active measures by a hostile foreign power, Russia, were they employed or are they currently being employed? We saw that in the uh, troll farm indictment. We saw that in the um, Russian intelligence officials indictment. So the, the, the key th sort of the key things that are upcoming, I think, in this, in addition to, to you know, are more people going to be charged or not? There's a, a, a count because there's a counterintelligence um, component of this. There's I expect there will also be briefings to Congress, to the intelligence committees about the findings on an intelligence basis. So th there's a, a, another potential avenue of disclosure to Congress relating to the investigation's findings. So on the one, so on the one hand, um, if the public doesn't receive this report, and I agree with, um, with Jonathan that um, the pressure will be intense and that Mr. Barr is, is uh, very likely to carry out his word that he said in, in, his, uh, in his, uh, his hearing, um, but if, it, if he doesn't, if there's some big piece of, of, of information that's, that's withheld um, from the public report, I think members of Congress who are on the intelligence committees are going to hear about it anyways. They're going to hear about it on that avenue. There's sort of multiple things that are in play here. And um, as, as I think I've heard other guests say, you know, in Washington, um, things have a tendency to, to, to come out. And so if there's a big disclosure on the intelligence side, um, and so we know there's a big piece that's missing. I think we'll, we'll find out, oh, wait a minute, we don't have the whole story on the public side. And I, I bet, you know, Mr. Barr and Mr. Mueller, they play chess and they, they're not playing checkers. Mm -hmm. I think they, they understand that, that that's the dynamic here. I think that's another element of the pressure that they're going to be facing um, to release as much information as possible. It's certainly a methodical process yes. on both of their parts. I also want to read a section of Barr's letter to Congress, and it said, quote, the special counsel regulations require that I provide you with a desperation and explanation of instances, if any, in which the attorney general or acting attorney general concluded that a proposed action by a special counsel was so inappropriate or unwarranted under established departmental practices that it should not be pursued. There were no such instances during the special counsel's investigation. So let's go ahead and bring in Molly. Can you kind of break this down for us? What are we hearing when we hear that statement? Well, you know, I would love to answer that with a legal response, but I think that Jonathan Turley probably has a better answer. But I do know that that's one thing that Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham was particularly pleased with, and in his statement today said, uh, I think that was the second point he made, essentially that there was no disagreement between um, the, these players, because it's my understanding that the special counsel, each time you wanted to expand his investigation or his inquiry into different threads of— in, the inquiry, he would have to get essentially the sign off by Rod Rosenstein um, or you know, then William Barr and 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 whatnot. And that, and basically what that what that's saying is that that paragraph is saying that um, that Mueller was never turned down in a request to go down a particular avenue of an inquiry. So Jonathan, touch on this a little bit more, the legal <laughs> meaning behind this process and this statement. Well, a lot of people have been focusing on that because uh, Bill Barr, before his confirmation hearing, did a memo in which he raised serious questions about whether any of this could be an obstruction of justice charge. Uh, it was a, a, a detailed and, I thought, excellent memo. You won't could disagree with it. Uh, but he really raised the question of whether this met the elements of that crime. So some people read that sentence as saying, well, obviously that was not an issue uh, with regard to Bill Barr and reviewing the special counsel's actions. I don't know if you could really read that much into it. I think it is telling that there's no more indictments coming down from the special counsel. That is what I think is the most telling thing. If there was a serious collusion case to be made, I would expect other people to be indicted. So I think for those people that have really held out hope that collusion could be established uh, against the president, I think tonight is a rather chilling uh, situation for them. Uh, this does not look like a report uh, which establishes collusion if, you, if it is true that there are no more indictments coming out. And Caitlin, I wanted to ask you this. Um... You followed a lot of cases where you've waited until like the last hour for things to be released. Did you make anything of it that it was a Friday night at five o'clock in the evening? 
uh, there's some speculation on Twitter. I've been seeing people, you know, kind of create a narrative here. But what would your insight be? You know, it's really interesting because we are in a news environment that almost seems stranger than fiction at most times. And releasing this at five o'clock on a Friday is actually one of the more predictable elements of this. <laughs> we have seen uh, a lot of information come out uh, in, in news cycles, the, the Friday news dump kind of thing. We've also, though, seen from the Mueller report information come out uh, at various times, various days. Um, what's significant here, though, is that, you know, all eyes have been kind of waiting uh, to, to see what when this would actually happen. And, it, and it's here. And it almost feels a little bit surreal, this thing that we've been following for the past uh, two years, that it has actually finally uh, reached its con mm -hmm. conclusion. And now we're all wondering uh, what that actually is. But don't take like too much of a sigh of relief because I have a feeling there's so much more to come, right? <laughs> yes. As we continue now to hear it's this all unfold the beginning, in the really. next chapter. <laughs> so Keir Dougal, Jonathan Turley, Caitlin Huey Burns, and of course we have Molly with us as well. Thank you all for being here. Thank the you. Russia investigation has lasted nearly two years for a look at how we got here. Here's CBS News political correspondent at O'Keefe. In May of 2017, the FBI was investigating contacts between Trump associates and Russia during the 2016 presidential campaign when President Trump abruptly fired director James Comey. The president initially cited Comey's handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation as the reason for his dismissal. But two days later, he pointed to the Russia probe, calling it a, quote, made-up story. Over the next six days, there were more revelations the president had privately asked Comey for his loyalty and to drop part of the investigation. That led Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein to appoint Mueller on May 17th to examine Russian interference in the 2016 election. That investigation grew to include whether the president had obstructed justice. Since then, Mueller charged six Trump associates for crimes ranging from lying to the FBI to tax evasion. They included former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, former campaign chairman Paul Manafort, the president's former personal attorney Michael Cohen, and longtime confidant Roger Stone. All but Stone pleaded guilty and cooperated with the investigation. Twenty-five Russian nationals have been indicted on charges related to hacking or the dissemination of false information. Party. During the campaign, Trump said this amid the controversy surrounding Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. According to Mueller's court filings, that same day, Russian hackers went after the emails of Hillary Clinton staffers, emails that would eventually be leaked. The president's family did not escape scrutiny. Of particular interest, a meeting at Trump Tower in June of 2016, where a Russian lawyer with ties to Putin met with Manafort, the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., and Mr. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. All the while, President Trump denied any collusion with Russia. And I didn't need Russians to help me win Iowa. He also consistently attacked the special counsel and the Justice Department. No collusion, no nothing. Called the phony witch hunt. So let's bring in Joel Payne and Michael Graham. Joel is a Democratic strategist, former Hillary for America senior aide, and a vice president at MWWPR. Michael is a CBSM political contributor and conservative columnist for the Boston Herald. He's also a politics editor for NHJournal.com. Thank you both for being here. Big day, 22 months we've been following this closely. And Joel, we've already seen the issue of impeachment divide the Democratic Party. How can this report further fuel those arguments more or maybe put them to rest? Well, it's interesting. You know, if you see the report as a destination, or rather, if you, if you look at the journey versus the destination, the journey here has 30 people indicted, has a lot of doubt cast on whether or not the president had people who were breaking the law on a regular basis around him, whether or not the president himself is implicated in, in criminal behavior himself. So, look, from a standpoint of is the president in hot water um, for his own behavior, it certainly seems like um, the report would indicate that he's escaped that. But the president fostered an environment and led a campaign where there was a lot of bad behavior going on and a lot of uh, people making poor choices and, in some cases, illegal choices. Um, and I don't think, regardless of whatever this report says today, I don't think that the president can escape that. Um, I do think he has messaged overall the, uh, the, the, the issue of the Russia report. He's messaged it pretty well to his base, again, whether or not he can get beyond the fact that these people were around him and were advising him 
Um, that's to be determined. So, Michael, it doesn't seem from what we're gathering so far that right. the president will face any addition or face any charges at this moment. But can the president breathe a sign of relief just yet, even though we haven't gotten any indication of that? Could that still come? Uh, every day that I turn on CBSN, which I watch religiously, and I don't see the president being frog marched out of the White House in handcuffs, I'm pretty amazed. I mean, you know, he's he's got so many app, you know, uh, balls in the air. But I have to say, Joel, nice job trying to spin that. This is a fiasco for the Democrats if, in fact, nobody's uh, indicted from this. This is a fiasco if, in fact, there's no presentation of evidence of collusion. <laughs> President Trump has had one premise from the beginning, and that is that this was all a witch hunt, a scam, and that there was no there there. It wasn't, I kind of colluded, or, you know, these all things all get settled in court. No, no, he said it didn't happen. And if that's what, as a Republican, I will say, if that's what we discover, I will be as shocked as anybody. And this is a huge win, and it really does, I think, turn the focus of a lot of casual voters, not the hardcore people who watch it every night on TV or who love Trump and didn't care what it said. I think it does reiterate this notion that Trump has not been treated fairly. He hasn't been given a straight shot by the media or by the government establishments in D.C., and that he is the number one outsider, which is a really strong message, I think, in the 2020 cycle. And speaking of the 2020 cycle, this is for both of you. We are still a long way away, but you know we will be discussing it thoroughly between now and then. Uh, what does this change as far as a political landscape is concerned heading towards that? I mean, I have a list of all of the candidates that have already tweeted that they want to see this made public immediately. They want to have every detail at their fingertips. So um, who wants to take it first? Go ahead, Joel. Tell me what you think. I'll, I'll start. Uh, I know Michael likes the counterpunch. Um, <laughs> I don't think it changes a thing. Um, I think that, you know, look, Michael's certainly right. The president has had one story the entire time in terms of his involvement, um, and, and that's fine. And I think that's kind of big. You know, that was the point I was making before. The president has done a really good job of selling this to his base and keeping his base with him. Um, I do think we still have to see whether or not that's going to have an impact on independence. But in terms of how Democrats, how those hopefuls are going to go after President Trump, listen, nothing that happened today changes the fact that 30 people connected to this president and his campaign were indicted as a part of this. The fact that Michael Cohen, the president's one-time close personal confidant, is going to jail for three years. The fact that the president's former campaign chair is going to jail for almost a decade and probably going to um, end up dying in jail. Um, those are all significant facts that whatever happens today can't be missed. So it's a mixed bag. Um, it's certainly something, again, that the president can say, I've always said that this is my case, this is, this is the case that I've made. But whether or not the president can completely divorce himself from any kind of responsibility here, I don't think voters are going to let him off the hook for that. All right, Michael, take it away. So uh, there's a certain other network, I'm not going to mention the names, but it rhymes with Ben BC, who've started talking in the last 48 hours, hey, can we even trust the Mueller report? And it is that sort of kind of paranoia, conspiracy, you know, the, the notion that Trump is going to get away with this, we can't let him get away with this. It really feeds the least productive element inside the Democratic uh, uh, Party. The candidates who are trying to make the case I want to do something differently, I, whatever I think, you know, Trump's been negative or we're leaving people behind or our foreign policy, whatever. That's a strong case, I think, to make for a president who's consistently underwater nationally by around 10 points. But the case that's more on the Elizabeth Warden kind of maybe even Ocasio-Cortez kind of, we've got to get him, you know, we just, uh, that, that, that kind of anger and, and fraught with emotion, I don't think that that's a winning message. And I think that if Trump walks away and appears to be validated, that branch of the Democratic coalition is going to be very angry, very frustrated, and they're going to look for the first person who picks up a pitchfork and says, let's charge the barricades. Okay, so on that point, Michael, after all this talk of a witch hunt, uh, Russia hoax, does it seem like Americans will feel confident in Mueller's findings? Do you think, I know you talked about networks in particular, but right. what about the American people? You know, I think that one thing that Joel got right, and it pains me to say that, Joel, but I don't think, right, a lot of this is baked in. The Trump lovers were going to ignore whatever it said. You know, they could come out with photos of Trump handing a big file mark collusion to Putin, and they would still stick. The people who hate Trump, they don't care. You could have, you know, whatever testimony. So that part is there. 
I do think, though, like I said, that there are a group of Americans, as the economy does so well, I thought it was interesting, the Wall Street Journal did a piece today where they said, let's skip the polls, let's look at the economic uh, uh, metrics that have been used in the past to predict elections. There are these economists who look at things like unemployment, whatever. All of those metrics that have been pretty successful in the past show Trump winning big because the economy is in good shape. And so if Trump can go back and say, look, I told you these people were crazy. I'm just trying to create jobs. I'm just trying to take on China. I'm just trying to help blue collar workers in the Rust Belt. This really, I, I think that, that if this turns out to be a flop, it might open the door for some of those swing voters. There aren't a lot left. Trump makes a lot of people like him and hate him. But for those five, eight percent people who are open, I think this cracks the door a bit more for them to say, maybe we should give the guy another chance. So, Joel, going back to some of what Michael just said, we've already seen the issue of impeachment divide the Democratic Party. How can this report further fuel those arguments more or maybe even put them to rest? You know, I think those, those that has been put to rest. And, you know, I know a lot was made about uh, Speaker Pelosi talking about this a few weeks ago. But really, if you look at it, it's been a relatively fringe issue in the Democratic Party. Um, and by fringe, I don't mean the people who are talking about it. I'm talking about the percentage of people who are discussing impeachment. There's not a lot of Democrats that are campaigning on that. I think I saw a study that in the 2018 midterms, you know, something like less than 3 percent of candidates on the Democratic side even mentioned impeachment in their campaign materials, online, or in ads, which tells me that Democrats understand that this is not what voters are going to primarily judge them vis-a-vis -vis President Trump on. Uh, voters are going to judge them on how they do uh, with health care, how they do with the economy, how they counter President Trump and his rhetoric. That's what Democrats are going to be judged on. That's what Democrats are going to continue to be judged on. And again, I don't think anything that happened tonight changes that. I think, like Michael said, people who are already going to vote for Donald Trump as a, as a kind of a, a way to stick it to the FBI or, or, or to the, the powers that be, the right. God, data, the terms that they use, um, they're already, they're, they were going to do that and they're going to continue to do that. And the people who were going to not believe President Trump, regardless of whatever came out tonight, they're going to feel that way. It's that, that group in the middle that can be moved. And um, I think we've got about 18 months in a campaign to see how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. Joel Payne and Michael Graham, thank you both for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. It's the top of the hour. I'm Alex Dennis. Thank you for joining us. Special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation is now over. And now the findings are in the hands of the Attorney General William Barr. The Justice Department says that the principal co conclusions of the report will be made public. A senior Justice Department official has told CBS News that Mueller is not recommending other further indictments. Special counsel spokesperson Peter Carr said in a statement that Mueller will be concluding his service in the coming days. A small number of staff will stay on to assist the closing of the operations of the office. The nearly two-year-long probe has resulted in dozens of indictments for federal crimes reaching members of the president's inner circle. You can see some of them there, his campaign and Russian citizens alike. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer called for the report to be made public. Here's what he had to say. Now that Special Counsel Mueller has submitted his report to the Attorney General, it's imperative for Mr. Barr to make the full report public and provide its underlying documentation and findings to Congress. Attorney General Barr must not give President Trump, his lawyers, or his staff any sneak preview of Special Counsel Mueller's findings or evidence. And the White House must not be allowed to interfere in decisions about what parts of those findings or evidence should be made public. CBS News Washington correspondent Paula Reed reports from the White House. The report was delivered by a security officer to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein this afternoon. He passed it to Attorney General William Barr within minutes. The White House and the president's lawyers were notified beginning at 4.30. And at 5 p.m., this letter was delivered to the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. In it, Barr wrote, the special counsel has submitted to me today a confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions he has reached. Barr added, he may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. The report is described as comprehensive and very few people have seen it. The Justice Department would not comment on its length. Washington has been anticipating the report for weeks, with camera crews watching every movement outside special counsel Robert Mueller's offices in a nondescript building in downtown Washington. 
Even the president didn't know when it was coming. He spoke to reporters on his way to Mar-a-Lago this morning. I have no idea about the Mueller report. I'm going to Florida. But that didn't stop him from criticizing the probe. Uh, there was no collusion. There was no obstruction. Everybody knows it. It's all a big hoax. It's, I call it the witch hunt. In a statement, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said the White House has not received or been briefed on the report. The president's attorney said they were pleased Mueller had delivered his report and said Attorney General Barr will determine appropriate next steps. According to the law, it's up to Barr to decide how much of the report to make public. Earlier this week, the president said he should release the whole thing. Let it come out. Let people see it. But before Congress, Barr has only promised to follow the law. My goal will be to provide as much transparency as I can consistent with the law. Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, it is imperative for Mr. Barr to make a full report public and the White House must not be allowed to interfere. And 2020 presidential candidates took to Twitter to demand the report be released now. And let's check in right now with Nicole Killian is traveling with the president in West Palm Beach, Florida. We have Mola Lange at the White House as well. Nicole, I wanted to start with you. We spoke at about six o'clock this afternoon or this evening, and you said that the president wouldn't be seen or heard from until about 730. We're now at eight o'clock. Did you get any reaction or did you actually get a sighting? Well, no sightings at all. In fact, uh, the White House uh, came out uh, just before 7 and called a lid, meaning we will not hear or see from the president tonight. And I did uh, press uh, officials from the White House on this about whether we will hear from the president in any kind of form, a tweet, uh, you know, get any information on background from officials. And I was told they have nothing at this time. So at this point, uh, the primary reaction we have from the White House is a statement uh, that was put out earlier this evening uh, by Sarah Sanders, which reads the next steps are up to Attorney General Barr, and we look forward to the process taking its course. The White House has not received or been briefed on the special counsel's report. Uh, so as of now, uh, that's the reaction that stands at this hour. And I've been checking closely the president's Twitter page because we usually have a running dialogue here. The last tweet was at about 420, so roughly three hours ago or so, we have not seen or heard anything from him. Mola, you're at the White House. Do you have a sense of officials there were ready for this to happen today? Well, Alex, uh, you know, as you know, uh, all of Washington has been on uh, Mueller report watch for weeks, if not months now. Um, so we've really been expecting it uh, any day, uh, as the White House has been expecting it uh, any day. Uh, but, the, uh, you know, as far as we've gathered, the White House was tipped off about 30 minutes uh, before uh, the uh, report was handed over to the DOJ. About 4.30 was when uh, White House officials uh, were informed that the Mueller report was finally finally uh, dropping today. But uh, this is something that they knew could have happened any moment uh, for the last few weeks, again, if not a uh, few months. There have been indications in the last uh, few weeks, if not few days, uh, that this report uh, was uh, sort of on the brink of, of finally uh, being made, uh, or I should say being turned over to uh, the Department of Justice. Uh, some signs from the special counsel's office, uh, no more real activity uh, at the courts. Uh, and, and some some uh, some telling signs there, uh, but uh, but the White House appears that they found out around 4:30 uh, this afternoon. Uh, not much before uh, the rest of Washington found out. Nicole, in a statement, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said, "Quote: Attorney General Barr must not give President Trump, his lawyers, or his staff any sneak preview. That's a quote, sneak preview of Special Counsel Mueller's findings or evidence." How well found are these concerns? And you also mentioned to me before that the president's lawyers, uh, specifically Rudy Giuliani, they were all meeting. Have you heard anything more from that as well? Well, we do know that uh, some members of the White House uh, Council are here in Mar-a-Lago with the president, uh, specifically Emmett Flood and Pat uh, Cipollone. Uh, <coughs> 
two uh, White House attorneys who are with the president. Again, uh, we've been trying to get information as to uh, what may be transpiring if they are consulting with the president in any way. Uh, we do know Rudy Giuliani is in uh, Washington, D.C., at least according uh, to an interview that he gave to the Washington Post. But we did get statements from that part of the president's illegal team, both Rudy Giuliani and Jay Sekulow, who also pretty much echoed the same language uh, that we heard from the White House, uh, that they are pleased that the Office of Special Counsel has delivered its report to the attorney general pursuant to the regulations. Attorney General Barr will determine the appropriate next steps. And now there had been some reports out there uh, specifically that Rudy Giuliani wanted a chance to see uh, this report uh, before it comes out. And, you know, he knocked that down uh, to our Major Garrett and again kind of echoed this language that it's up to the Department of Justice and he is confident uh, that this will be handled properly. So, uh, you know, clearly the president's legal team wants to go by the book as far as uh, Things are concerned. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, members from the White House illegal team, uh, what we do know, and uh, kind of to what Mueller was explaining uh, just a short time ago, is that uh, in addition to the White House uh, being informed about this, we do know that the Attorney General's Chief of Staff specifically reached out to a White House uh, lawyer, Emmett Flood, to inform him uh, about uh, this report. And that, again, was just before 5 o'clock. So, again, that is one of the attorneys who is uh, with uh, the president uh, here in Mar-a-Lago. And again, uh, we can only uh, speculate as to what kinds of uh, conversations uh, may be transpiring, if any, uh, between him and the president. Mm -hmm. Mola, Mueller completed his investigation without ever speaking to the president. How significant is that? Well, it may ultimately be uh, very significant. You know, there was uh, uh, much to do about the back and forth uh, between the president's attorneys and the special, uh, special counsel's office uh, in terms of how the special counsel was going to uh, speak to the president or interview the president. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it began as the, uh, as the special counsel wanting a sit-down interview uh, with the president. Uh, and it ultimately turned into, after much negotiating, much back and forth, uh, it evolved or devolved, however you want to look at it from uh, a sit-down interview uh, to uh, written uh, written questions and written answers uh, that the president uh, ultimately uh, gave. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the the fact that uh, that the special counsel's office was never able to sit down with the president um, it may ultimately uh, end up, uh, uh, you know, be be uh, determine uh, something along, you know, with regards to the, to the special counsel's report. Uh, you know, that's something that we'll have to have to wait and see. But, uh, you know, being able to sit down, obviously, with uh, the president, being able to question the president in person, ask him, uh, see his demeanor, uh, read him, uh, body language, all that sort of stuff um, is certainly something that the special counsel would have wanted to do, something that any prosecutor or, or any investigator would want to do, regardless of, uh, you know, the president's uh, involvement or uh, his uh, potential, uh, uh, you know, being held accountable or, uh, you, know, you know, legal jeopardy, any, anything along those lines. They'd certainly uh, want to talk to the president directly, considering, uh, you know, th th this was happening. Uh, the, the, you know, the investigation was really uh, all around the president in terms of his associates uh, and, and beyond. So uh, it'll be uh, ultimately telling um, whether, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, that may play a factor uh, in, uh, in the special counsel's sure. report. And because you're right there, I just want to know the sense of people. I see some people walking behind you. Is anyone there as interested as we are? Do you see that the everyday person is as captivated because we can't stop talking about it and, and trying to read everything that comes out? Mola, what are you seeing there? Well, uh, you know, obviously at the White House, uh, you know, the the, uh, the press area is uh, unusually busy for a Friday night. So, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the media is certainly uh, taking note and, and all over this. Um, in terms of beyond the, the White House uh, gates, Pennsylvania Avenue, um, you know, it, it, it seems to kind of be uh, business as usual, tourists out and about. Uh, we haven't got, had a chance to go out there and talk to anybody or, or get a read on uh, what people are expecting or uh, whether there is a sense of uh, relief or excitement or or, or what uh, you know what what, what have you mm -hmm. uh, among the uh, you know among folks uh, uh, beyond the White House gates, uh, but uh, you know certainly here at the White House there is uh, there is uh, increased activity uh, for a Friday night. Absolutely, Nicole Killian and Mola Lange, thank you both for joining us.
Let's bring in CBSN political contributor Molly Hooper now. Molly, what's the latest reaction you're hearing from lawmakers? Well, they want full access to the report. They want it to be transparent, and they want to see it now. Um, essentially, you're, we're talking about House Democrats. What really has struck out to, stuck out to me was, in the past hour or so, six of the committee chairmen in the House of Representatives, um, the Democrats who are in charge of committees that are, are investigating various portions of the Trump administration, they issued a letter, um, essentially, to Bill Barr, saying that they want any and all information. Um, underlying evidence uncovered related to their investigations to be released to Congress. And, you know, given that the Justice Department has um, essentially a sitting rule, so to speak, that they don't indict a sitting president, um, the concern is that those committees won't get all the information that in, that is related to the findings of the special counsel as related to President Trump's, um, you know, behavior and his conduct um, in regard to, quote, unquote, collusion. And they want to make sure that they have that information. And, you know, we talk a little bit about not indicting a sitting president. What is your take on that? We've heard from other contributors who disagree with that position. Well, um, when it comes to the other branches of government, because I cover Congress, and I, I'll admit I am I am a pro Article One girl. Um, I, I don't. It doesn't. I'm, it's unclear why why the Justice Department takes that tack. But at the, but again, if, when it comes down to it, Congress does have the power to impeach, which is essentially it, it's a political exercise. And again, that's one of the reasons why members of Congress, especially these key committees that are doing investigations into the president, um, who've launched investigations into obstruction of justice, um, public corruption, abuses of power. It's why they want all the information that was uncovered by the special counsel over the past two years in talking to witnesses. You know, one of the, one of the things that happens now that the Mueller report has been issued, it sort of frees up Congress to go, you know, full throttle um, towards their investigations. They can actually talk to the individuals who were, who were previously being, you know, who were under investigation by in a criminal proceeding. Well, that's not happening anymore. So, members of Congress can actually hear from people um, like Ivanka Trump, Donald Trump Jr., individuals who were mentioned by Michael Cohen in that blockbuster testimony he gave before the House Judiciary, I mean, the House Oversight Committee. Mm -hmm. So, so that actually does free them up to, to really get into the nitty gritty. But again, they want the information that was uncovered by Bob Mueller. So let's bring in CBSN legal contributor Keir Dugal. Keir, we were talking earlier, they may want that, but they may not get that. Why is that? Right. So the, the um, special counsel regulations allow uh, the attorney general, Mr. Barr, to consider a public release as long as it's consistent with, with law. So as several other uh, commentators and other folks on the program have said, there are, there are some, some restrictions. There's grand jury secrecy. Um, material potentially that might be in the report that would have to be taken out. There's potentially privacy information. There's potentially uh, executive privilege material. Uh, those are all things that uh, Mr. Barr might have to scrub out of the report. But um, we've also talked about the Justice Department policy that in cases of really high public interest allows the Justice Department to uh, talk about an investigation where nobody is charged. So those are sort of the guardrails on, on either side. You know, what can you and what can't you? And there's a, there's a lot of maneuvering room in the middle there. Mr. Barr will, will be the one to make the decisions in the first instance. But I want to go back to his, uh, his testimony uh, before um, the, the hearing where he was a nominee for the, for the mm -hmm. AG department. He said specifically and repeatedly that his effort would be to make uh, as much transparency, uh, to make the report as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to, for the moment, while we're all sort of trying to figure out what's going to happen next, take him at his, take him at his word. Um, I, I, I think um, he certainly has the discretion to release the, the, the key and core parts of, the, of the, whatever's in that report. And just to echo what you said, in the letter that was released, Barr did say, I remain committed to as much transparency as possible, and I will keep you informed as to the status of my review. So now what will be his timeline? What's the next step? Well, in the letter, um, he himself sort of set expectations for all of us and mentioning maybe over the weekend. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we're on a, uh, on a very relatively short time frame. 
um, you know, days, hours. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't expect to see something from tonight. He's going to have to digest it. But uh, certainly by uh, Monday, um, I would think we might start to see uh, information coming from him. And Molly, we've heard some lawmakers suggest that they might call Barr or Mueller to testify before Congress. What's the latest you're hearing about that development? Well I, well, I think that this all depends on how much is released and how much um, is available to the public. But it sounds like Intelligence Committee Chairman um, Adam Schiff is, is particularly keen on on a point that Kier brought up earlier um, in the last hour related to, of course, the counterintelligence portion of this investigation that the special counsel has been been looking into. And, and I, I anticipate uh, Mueller go, coming before the Intelligence Committee, at least the House Intelligence Committee, likely the Senate Intelligence Committee, too, to answer questions that perhaps will be scrubbed, as, as Keir said, um, from the public, whatever is released publicly, um, you know, and, and, and quite possibly that, that could happen behind closed doors with the House, with members of the House Judiciary Committee as well. Again, it just, it just, it just depends on what is made available to Congress, and, and that's something that the key Judiciary Committee, the four key committee Judiciary Committee leaders here from Bill Barr himself, and that would be Lindsey Graham, the Judiciary Committee chairman, Dianne Feinstein, ranking member over in the Senate, Jerry Nadler, House chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and Doug Collins, the ranking Republican. What they hear from Bill Barr, they can kind of go from there. Okay. Here, a senior Department of Justice official says that the special counsel's office is not recommending any more indictments. So what does that tell you? So um, it— it tells us that um, he's concluded the core part of his investigation, but what we what we have to remember is there are potential um, uh, prosecutions by other components of the Justice Department, U.S. attorneys, and by state officials. We have to remember that Mr. Mueller was really limited in his mandate. He had one job, and it was to look at potential interference with the 2016 election by Russians and charge crimes directly related to that. So um, it sounds like he has charged all of the key players um, in that part as of the investigation. As it pertains to Russia. As it pertains to Russia. Mm -hmm. But this is the big, gigantic question mark that we don't have the answer to yet. Because the department has this policy of not uh, indicting a sitting president, it's still a possibility that that Mr. Mueller discovered facts that would otherwise have led to an indictment of Mr. Trump, because but he didn't indict any didn't indict the president because of that Justice Department policy. It may it may be that that uh, Mr. Mueller did not find any facts that would support an indictment of the president. That's also entirely possible. Mm -hmm. We just don't know, and we won't know until we hear more about what's in this report. Let's say that they did find something to charge the president with, not saying that they did. We have no indication that that is the case. Correct. Would they ever uh, forego that policy and potentially charge the president so, while in office as he is now? So that's a that's a great, a very interesting question. Um, and and part of it, it depends on a couple of factors. Right. So um, there's a statute of limitations that's running and the and the president, if you if you follow that policy that the president can't be charged, the statute is ticking, and it, it's possible the typical statute is five years. So if Mr. Trump were to be reelected um, in 2020 and sit for eight years, he could run out the clock on um, criminal charges, and that, uh, that that's a that's a strategy that uh, that he could potentially employ, um, particularly where Congress. The pres because the president's being treated specially under the Justice Department guidelines, there's a good argument to be made that he should be treated specially for statute of limitations purposes as well. That would require an act of Congress. It would require the president to sign off on it, which this particular president might be un unwilling to do if he thought that he had criminal exposure. But if you're not going to indict the president while he's sitting in office, there's probably a good argument that the statute of limitations ought to be told or extended or shouldn't run. So that Concurrent the, with. Right, with sitting in the office mm -hmm. so the president can't literally use the office of the presidency to hide behind To shield him, him or herself from criminal charges. So, um, so those, are, those, are, those are some of the execution under this policy.
convoluted question, but you answered it very well. <laughs> that, that was easy to understand. So thank you. Molly Hooper and, of course, Keir Dougal here both. Thank you so much for your insight. Let's go ahead and bring in. We have Joel Payne and Michael Graham here as well. Joel, Democratic strategist for former Hillary for America senior aide and a vice president at MWWPR. Michael is a CBSM political contributor and conservative columnist for the Boston Herald, also the politics editor for NHJournal.com. Guys, a number of Democratic presidential hopefuls have already called for the release of the report. Joel, do you see this becoming a larger issue for the 2020 campaign? I really don't. Um, I think the issue that it is going to become is the issue that it already is. It's a part of a larger narrative that Democrats are going to craft, uh, craft and create about President Trump being reckless in his decision making, being reckless with the people who he surrounds himself with, and ultimately um, not having good judgment about the people that he surrounds himself with. I think that's already an argument that Democrats have already been making, not just in the few months that the 2020 cycle has been started, but going back to the 2018 midterm. So I don't think anything changes there. It's essentially status quo. Okay, so Michael, what are the Republicans watching for and hoping to see come out of this report? Key words, things that would stand out for them moving forward? Uh, I think absence of collusion is everything that they need. And I think I think Joel is right about his analysis of Democrats. But President Trump, if it is the case that there's no collusion alleged at all, he is absolutely going to use it. And I think he's going to use it in an interesting way to make the case that he's the outsider. This is a year of outsiders. We've seen people come out of nowhere, whether it's Beto O'Rourke or uh, Pete Buttigieg or a AOC. And normally when you're the incumbent, your disadvantage is you're playing defense, you're trying to defend your accomplishments, your record. And when people are in the mood for change, how do you say I'm the change when you're the guy? Well, when you're the guy that the entire Washington establishment is trying to destroy and, uh, and uh, the, the, your supporters and the people who kind of backed you in 2016 to shake things up can see and say, look, they, he's right, they were coming to get him. This isn't about collusion. This is about getting a guy from the outside. I think you're going to hear President Trump and his team play that up constantly between now and 2020. So, Joel, what about impeachment? I know you said that there aren't major talks amongst the party about this, but we keep hearing the word uh, being brought up in conversations. Do you think that that would actually backfire against any of the presidential hopefuls if they push for this with the president? I think what backfires is if voters feel like you are abusing the constitutional checks that are in place. Right. Impeachment has become a political test. It's become something that, frankly, I think, and Michael, I think you agree, people throw around a little bit too casually. That's a, that is a check in place um, when all other systems fail. That's not something you do when you don't like the president or when you don't like the president's policies or you want to send a message. It's not, you know, it's not recalling someone in, in, in the governor's office like Scott Walker. Impeachment is there for the very rare occasion when you need to overturn um, a presidential election and, and obviously judges as well. I, I, honest to goodness, don't think Democrats are focused on it. I think there's a narrative out there that Democrats are focused on it. There are some who've talked about it. I know Maxine Waters has. I know uh, some of the newer members have. But by and large, Democrats want to beat Donald Trump at the ballot box. They don't want to beat him in an impeachment hearing room. Michael, after all this talk from the president of Witch Hunt, uh, Witch Hunt and Russia hoax, right. does it seem like Americans will feel confident in Mueller's findings? No, I think that uh, people who want to believe he was guilty are going to believe it no matter what. And it was interesting listening to the conversation just had with the legal expert about, well, you know, because he's president, maybe they didn't bother to put in all the things that they could indict him with. You're going to, every conspiracy you can hear is going to be out there, just like on the other side. It's going to be, the, you know, the dossier was invented by, you know, Clinton and never should have been used, which, by the way, that is an interesting story. And, and I hope that some people who are smarter than me will look into how we ended up with this investigation with if it is the case that there was nothing to investigate in the first place. But that's going to go on. I think uh, the best news for President Trump and the Republicans who've decided to back him is that if he walks out of this, he looks stronger. He looks like he took on the establishment and won. And then it maybe, maybe he will stop tweeting about it and stop tweeting about John McCain, whose staffer shopped around the dossier, and start talking about the fact that the economy is red hot. We have 7 million jobs we can't even fill. We've had 3% growth in the last year, and on and on and on. 
You talk about the president tweeting. I've been watching every couple minutes I've been checking. Right. Last tweet, four hours ago. Pretty Amazing. lengthy time, right? So we're going well, on four that hours. Is, that's a sign that President Trump is tied up somewhere in a closet. And then outside, the chief of staff is holding it. Don't let him out. Don't let him near the phone. Because he knows that if this collapses on itself, that's the best thing. And I want to get back to Joe, but just very quickly, think of how much stronger position Trump would be in if he had been quiet about this. If he just let the process go on. And then when it was all over, he could say, see, we cooperated. We did everything. There was no there there. I told you so. But now the muddy, the, uh, the, the mud's been thrown. It's all it's going to be a mess. Both sides are going to claim victory and we'll move on from there. And just to defend the president, I think he is at an event. So we had Nicole Killian <laughs> down there just to be very clear. I think okay, he is I'm tied sorry. up. He is in My an event. My sources could neither confirm nor deny. Joel, did really you want to did you want to touch on any of that? Really, really, really quickly. You know, I think and, and, and I generally agree with Michael here. And I think most people who are viewing this see this report as I don't know if we call it full vindication for the president, but it certainly looks like his legal exposure is limited here. OK, but that does not mean there was not wrongdoing or bad behavior or poor choices or poor judgment that was ex that, that was exhibited. I worked for Hillary Clinton. OK, um, we all remember that infamous press conference with Jim Comey, where he said no laws were broken, but some poor judgment was exhibited by Ms. Clinton and by the people around her. I think you could very easily uh, put that same type of rap right. on this situation, that no laws might have been broken by the president, but the president exhibited poor judgment. I'm a student of history. Warren G. Harding, go look it up. It wasn't him. It was the people around him. So I think that is as much of a measure of a president as much as their individual actions themselves. And I think we're going to hear people say, because that precedent was set, with uh, Hillary Clinton that they want want to see the same thing applied here as well. So it's going to be interesting to see how it all unfolds. Joel Payne and Michael Graham, thank you both. We're going to be taking a quick break right now. But we come back, we are going to have much more on the Mueller report, including what led up to the nearly two-year investigation. Stay with us. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. The entire thing has been a witch hunt, and uh, there is no collusion between certainly myself and my campaign but I can always speak for myself and the Russians, zero. It was no collusion. I didn't need Russians to help me win Iowa. I didn't need Russians to help me win the great state of Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. No president should ever have to go through what we've gone through in the first two years. It's a hoax, it's a disgrace, and it should never be allowed to happen again. There was no collusion. There was no obstruction, there was no anything. So that's the nice part. There was no phone calls, no nothing. We have a, uh, I won a race. You know why I won the race? Because I was a better candidate than she was.
Special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation is now over. It lasted nearly two years and resulted in dozens of indictments for federal crimes reaching members of President's inner circle, his campaign, and Russian citizens as well. For a look at how we got here, here's CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. In May of 2017, the FBI was investigating contacts between Trump associates and Russia during the 2016 presidential campaign when President Trump abruptly fired director James Comey. The president initially cited Comey's handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation as the reason for his dismissal. But two days later, he pointed to the Russia probe, calling it a, quote, made-up story. Over the next six days, there were more revelations the president had privately asked Comey for his loyalty and to drop part of the investigation. That led Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein to appoint Mueller on May 17th to examine Russian interference in the 2016 election. That investigation grew to include whether the president had obstructed justice. Since then, Mueller charged six Trump associates for crimes ranging from lying to the FBI to tax evasion. They included former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, former campaign chairman Paul Manafort, the president's former personal attorney Michael Cohen, and longtime confidant Roger Stone. All but Stone pleaded guilty and cooperated with the investigation. 25 Russian nationals have been indicted on charges related to hacking or the dissemination of false information. Party. During the campaign, Trump said this amid the controversy surrounding Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. According to Mueller's court filings, that same day, Russian hackers went after the emails of Hillary Clinton staffers, emails that would eventually be leaked. The president's family did not escape scrutiny. Of particular interest, a meeting at Trump Tower in June of 2016, where a Russian lawyer with ties to Putin met with Manafort, the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., and Mr. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. All the while, President Trump denied any collusion with Russia. And I didn't need Russians to help me win Iowa. He also consistently attacked the special counsel and the Justice Department. No collusion, no nothing. All the phony witch hunt. Earlier, I spoke with Major Garrett, Ed O'Keefe, Jeff Begays, and Paula Reed about all of this and what Democrats want to see from the attorney general. Take a listen. Ed, let's start with you. What are you hearing from lawmakers there? Uh, re repeating what they've been saying now for several weeks, but that, and that is that they expect, they want to see the entire report as conducted by Mueller. But as Major and Paula uh, have outlined, you know, Justice Department guidelines, legal guidelines are such that that may not be possible. I think uh, what's encouraging is that the Attorney General may be working to get something to lawmakers by the time they get back here on Monday morning, if not sooner. Uh, but we've heard uh, what I thought was most striking this afternoon, a joint statement from the Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying essentially that they don't want to learn later that the Attorney General gave a sneak preview, their words, to the White House of what they were going to be eventually telling Congress. And it's telling that we're at a point that they would even have to say such a thing and believe that it is potentially possible. As Major just said, Rudy Giuliani, the president's lead uh, spokesperson or attorney, uh, now says that no, that they don't expect that, they don't want that. But just the, the fact that they'd have to say it at all is a signal that there's a real lack of trust here about how the next 24, 48, 72 hours may go until Attorney General Barr starts to tell lawmakers up here what they want. And remember, there's pressure from both parties, Democrats and Republicans, members of the House and the Senate, to release the findings in full. And there was a vote in the House just before the recess that they took this week, a unanimous vote that Mueller's investigation should be released in full to the American public. So that will be one piece of this. The other, of course, will be what exactly does this say? Where did Mueller go? Where perhaps didn't he go? And that will very quickly outline for House committees led by Democrats where exactly they may want to follow up or where they, want to, where they may want to launch new lines of investigation that perhaps, in their view, weren't properly covered by Mueller and company. And Major, I want to ask you here, you were with me as we were listening to Chuck Schumer give a, a press conference here mm. in New York City saying that there is going to be tremendous pressure from the people to release this report right. in full. Sure. And that he would be willing and the rest of Congress or, you know, his counterparts would be willing to take legal action to see more of that 
come to fruition. Right. Is that something he could do? It's possible. And certainly the House Democratic majority is in a position to issue subpoenas to the special counsel, have him testify, see what questions he's willing to answer publicly. There are ways that this could play itself out. There are political and legal dimensions to this. I would say that in general, the Democrats will be on firm political ground saying, look, this is a taxpayer funded document. Even it's within, the, within the executive branch, there's tremendous public curiosity. There might even be allies of the president who sensing this puts him in the clear would say, hey, let's all see it. Just because the president's in the clear, that's great. That's good for him, good for us. We've been defending him. And then you have these institutional pressures to say, wait a minute, just because it's advantageous politically, should we ignore Justice Department guidelines and what we've always done on things like this? Not charged, you're not smeared in public or relieved in public, you're just not talked about. These things are all going to be playing out. And because this is a moment of worth taking stock of all those things, it will be interesting to see how much the political players actually, not just for this time, but for all time, weigh these institutional dimensions, prerogatives, and precedents, or are we just going to get all dirty, all political, all the time? All right. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. Ed, I know that you wanted to chime in on this. If you wanted to touch on what Major just said, go right ahead. Exactly. There, there are allies of the president calling for the full public release of this report. None other than Doug Collins, the congressman from Georgia, the lead Republican on the House Judiciary Committee, who would be the lead Republican in the event there are more, invest, more hearings, more investigations, potential impeachment. He said in a statement this afternoon, I fully expect the Justice Department to release the special counsel's report to this committee and to the public without delay and to the maximum extent permitted by law. None other than Corey Lewandowski, the president's former campaign manager, also said on Twitter this afternoon, millions of taxpayer dollars spent, the American public deserve to see it all. But Gaze, I want to bring you in here. What is the process for what the Justice Department will choose to release? How are they going to decide what the public and even Congress will see? Well, keep in mind, this is a national security investigation, so there is classified information potentially in this report also, uh, and I'm sure Major has talked about this. There are these questions about whether the president, the White House, can exert executive privilege over some of the information in there, so there, there are several different factors that they have to weigh. But, and if Major is still standing by, there is something about this that I've noticed over the last several hours, in fact, or a couple of hours, really, uh, since we learned that this report had been delivered to the Department of Justice. The White House has really showed restraint. I mean, if you look at the headlines coming out of this, these developments today, you have the the, the report going to the, the Department of Justice, and then the subheadline, if you will, is that there will be no more indictments coming from the special counsel's office. Theoretically, the White House should be celebrating that. Uh, maybe they are uh, privately, but publicly they aren't. And that tells you a lot, in my view, about what may be in this report. Or it tells you that they just don't know what's coming next. Uh, and they don't know what these conclusions are going to be. And that is perhaps why they are showing this restraint. I don't think we've seen any any tweets from the president uh, reiterating what he's been saying all week, that there is no evidence of collusion, this is a witch hunt, things like that. We have not heard that. Uh, and that's why so much is writing, not only for uh, the White House, but also for the Democrats, as far as 2020 is concerned, and Republicans in the House and Senate. So much is writing on what happens over the next 24 to 48 hours with this report uh, as it's delivered to Congress from the attorney general. And that's why we are just waiting to see, even though we know that the Russia investigation uh, by the special counsel is now concluded, we still don't have those very important answers uh, that this nearly two-year investigation has looked into. Again, looking into whether there was any type of coordination uh, between Russian operatives and the Trump campaign. And the, the missing piece of this really is the president's role in all this. We've already, we've already seen that the president's uh, former campaign chairman, 
Paul Manafort, indicted, guilty pleas. Uh, Michael Flynn, former National Security Advisor, uh, guilty plea. Michael Cohen, the president's former personal attorney. So, so much has happened over the last 22, 24 months. Uh, but the missing piece there is what type of role, according to investigators, did the president play? All right, Jeff, let's go ahead and move right now to Paula Reed at the White House. And, and actually, just to uh, follow up with you, know the president has not tweeted. His last tweet was at 420 this afternoon. And of course, all of this breaking at around 5 o'clock. Uh, but Paula, we've seen a number of 2020 Democratic presidential candidates, many of whom are lawmakers weighing in. I, I mean, I have a full list here from Kirsten Gillibrand to Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. We have exactly. others like uh, Beto O'Rourke. So all this pressure on Barr to make this report as public as possible, do you think he will succumb to that pressure? I do not. I absolutely do not. I think he is going to follow the Department of Justice regulation to the letter. He is going to follow the Justice Department precedent of not releasing details about those who are investigated and not charged. He was pretty clear about this in his confirmation hearing. He vowed to be transparent, but only as transparent as the law allows. So as he goes through this, he's going to be working with the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein. He's the one who appointed the special counsel. He's overseen this investigation since the beginning, and he's actually been the one who's been liaising with the special counsel's office over the past several weeks as Barr has gotten settled inside the Justice Department. The two of them, very similar outlook on this issue. I think they're going to be very conservative in terms of how much information they release, but the special counsel may have made that easy for them by not actually giving them that much information. Uh, he only had to explain why he chose to prosecute some people and not prosecute others. So there may not be too much that they have to go through. On this short timeline, the fact that he may be able to brief Congress as, as soon as this weekend, that suggests there's probably not going to be a lot of classified information or too much information in there that is privileged. And we know that the White House lawyers are now with the president in Mar-a-Lago. Do we know the latest from what we're hearing from the White House? So far, they've been deferring to the Justice Department. This has been a recent change of tune over the past several weeks uh, as the president has been asked, hey, what should happen to the Mueller report? He has been pretty consistent in saying what happens to the Mueller report is up to my attorney general. He then endorses his attorney general as a man who is respected and a man of character. But in the same breath, he will, of course, trash the entire investigation as a witch hunt. But in terms of this decision that needs to be made over the coming days, he has consistently been deferring to his attorney general, William Barr. It seems the president has considerable confidence uh, that the attorney general will be judicious in terms of what he releases. We also know that William Barr has a pretty narrow definition of, of what obstruction of justice looks like from a president. So I think that also gives uh, the president reason to be confident that he has little to fear with his current attorney general. All right, Ed, I wanted to bring you in here, too. Um, what do you think here is the next step? Are we just now waiting uh, indefinitely? <laughs> or we wait until we find out what this full report will be? I mean, will the Amer American public ever really see this? Well, we'll see something. What, what we see and whether that's enough for people remains to be seen. But at this point, based on the guidance we got from the Justice Department this afternoon, we will await word from the Justice Department tomorrow as to whether or not Barr was being serious that something will come this weekend or whether we can pack up, go home, and wait until Monday or Tuesday or some point next week. Uh, in a sign that perhaps this isn't being taken as urgently as some might think, we know that Speaker Pelosi, for example, is still home in San Francisco and doesn't plan to return to Washington until Monday. So there's no real impetus to get here faster, at least in the views of senior leaders like her. No matter what is released, no matter what happens next legally, there will be ongoing investigations up here on Capitol Hill. The House Judiciary Committee uh, has already launched conversations with Michael Cohen. Uh, there are other uh, hearings set to be held in the coming week. Uh, the House Financial Services Committee, Ways and Means Committee, uh, Intelligence Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee are all looking into aspects of the Trump administration in this regard, regarding the election, regarding Russia, but also, of course, other aspects of the administration. Is the president violating the emoluments clause by continuing to collect money from the Trump Hotel that's run by his family? Uh, what about the communications of Justice or of uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump with foreign leaders and with other government officials? What about everybody's security clearances? Run the gamut. Think of everything that's come up over the last two years, and Democrats are still sorting out what exactly they might do about it. 
Much of that depends on what's in this report. One other thing I suspect now will become uh, a line of inquiry if things go sideways this weekend is what exactly happened starting at 4.30 this afternoon when the Justice Department and the White House were informed that the report was complete until Congress is told whenever that is. Who was with the Attorney General? Who did he talk to about this? Who got to see it? What did they decide to put in their summary to Congress? What was that debate about? What did those deliberations look like? All of that now in the coming days and coming months, maybe years, going to be subject of potential legal action by Democrats if they don't like how things go here, and congressional hearings if, again, Democrats don't like how things go here. Let me bring in Jeff. Jeff, what is your response to that? Do you think it will continue to take legal action? Do you think it will get to that? Well, yeah, I think this is one of those moments where you will see a, a, a litigated process, so no doubt about that. But I wanted to mention, Alex, that you know, I've been texting with some of the prime figures, if you will, people who've been involved in this investigation, questioned by the special counsel's office. For example, Jerome Corsi, who was interviewed by the special counsel's office. There was a, a plea deal being floated that he denied or turned down. Uh, he texted me and he says that he is feeling vindicated. Also heard from Michael Caputo, who was also questioned uh, by the special counsel's office. He worked uh, on the Trump campaign. Uh, as I said, questioned by the special counsel's office. He sent me a text uh, essentially saying the same thing that J Jerome Corsi said, which was uh, marked safe. Uh, from Robert Mueller today. So there are people who are feeling vindicated now that this investigation is over as far as it relates to the special counsel's office. Uh, and that's why in, in many ways it is notable that the White House has shown uh, a great deal of restraint to this point. We'll see what, what happens on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, but right now, it is notable that uh, there are people who have been wrapped up in this investigation who are breathing a sigh of relief right now while the White House is more restrained, uh, perhaps looking forward to, or ahead to what might be coming in the next couple of days. I guess it decides. Joining me now, CBSN political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns, and we have Keir Dougal as well. He's a CBSN legal contributor and former assistant U.S. attorney in the New York Eastern District. Thank you both for being here. We've been mulling this over, no pun intended, for the last couple of <laughs> hours now. And I keep going back to the same thing. You know, what are we going to hear from all of this? Will we ever really know where it all came from? So, um, Keir, I don't know. What do you think? I think we're going to get a, a, a significant bit of information. I, I, I really honestly do. I think, uh, as we talked earlier, the sort of the, the guide the, the guide rails are um, Mr. Barr is going to have to scrub out the information that the law requires him to scrub out. Um, but on the other hand, both the special counsel regulations anticipate public statements if they're in the if they're in the public interest, and the Justice Department regulations have an exception for the ordinary uh, rule that you don't say anything where nobody's indicted, um, where you have an intense public interest in a matter, which we certainly have here. So I, I think what, you're, I, what, I, what I hope we're going to see, because tr I think transparency really is important, um, the Attorney General in his Senate hearings said exactly that, that transparency was really critically important here. I believe, and I hope, that what we're going to see is some substantive, significant information about what Mr. Mueller concluded. Do you find it interesting that Mueller did not actually speak with the president during this investigation? So, I mean, as a former prosecutor, mm -hmm. um, you all, I can, when you're doing an investigation, you always want to talk to the subject of the investigation if they're willing to talk to you. Um, uh, m you know, I am going to rely on the fact that Mr. Mueller was satisfied with uh, the answers to written questions. I um, mean, uh, his staff is extraordinarily good. I'm sure they thought that issue through very carefully. And if they were satisfied with that answer and chose for reasons of the investigation to not insist and then litigate a, a subpoena that would have gone up to the Supreme Court and taken months and months and months probably to resolve, if they made the decision to rely on written answers um, as for the time being, I will accept that, that they believe that that was enough. Caitlin, we've seen both Republicans and Democrats speak out saying that they want to see this report in full. 
And we already know that Barr mm -hmm. said he will be as transparent as possible, but he will not be releasing all of the details. Uh, what mm -hmm. is your take on that? And how much do you think will be released and what kind of pressure is he facing? Well, he's facing a lot of public pressure, of course, and lawmakers have been trying to build that up over the course of this investigation, uh, trying to um, uh, get him to agree uh, through either pushing for legislation or other ways to uh, commit to have this put forward uh, in, in the public realm. But he doesn't have to do that. And there are, of course, legal considerations um, that go with that. What's going to be interesting to see, though, is how how these sides react. Um, this is a, a critical moment, but it's also a political one. And it has been political because of the way the president has been talking about it. Um, and it has been political because it has just been, you know, captured uh, the, com the nature of the conversation. So um, I would expect that Democrats on the Hill will try to find ways to expand this investigation and see where else they can take it. Uh, they're also going to be concerned about overreach. And Republicans are hoping that there's nothing in there that uh, incriminates the president in any way. Well, we want to thank you both for joining us, and we're going to continue to check in with you as we uh, go over all of the details in this you know, continues to unfold for really the next couple days and weeks to come as well. Caitlin Huey Burns and Keir Dougal, thank you both for being here. We're taking a quick break, but when we come back out of the break, we are going to have much more on the Mueller report, including what led up to the nearly two year long investigation. Stay with us. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. This is America's latest superhero. Don't forget to show love. This is his kindergarten class. This one-time school administrator is now architect. This is just some of her army. I want other people to know what they can do to their neighborhoods. This is doable. This history is still living. This is a miracle! So this is working. Oh, it's working. CBS News has just learned 
That special counsel Robert Mueller has submitted his long-awaited report to Attorney General William Barr. No matter what this report says, Congress is pushing to see as much of it as possible. Now, legally, Barr only has an obligation to brief Congress. He has no obligation to release anything to the public. Well, the White House says ISIS has been defeated in Syria. So there's ISIS, and that's what we have right now, as of last night. That's what we have right now. You guys can have the map. Congratulations. Is it really over yet? And that is, uh, is strictly a judgment call. A lot of kids go to the park to see ducks, but eight-year-old Kylie Brown of Freeport, Maine, takes her duck to see the park. CBSN starts now. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Dennis. Thank you for joining us. Well, the so-called witch hunt is now over. After 22 months, special counsel Robert Mueller has finished his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. The probe has resulted in dozens of indictments for federal crimes, reaching members of the president's inner circle, his campaign, and Russian citizens as well. The findings are now in the hands of Attorney General William Barr. During his confirmation in January, Barr said that he would try to be as transparent as possible about the report, but stopped short of promising to release it. The Justice Department says Congress could see the principal conclusions of the report as soon as this weekend. A senior Justice Department official has told CBS News that Mueller is not recommending any further indictments. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer called for the report to be made public. Now that Special Counsel Mueller has submitted his report to the Attorney General, it's imperative for Mr. Barr to make the full report public and provide its underlying documentation and findings to Congress. Attorney General Barr must not give President Trump, his lawyers, or his staff any sneak preview of Special Counsel Mueller's findings or evidence. And the White House must not be allowed to interfere in decisions about what parts of those findings or evidence should be made public. CBS News Washington correspondent Paula Reed reports with more from the White House. The report was delivered by a security officer to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein this afternoon. He passed it to Attorney General William Barr within minutes. The White House and the president's lawyers were notified beginning at 4.30. And at 5 p.m., this letter was delivered to the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. In it, Barr wrote, the special counsel has submitted to me today a confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions he has reached. Barr added, he may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. The report is described as comprehensive and very few people have seen it. The Justice Department would not comment on its length. Washington has been anticipating the report for weeks, with camera crews watching every movement outside special counsel Robert Mueller's offices in a nondescript building in downtown Washington. Even the president didn't know when it was coming. He spoke to reporters on his way to Mar-a-Lago this morning. I have no idea about the Mueller report. I'm going to Florida. But that didn't stop him from criticizing the probe. Uh, there was no collusion. There was no obstruction. Everybody knows it. It's all a big hoax. It's, I call it the witch hunt. In a statement, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said the White House has not received or been briefed on the report. The president's attorney said they were pleased Mueller had delivered his report and said Attorney General Barr will determine appropriate next steps. According to the law, it's up to Barr to decide how much of the report to make public. Earlier this week, the president said he should release the whole thing. Let it come out. Let people see it. But before Congress, Barr has only promised to follow the law. My goal will be to provide as much transparency as I can consistent with the law. Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, it is imperative for Mr. Barr to make a full report public and the White House must not be allowed to interfere. And 2020 presidential candidates took to Twitter to demand the report be released now. So let's talk about all of this in a little bit more detail. CBS Washington correspondent Paula Reed there you can see at the White House. And we have CBS News Chief Washington correspondent Major Garrett here on set with me. Thank you both for being here. Let's first talk about the unprecedented uh, report that is now 
been passed along, right. Major. Let's let's talk about this. This is a moment in history that we need to pause and right. just take in. It's a legal moment, and it's a moment where our institutions are under intense scrutiny, not just the presidency, the Justice Department, the special counsel. And should the rules that we've always followed in this country apply, even in the case of President Donald Trump? Well, we're going to test that proposition. What do I mean by the rules? Paula Reed, my colleague, just perfectly elucidated what the rules are. If you're not charged in a special counsel investigation, you have the right for the public not to know that. Why? Because you shouldn't be smeared as any American citizen with the taint of an investigation that didn't lead to an indictable charge. And even if you are indicted under our system, as we all know, that's just an allegation. You have a chance to have your day in court. So if you're not charged, you deserve privacy and the institutional protections that every American citizen is entitled to. We're going to test that proposition right now because you already heard. Democrats say every piece of evidence, underlying material, the whole thing should be presented to public. That's a standard that we don't apply to anyone else. And I guarantee you, in this legal moment, when our institutions are being scrutinized, the president's political allies will say, wait a minute, rule of law applies to everyone in this country, but not Donald Trump? They will come back with that not only political, but institutional pushback on this idea that everything that Mueller ever touched is now fair game. Under our system of law, actually it isn't. And those institutions are going to be tested in a legal context, but also in a political context. And that, for the moment, it just seems like we should pause and say institutions matter. President Trump's presidency itself has called our institutions and their strength into question. Well, they're going to be tested right now. And I have a follow-up question sure. to that. But firstly, Paula, I wanted to ask you this. We assume that things will be heavily redacted. Do you think that the Congress will even be able to see some of the people that were involved in this that will not be indicted? Will they be privy to that information? And if so, does that open us up for possibly leaks for the American public to then have that information? Well, many Democratic investigators have already said that if the full report is not released, they will start issuing subpoenas for that report or for special counsel Robert Mueller. But the law, the law here, it errs on the side of protecting the identities of people who are investigated and not charged. Under the law, the special counsel is only required to deliver a report to the attorney general, who is then required to brief, a limited briefing, uh, to Congress. But ultimately, there is absolutely no requirement for anything to be made public and certainly not the full report. So I do think you're going to see this as sort of a proxy partisan battle in Congress to get the full report released. But even if that goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, there is no actual precedent on this. But I do think that the justices will look at the special counsel regulation and they will say, you know what, ultimately, this was not designed to be a public document. Uh, this was not designed for congressional lawmakers to get their hands on the names of people who are investigated and not charged. So even if congressional lawmakers want to try, I do not think they will ultimately be successful. Now, in terms of leaks, I got to tell you, I've covered this investigation for almost two years. There are no leaks out of the special counsel's office. I've talked to folks inside the Justice Department. Only a limited number of people will see this full report. They are not leakers. Trust me, I have tried to get them to give me information. And it is highly unlikely uh, that this would leak the full report that's only in the possession of the Justice Department, that that would leak. Anything provided to Congress, as we understand it, will also be made public, though. And a couple things on this. Mm -hmm. William Barr, former attorney general, he served for George Herbert Walker Bush as attorney general. He's a down-the-line proceduralist institutionalist. So is Robert Mueller, the special counsel. One of the reasons that the president's lawyers cooperated so consistently with Robert Mueller, whatever President Trump was saying about it on Twitter, the White House lawyers provided interviews, mm -hmm. more than 20,000 documents. In many respects, those documents were discussed with the special counsel's office collaboratively so they could be most responsive. So the White House wouldn't just do this blind document dump and say, you swim through a million documents that we've handed you. That's cooperation and respect for institutional prerogatives on both sides of this legal question. One other thing our audience might be asking themselves, wait a minute, Ken Starr delivered a whole book. It was a bestseller mm -hmm. on Bill Clinton. Why? Ken Starr was an independent counsel created by a statute passed by Congress and signed by a sitting president. It had congressional statutory authority. The special counsel is not created by law. It's not like the independent counsel. It's answerable to the Justice Department and the executive branch and those rules. That's why Ken Starr's Star Report, bestseller, available on every bookstore in America for a period of time, is different than this report.
I also want to ask you both your thoughts about this. We've got uh, a full list here in my hand. Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, Elizabeth Warren. So all of these Democratic uh, you know, candidates, are they going to be using this as um, a political strategy for them? Will it come up that things have were leaked about uh, Hillary Clinton using her private email server, are they going to say, well, that was a precedent that was set by Comey, and hey, listen, we want to see it all. They might say that. They might say, look, James Comey had a whole press conference without precedent in Justice Department protocol and was later subsequently faulted for that in public, saying, you know what, I've got a public responsibility to tell you I'm not indicting her, but there were things here that were not proper and should not have been done, and there were e e episodes which, in which classified information was transmitted improperly explaining a lot more than had ever been explained before in a kind of investigation mm -hmm. like this. They might say, well, Comey was actually not breaking protocol, or if he was, he was erring on the side of public awareness and transparency, and we ought to use that standard now. We'll see. We'll see. They can make that <laughs> argument, but it's in the hands, as Paula just explained, of the attorney general, the deputy attorney general, and the guidelines. Paula, I want to talk to you, too. Uh, we have the attorney general saying that possibly even this weekend there can be more of a discussion on this. What are you hearing there? And if, in fact, it happens this weekend, how much will be delivered at that time? I was quite surprised to see in his letter that he said he may be able to brief Congress as soon as this weekend, because we had some expectation that he would give himself a, a self-imposed deadline, if you will, to brief Congress, basically saying, look, I got the report, leave me alone for X number of days while I go over it. So the fact that he may be able to get through this in 24, 48 hours, that suggests to me that this is not a voluminous report. While he describes it as, as comprehensive, I think some people, again, they think of the Star Report, uh, you know, hundreds of pages, perhaps thousands of pages. Ages. But it doesn't appear that that is what he's received. They have not been able to confirm to us uh, the exact length of this report. But just the fact that he may be willing to brief Congress uh, this weekend suggests to me that it's probably closer to around 100 pages or a few hundred pages. He'll go through that and he will make decisions. His only vow has been to be as transparent as possible within the law. And again, the law makes no requirement of him to make anything public. So I think he's going to be very conservative, especially about releasing any information related to people who are not charged. Now, the one thing he is obligated to disclose to Congress is if at any time the special counsel had a disagreement with his supervisor, who would have been either Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker, or William Barr. If at any time they disagreed about a decision, he must disclose that to Congress. So, for example, hypothetically, if Rod, if Rod Rosenstein said, look, you, you can't try to subpoena the president, they would have to disclose this. Now, at one point, there was a disagreement between the special counsel and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein about whether or not you could indict a sitting president whether or not you could subpoena a sitting president. These were issues that they had to work out, whether or not they wanted to adhere uh, to the standing precedent and the standing DOJ guide guidelines. Ultimately, Rod Rosenstein won out on this. So it will be very interesting to see if there have been any documented disagreements between the special counsel and the Justice Department. And one thing I can tell you, based on my conversations this afternoon with the president's lawyers, they expect a couple of things from this report. Not a lot of requirement for the attorney general to redact things, meaning no national security secrets that are in there that have to be redacted and gone through a whole elaborate national security process of vetting, which would take a lot of time. They also don't expect that there to be any executive privilege hassles in this report, things that the attorney general looks at and says, wait a minute, that, that might tr transgress or trespass on executive privilege things. I better check with the White House counsel's office. They don't expect those kinds of difficulties. So whatever the length of the report, they believe it's something that the attorney general will be able to look at, evaluate, and summarize without these big hassles, national security redactions, executive privilege, and the like. That's their expectation. They haven't been briefed on it. They haven't seen it. And there was, for a fleeting a couple of moments this afternoon, a sense that Rudy Giuliani, one of the president's attorneys, wanted to see it. 
That's been corrected. They don't want to see it, have no expectation of seeing it. This is in the attorney general's hands, and the attorney general will decide how much to give to Congress. So basically a bulletproof of everything that he had to find in the last 22 months, surmised in some pages for the attorney general to easily review. To, to review and be able to meet what the attorney general and Robert Mueller know is a tremendous appetite and legitimate public curiosity, again, about this legal moment. Mm -hmm. And these are two people who have a long history in the Justice Department who know politics surrounds the Justice Department. But I do think on the other side of this, Robert Mueller and Bob, Bill Barr want history not to scorch them on their handling of this. And they don't want to appear to be political actors in any shape or form. I think that's their motive and their goal. Whether or not that's going to be the rendered verdict of history, that's going to be for others to decide. But based on my understanding of these two gentlemen and their long history within the Justice Department, it feels the way they're moving and will try to move each and every step of the way. Attorney General Barr said he could share portions of Mueller's report with Congress as soon as this weekend. Many lawmakers are already demanding that the full report be made public. And for more on that fight, I spoke with CBSN political contributor Molly Hooper and CBSN legal contributor Keir Dougal. What's the latest reaction you're hearing from lawmakers? Well, they want full access to the report. They want it to be transparent, and they want to see it now. Um, essentially, you're, we're talking about House Democrats. What really has struck out to, stuck out to me was, in the past hour or so, six of the committee chairmen in the House of Representatives, um, the Democrats who are in charge of committees that are, are investigating various portions of the Trump administration, they issued a letter, um, essentially, to Bill Barr, saying that they want any and all information. Um, underlying evidence uncovered related to their investigations to be released to Congress. And, you know, given that the Justice Department has um, essentially a sitting rule, so to speak, that they don't indict a sitting president, um, the concern is that those committees won't get all the information that in, that is related to the findings of the special counsel as related to President Trump's, um, you know, behavior and his conduct um, in regard to, quote, unquote, collusion. And they want to make sure that they have that information. And, you know, we talk a little bit about not indicting a sitting president. What is your take on that? We've heard from other contributors who disagree with that position. Well, um, when it comes to the other branches of government, because I cover Congress, and I, I'll admit I am a, I am a pro Article One girl. Um, I, I don't. It doesn't. I'm, it's unclear why why the Justice Department takes that tack. But at the, but again, if, when it comes down to it, Congress does have the power to impeach, which is essentially it, it's a political exercise. And again, that's one of the reasons why members of Congress, especially these key committees that are doing investigations into the president, um, who've launched investigations into obstruction of justice, um, public corruption, abuses of power. It's why they want all the information that was uncovered by the special counsel over the past two years in talking to witnesses. You know, one of the, one of the things that happens now that the Mueller report has been issued, it sort of frees up Congress to go, you know, full throttle um, towards their investigations. They can actually talk to the individuals who were, who were previously being, you know, who were under investigation by in a criminal proceeding. Well, that's not happening anymore. So, members of Congress can actually hear from people um, like Ivanka Trump, Donald Trump Jr., individuals who were mentioned by Michael Cohen in that blockbuster testimony he gave before the House Judiciary—I mean, the House Oversight Committee. Mm -hmm. So, so that actually does free them up to to really get into the nitty gritty. But again, they want the information that was uncovered by Bob Mueller. So let's bring in CBSN legal contributor Keir Dougal. Keir, we were talking earlier. They may want that, but they may not get that. Why is that? Right. So the the um, special counsel regulations allow uh, the attorney general, Mr. Barr, to consider a public release as long as it's consistent with with law. So as several other uh, commentators and other folks on the program have said, there are there are some some restrictions. There's grand jury secrecy. Um, material potentially that might be in the report that would have to be taken out. There's potentially privacy information. There's potentially uh, executive privilege material. Uh, those are all things that uh, Mr. Barr might have to scrub out of the report. But um, we've also talked about the Justice Department policy that in cases of really high public interest allows the Justice Department 
to uh, talk about an investigation where nobody is charged. So those are sort of the guardrails on, on either side. You know, what can you and what can't you? And there's a, there's a lot of maneuvering room in the middle there. Mr. Barr will, will be the one to make the decisions in the first instance. But I want to go back to his, uh, his testimony uh, before um, the, the hearing where he was a nominee for the, for the mm -hmm. AG department. He said specifically and repeatedly that his effort would be to make uh, as much transparency, uh, to make the report as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to, for the moment, while we're all sort of trying to figure out what's going to happen next, take him at his, take him at his word. Um, I, I, I think um, he certainly has the discretion to release the, the, the key and core parts of, the, of the, whatever's in that report. And just to echo what you said, in the letter that was released, Barr did say, I remain committed to as much transparency as possible, and I will keep you informed as to the status of my review. So now what will be his timeline? What's the next step? Well, in the letter, um, he himself sort of set expectations for all of us, and mentioning maybe over the weekend. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we're on a, uh, on a very relatively short time frame, um, you know, days, hours. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't expect to see something from tonight. He's going to have to digest it. But uh, certainly by uh, Monday, um, I would think we might start to see uh, information coming from him. And Molly, we've heard some lawmakers suggest that they might call Barr or Mueller to testify before Congress. What's the latest you're hearing about that development? Well I, well, I think that this all depends on how much is released and how much um, is available to the public. But it sounds like Intelligence Committee Chairman um, Adam Schiff is, is particularly keen on on a point that Kier brought up earlier um, in the last hour related to, of course, the counterintelligence portion of this investigation that the special counsel has been been looking into. And, and I, I anticipate uh, Mueller go, coming before the Intelligence Committee, at least the House Intelligence Committee, likely this. Senate Intelligence Committee, too, to answer questions that perhaps will be scrubbed, as, as Keir said, um, from the public, whatever is released publicly, um, you know, and, and, and quite possibly that, that could happen behind closed doors with the House, with members of the House Judiciary Committee as well. Again, it just, it just, it just depends on what is made available to Congress, and, and that's something that the key Judiciary Committee, the four key committee Judiciary Committee leaders here from Bill Barr himself, and that would be Lindsey Graham, the Judiciary Committee chairman, Dianne Feinstein, ranking member over in the Senate, Jerry Nadler, House chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and Doug Collins, the ranking Republican. What they hear from Bill Barr, they can kind of go from there. Okay. Here, a senior Department of Justice official says that the special counsel's office is not recommending any more indictments. So what does that tell you? So um, it— it tells us that um, he's concluded the core part of his investigation, but what we what we have to remember is there are potential um, uh, prosecutions by other components of the Justice Department, U.S. attorneys, and by state officials. We have to remember that Mr. Mueller was really limited in his mandate. He had one job, and it was to look at potential interference with the 2016 election by Russians and charge crimes directly related to that. So um, it sounds like he has charged all of the key players um, in that part As of the investigation. As it pertains to Russia. As it pertains to Russia. Mm -hmm. But this is the big, gigantic question mark that we don't have the answer to yet. Because the department has this policy of not uh, indicting a sitting president, it's still a possibility that that Mr. Mueller discovered facts that would otherwise have led to an indictment of Mr. Trump, because but he didn't indict any didn't indict the president because of that Justice Department policy. It may it may be that that uh, Mr. Mueller did not find any facts that would support an indictment of the president. That's also entirely possible. Mm -hmm. We just don't know, and we won't know until we hear more about what's in this report. Let's say that they did find something to charge the president with, not saying that they did. We have no indication that that is the case. Correct. Would they ever uh, forego that policy and potentially charge the president while so, in office as he is now? So that's a, that's a great, a very interesting question. Um, and, and part of it, it depends on a couple of factors, right? So um, there's a statute of limitations that's running. And the 
and the president, if you if you follow that policy that the president can't be charged, the statute is ticking. And it, it's possible the typical statute is five years. So if Mr. Trump were to be reelected um, in 2020 and sit for eight years, he could run out the clock on um, criminal charges. And that, uh, that, that's, a, that's a strategy that, uh, that he could potentially employ, um, particularly where Congress, the pres because the president's being treated specially under the Justice Department guidelines, there's a good argument to be made that he should be treated specially for statute of limitations purposes as well. That would require an act of Congress. It would require the president to sign off on it which this particular president might be un unwilling to do if he thought that he had criminal exposure. But if you're not going to indict the president while he's sitting in office, there's probably a good argument that the statute of limitations ought to be told or extended or shouldn't run. So Concurrent the, with. Right, with sitting in the office mm -hmm. so the president can't literally use the office of the presidency to hide behind to shield him, him or herself from criminal charges. So... Um, so those are those are those are some of the some of the issues. There are there are, there are also it's a, this is a complicated question, but there are also some there there are also on the other side of the coin there are um, important arguments about distracting a president or policy reasons why a president um, can can say I shouldn't be subject to, to 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 this kind of legal process. I've got better, more important things to do, um, and those are some of the key arguments for why the Justice Department. Uh, has this policy plus you you know Congress if Congress um, finds that the that there's mis misconduct by the president the conduct the, the Congress can start impeachment proceedings and remove him or her from office and the Constitution is clear on this point once the president has um, has been impeached the president is subject to prosecution thereafter but so you're, you you have this difficult situation where a president can literally use the office if he has criminal exposure to shield himself or herself from prosecution under this policy. Convoluted question, but you answered it very well. <laughs> that, that was easy to understand, so thank you. Molly Hooper and, of course, Keir Dougal here both. Thank you so much for your insight. And coming up after a break, we are taking a look at extreme weather worldwide, including millions of people in the Midwest facing flood threats. We're back after a break. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.
Some people in Kansas and Missouri are being urged to evacuate as floodwaters in the Midwest continue to flow downstream. The Missouri River has risen to its highest level in more than 25 years. Flood damages in Iowa and Nebraska are estimated at $3 billion. Five other Midwestern states are still adding up the costs as well. All of this as the Midwest braces itself for more rain this weekend. People in the Florida panhandle are still struggling to recover months after Hurricane Michael slammed the coast. The Category 4 storm, which made landfall last October, killed 45 people and caused more than $6 billion in damage. CBS News national correspondent Manuel Bajorquez is in Panama City, Florida, where he talked to people who are still trying to put their lives back together. Parts of the Florida panhandle look like the hurricane hit just yesterday. But nearly six months out, some folks called this home. We were staying at a hotel for a little while, but you know, like it was like a 126 a night and you just can't do it no more. 17 men, women and children live in a tent city in Shelly Summers' backyard. Those are tears of yeah, gratitude. It's tears of gratitude, happy. They lost their homes and they needed a sense of security and a sense of belonging. But there's also frustration at the pace of recovery. Beyond frustrated. It's pretty much sickening. Dot Hill says if it weren't for Springfield Community Church, she might not have enough to eat. Pastor Eddie Pitt says his team serves up to 1,400 people every week. There's still a need here. In their eyes, they have been forgotten. Unable to clean up, rebuild, or find work, thousands have left. Some places now look like ghost towns. Those who have stayed are finding rents for properties that were spared by the storm because of demand have skyrocketed. It's why Kelly Holloman turned to FEMA. Her family moved into one of the agency's trailers just this week. We're so grateful now for everything that, you know, we have. More than 800 families are currently in temporary government housing, 20,000 more getting FEMA assistance for rent. But that help could run out in about a year. In the hardest hit town, Mexico Beach, we found Bella and Jack Sebastian living in a FEMA trailer among the empty lots. Michael may have trashed their retirement home, but they won't give up on their dream. This is where you will That's be. That's where this I want to stay. It doesn't matter if it's in a car, in a van, in a tent, in a trailer, in a house. It doesn't matter. Mexico Beach is home. Manuel Bajorquez, CBS News, Mexico Beach, Florida. Hundreds of thousands of people in southeastern Africa are desperately awaiting aid one week after a devastating cyclone swept through Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. The port town of Beira in Mozambique was 90% destroyed. Rising floodwaters are complicating frantic aid and rescue efforts. Aid agencies are warning that the disaster is getting worse. Floods have killed hundreds of people so far but many fear the death toll could rise up to 1,000. The Red Cross says experts will be heading to Mozambique in the coming days to help give out clean water and provide shelter. Coming up, the White House says ISIS has been eliminated in Syria. A U.S. defense official says fighting still continues. Plus, we'll have more on the Mueller report. The special counsel's team has charged 34 individuals and three companies since it began nearly two years ago. We'll take a look at how we got here. Stay with us. You're streaming CBSN.
Special Counsel Robert Mueller was on the job for more than 670 days when he handed over his findings to Attorney General William Barr on Friday. For a look at how we got here, here's CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. In May of 2017, the FBI was investigating contacts between Trump associates and Russia during the 2016 presidential campaign when President Trump abruptly fired Director James Comey. The president initially cited Comey's handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation as the reason for his dismissal. But two days later, he pointed to the Russia probe, calling it a, quote, made-up story. Over the next six days, there were more revelations the president had privately asked Comey for his loyalty and to drop part of the investigation. That led Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein to appoint Mueller on May 17th to examine Russian interference in the 2016 election. That investigation grew to include whether the president had obstructed justice. Since then, Mueller charged six Trump associates for crimes ranging from lying to the FBI to tax evasion. They included former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, former campaign chairman Paul Manafort, the president's former personal attorney Michael Cohen, and longtime confidant Roger Stone. All but Stone pleaded guilty and cooperated with the investigation. 25 Russian nationals have been indicted on charges related to hacking or the dissemination of false information. Party. During the campaign, Trump said this amid the controversy surrounding Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. According to Mueller's court filings, that same day, Russian hackers went after the emails of Hillary Clinton staffers, emails that would eventually be leaked. The president's family did not escape scrutiny. Of particular interest, a meeting at Trump Tower in June of 2016, where a Russian lawyer with ties to Putin met with Manafort, the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., and Mr. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. All the while, President Trump denied any collusion with Russia. And I didn't need Russians to help me win Iowa. He also consistently attacked the special counsel and the Justice Department. No collusion, no nothing. Called the phony witch hunt. Special counsel Mueller's investigation may be over, but the fight over what happens with his findings is really just beginning. Democratic candidates for President 2020 were among the first to publicly demand that that report be made public. So let's bring in Joel Payne and Michael Graham. Joel is a Democratic strategist, former Hillary for America senior aide, and a vice president at MWWPR. Michael is a CBSM political contributor and conservative columnist for the Boston Herald. He's also politics editor for NHJournal.com. Thank you both for being here. Big day, 22 months we've been following this closely. And Joel, we've already seen the issue of impeachment divide the Democratic Party. How can this report further fuel those arguments more or maybe put them to rest? Well, it's interesting. You know, if you see the report as a destination, or rather, if you, if you look at the journey versus the destination, the journey here has 30 people indicted, has a lot of doubt cast on whether or not the president had people who were breaking the law on a regular basis around him, whether or not the president himself is implicated in, in criminal behavior himself. So, look, from a standpoint of is the president in hot water um, for his own behavior, it certainly seems like um, the report would indicate that he's escaped that. But the president fostered an environment and led a campaign where there was a lot of bad behavior going on and a lot of uh, people making poor choices and, in some cases, illegal choices. Um, and I don't think, regardless of whatever this report says today, I don't think that the president can escape that. Um, I do think he has messaged overall the, uh, the, the, the issue of the Russia report. He's messaged it pretty well to his base, again, whether or not he can get beyond the fact that these people were around him and were advising him, um, that's to be determined. So, Michael, it doesn't seem, from what we're gathering so far, that right. the president will face any addition or face any charges at this moment. But can the president breathe a sign of relief just yet? Even though we haven't gotten any indication of that, could that still come? Uh, every day that I turn on CBSN, which I watch religiously, and I don't see the president being frog marched out of the White House in handcuffs, I'm pretty amazed. I mean, you know, he's he's got so many app, you know, uh, balls in the air. But I have to say, Joel, nice job trying to spin that. This is a fiasco for the Democrats if, in fact, nobody's uh, indicted from this. This is a fiasco if, in fact, 
there's no presentation of evidence of collusion. <laughs> President Trump has had one premise from the beginning, and that is that this was all a witch hunt, a scam, and that there was no there there. It wasn't, I kind of colluded, or, you know, these all things all get settled in court. No, no, he said it didn't happen. And if that's what, as a Republican, I will say, if that's what we discover, I will be as shocked as anybody. And this is a huge win, and it really does, I think, turn the focus of a lot of casual voters, not the hardcore people who watch it every night on TV or who love Trump and didn't care what it said. I think it does reiterate this notion that Trump has not been treated fairly. He hasn't been given a straight shot by the media or by the government establishments in D.C., and that he is the number one outsider, which is a really strong message, I think, in the 2020 cycle. And speaking of the 2020 cycle, this is for both of you. We are still a long way away, but you know we will be discussing it thoroughly between now and then. Uh, what does this change as far as a political landscape is concerned heading towards that? I mean, I have a list of all of the candidates that have already tweeted that they want to see this made public immediately. They want to have every detail at their fingertips. So um, who wants to take it first? Go ahead. Joel, tell me what you think. I'll, I'll start. Uh, I know Michael likes the counterpunch. Um, <laughs> I don't think it changes a thing. Um, I think that, you know, look, Michael's certainly right. The president has had one story the entire time in terms of his involvement, um, and, and that's fine. And I think that's kind of big. You know, that was the point I was making before. The president has done a really good job of selling this to his base and keeping his base with him. Um, I do think we still have to see whether or not that's going to have an impact on independence. But in terms of how Democrats, how those hopefuls are going to go after President Trump, listen, nothing that happened today changes the fact that 30 people connected to this president and his campaign were indicted as a part of this. The fact that Michael Cohen, the president's one-time close personal confidant, is going to jail for three years. The fact that the president's former campaign chair is going to jail for almost a decade and probably going to um, end up dying in jail. Um, those are all significant facts that whatever happens today can't be missed. So it's a mixed bag. Um, it's certainly something, again, that the president can say, I've always said that this is my case, this is, this is the case that I've made. But whether or not the president can completely divorce himself from any kind of responsibility here, I don't think voters are going to let him off the hook for that. All right, Michael, take it away. So uh, there's a certain other network, I'm not going to mention the names, but it rhymes with Ben BC, who've started talking in the last 48 hours. Hey, can we even trust the Mueller report? And it is that sort of kind of paranoia, conspiracy, you know, the, the notion that Trump is going to get away with this. We can't let him get away with this. It really feeds the least productive element inside the Democratic uh, uh, party. The candidates who are trying to make the case, I want to do something differently, I, whatever, I think, you know, Trump's been negative or we're leaving people behind or our foreign policy, whatever. That's a strong case, I think, to make for a president who's consistently underwater nationally by around 10 points. But the case that's more on the Elizabeth Warden kind of, maybe even Ocasio-Cortez kind of, we've got to get him, you know, we just, uh, that, that, that kind of anger and, and fraught with emotion, I don't think that that's a winning message. And I think that if Trump walks away and appears to be validated, that branch of the Democratic coalition is going to be very angry very frustrated, and they're going to look for the first person who picks up a pitchfork and says, let's charge the barricades. Okay, so on that point, Michael, after all this talk of a witch hunt, uh, Russia hoax, does it seem like Americans will feel confident in Mueller's findings? Do you think, I know you talked about networks in particular, but right. what about the American people? You know, I think that one thing that Joel got right, and it pains me to say that, Joel, but I <laughs> think, right, a lot of this is baked in. The Trump lovers were going to ignore whatever it said. You know, they could come out with photos of Trump handing a big file mark collusion to Putin, and they would still stick. The people who hate Trump, they don't care. You could have, you know, whatever testimony. So that part is there. I do think, though, like I said, that there are a group of Americans— as the economy does so well, I thought it was interesting. The Wall Street Journal did a piece today where they said, let's skip the polls. Let's look at the economic uh, uh, metrics that have been used in the past to predict elections. There are these economists who look at things like unemployment, whatever. All of those metrics that have been pretty successful in the past show Trump winning big because the economy is in good shape. And so if Trump can go back and say, look, I told you these people were crazy. I'm just trying to create jobs. I'm just trying to take on China. I'm just trying to help blue collar workers in the Rust Belt. This really, I, I think that, that if this turns out to be a flop, 
it might open the door for some of those swing voters. There aren't a lot left. Trump makes a lot of people like him and hate him. But for those 5 8 percent people who are open, I think this cracks the door a bit more for them to say, maybe we should give the guy another chance. So, Joel, going back to some of what Michael just said, we've already seen the issue of impeachment divide the Democratic Party. How can this report further fuel those arguments more or maybe even put them to rest? You know, I think those, those that has been put to rest. And, you know, I know a lot was made about uh, Speaker Pelosi talking about this a few weeks ago. But really, if you look at it, it's been a relatively fringe issue in the Democratic Party. Um, and by fringe, I don't mean the people who are talking about it. I'm talking about the percentage of people who are discussing impeachment. There's not a lot of Democrats that are campaigning on that. I think I saw a study that in the 2018 midterms, you know, something like less than 3 percent of candidates on the Democratic side even mentioned impeachment impeachment in their campaign materials, online, or in ads, which tells me that Democrats understand that this is not what voters are going to primarily judge them vis-a-vis -vis President Trump on. Uh, voters are going to judge them on how they do uh, with health care, how they do with the economy, how they counter President Trump and his rhetoric. That's what Democrats are going to be judged on. That's what Democrats are going to continue to be judged on. And again, I don't think anything that happened tonight changes that. I think, like Michael said, people who are already going to vote for Donald Trump as a, as a kind of a, a way to stick it to the FBI or, or, or to the, the powers that be, the right. God, data, the terms that they use, um, they're already, they're, they were going to do that and they're going to continue to do that. The people who were going to not believe President Trump, regardless of whatever came out tonight, they're going to feel that way. It's that, that group in the middle that can be moved. And um, I think we've got about 18 months in a campaign to see how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. Joel Payne and Michael Graham, thank you both for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. And the White House said Friday that all ISIS-held territory in Syria has been, quote, 100 percent eliminated. But U.S. allies say, allies say that the battle isn't over yet. CBS News foreign correspondent Charlie Daggett reports from northern Syria. The president declared victory after being briefed aboard Air Force One that the so-called ISIS caliphate there's had ISIS been completely eliminated. Right you look, so there's ISIS, and that's what we have right now. As of last night, that's what we have right now. You guys can have the map. Congratulations. But nobody here is cheering just yet. U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces say there's still heavy fighting underway tonight against remaining ISIS holdouts. Hiding out in tunnels and caves beneath the cliffs SDF soldiers took us to earlier this week, overlooking the last ISIS encampment inside Baghouz. SDF officials say they found an extensive network of tunnels beneath that camp that still needs clearing. But in terms of holding territory, the president's statement may be accurate, as we've seen for ourselves. ISIS has been driven out of or beneath any ground it can still call its own. While the defeat of ISIS on the ground is a major milestone, America's allies here say they're worried it will hasten the withdrawal of U.S. troops. They've been a vital part of this fight. 2,000 American forces, along with tens of thousands of U.S. and coalition airstrikes, finally cornered ISIS into a tiny sliver of land along the Euphrates River. They're no longer defending any territory. There are just a number left who simply refuse to give up. The president's statement came as a surprise here, but it's not exactly a contradiction. Few would argue that ISIS holds any territory on that map the president held up. But they won't declare victory here until the fighting is over. Alex? Well, two American soldiers were killed in Afghanistan Friday. Their names have not yet been released. Officials say that the incident that led to their deaths is still under investigation. This comes as the U.S. is trying to reach a peace agreement with the Taliban. About 14,000 U.S. troops are still in the country fighting America's longest war. The president has ordered the Pentagon to begin making plans to bring half of them home. Boeing lost a big contract on Friday in a letter to the company. Indonesia's national airline requested to cancel its order of 49 737 MAX 8 jets, citing a loss of trust among its passengers for the MAX 8 model. The Indonesian deal was worth nearly $5 billion. This comes as Boeing faces two new lawsuits over last year's Lion Air crash. Families of the victims claim that the company designed a defective flight control system and failed to address the problem once they realized this. 
These lawsuits, they come after another crash involving the MAX 8 model on Ethiopian Airlines. Investigators are expected to give an update on the latest findings in the coming days on that. And Boeing will be presenting a new update for its 737 MAX jets, which will include a warning light that was previously optional. In Spacewatch, NASA has completed its first spacewalk of the year. Astronauts Nick Haig and Anne McLean kicked off the 24th ISS spacewalk Friday morning. Haig was part of the Soyuz rocket crew that failed to launch last October. It took both astronauts six and a half hours to upgrade the International Space Station solar power system. McLean will be featured in another spacewalk next Friday to upgrade batteries. It will be NASA's first ever all-female spacewalk. Most children bring their favorite toy wherever they go, but one little girl has a different companion than others. Steve Hartman has a touching story about an unbreakable bond on the road. A lot of kids go to the park to see ducks, but eight-year-old Kylie Brown of Freeport, Maine, takes her duck to see the park. As we first reported a few years ago, Snowflake goes into the pond and then returns when called because Snowflake truly believes that Kylie is his mother, and the duck is not alone in this delusion. I'm his mom. But you're not really his mom. Yep, I'm his mom. How did you first find out? That he was a duck? No, that... <laughs> Kylie is unbearably cute. <laughs> and since I never did recover to ask that question again... <laughs> Let me just tell you that Kylie first noticed Snowflake's attachment the day the Browns brought him home. Look, 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 he follows her. For whatever reason, the duck imprinted on Kylie and just had to be by her side, no matter what the hour. <laughs> when Snowflake refused to stay in the backyard, Kylie's parents, Ashley and Mike, say they had no choice but to give him a diaper and make him a house duck. He goes everywhere the ducks are allowed and almost everywhere they're not allowed. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had a two-year-old or a four-year-old that wouldn't leave home without its blankie. She, Anxiety. Uh, yeah, she would not leave home without her duck. Come on, Snowflake. And at that point, nothing's negotiable. Snowflake! Snowflake goes to the beach in summer and sledding in winter. He's been to soccer practice, gone on sleepovers. He even went trick-or-treating as Olaf, the snowman from Frozen. And over time because they both sincerely believe they belong together. Snowflake and Kylie have formed a bond like most of us will never know. It's special that I know that that's the type of person that she's gonna be. Since we first told this story in 2016, Kylie has gotten even more motherly. She taught Snowflake how to read, or at least not eat the words. Speak away. She also taught him the value of community service, signing him up to be a therapy duck. And, of course, she knows just what to do whenever her little one needs help falling asleep. Kylie really is going to make a great mom someday, mostly because <laughs> she always has been. You know, someday he's going to grow up and go to college. What? Steve Hartman, on the road, <laughs> in Freeport, Maine. She is absolutely precious. Well, coming up in our next hour, the special counsel's Russia investigation is over after nearly two years and dozens of indictments. The Justice Department says Congress may see some of the Mueller's report's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. We are back after a break. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.
This is America's latest superhero. Don't forget to show love. This is his kindergarten class. This one-time school administrator is now architect. This is just some of her army. I want other people to know what they can do to their neighborhoods. This is doable. This history is still living. This is a miracle! So this is working. Oh, it's working. We turn now to a CBS News investigation. The potential danger that may be looming in the sky. We're an accident waiting to happen. Warm tires, warm brakes. Senators sent a letter to the FAA following our investigation. So to you, that would be a red flag? It would be a field of red flags. Those things keep me up at night. There is a growing outbreak of a mosquito-borne virus linked to birth defects. Glacia da Silva's daughter Gigi was born with microcephaly. Sim, a gente não se sabe se ela vai andar, se ela vai falar. It's an emotional journey for families and doctors alike. There's no handbook for this. You're learning as you go along. Doctors are bracing for the next outbreak. This is a haunting menace. This is extraordinary. This is fascinating. This is amazing. This is real. This is bigger than opening up the borders. This is exactly what fire crews were afraid of. This is what they have to contend with. This is where the eye wall passed over. This, 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 this. The answer is this. This is kind of crazy. Esports has gone up like a rocket. Boom, straight up. I'm living a dream for a lot of people. The money that's coming in now is insane. You can see the stress in their face and in their eyes, which is why we have all these terrible issues with burnout. I get worried about hot money screwing this up. No, I'm not just playing a game for fun anymore. This is the scene in Tijuana today. Earlier, hundreds of the... You used to live in the U.S. Yes. By all intents and purposes, you were an American. Yeah. Rafa has a young son. He wants to see him grow up in the U.S. like he did. We were alerted to yet another shooting here. I got shot with a 38. You afraid of Jacob getting shot? Yeah. As a parent, I'll do whatever it takes to get my son to the next step. This is extraordinary. This has altered your life. This is for the worst of Florence. This is bigger, though, than opening up the border. This is historic. This, this. This is extraordinary. This is fascinating. This is, this is, this is, this is real. This is bigger than opening up the borders. This is exactly what fire crews were afraid of. This is what it's like covering a story here in China. This is an explosive investigation. This is amazing. This is all campaign 2020. This is what an ISIS retreat looks like. This is where the eye wall passed over. This, this, this. The answer is this. CBS News has just learned that special counsel Robert Mueller has submitted his long-awaited report to Attorney General William Barr. No matter what this report says, Congress is pushing to see as much of it as possible. Now, legally, Barr only has an obligation to brief Congress. He has no obligation to release anything to the public. Well, the White House says ISIS has been defeated in Syria. So there's ISIS, and that's what we have right now, as of last night. That's what we have right now. You guys can have the map. Congratulations. Is it really over yet? And that is, uh, is strictly a judgment call. A lot of kids go to the park to see ducks. But eight-year-old Kylie Brown of Freeport, Maine, takes her duck to see the park. CBSN starts now. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Dennis. Thank you for joining us. The so-called witch hunt is over. After 22 months, special counsel Robert Mueller has finished his investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. The probe has resulted in dozens of indictments for federal crimes reaching members of the president's inner circle, his campaign, and Russian citizens as well. The findings are now in the hands of Attorney General William Barr. During his confirmation in January, Barr said that he would try to be as transparent as possible about the report, but stopped short of promising to release it. 
The Justice Department says Congress could see principal conclusions of the report as soon as this weekend. A senior Justice Department official has told CBS News that Mueller is not recommending any further indictments. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer called for the report to be made public. Now that Special Counsel Mueller has submitted his report to the Attorney General, it's imperative for Mr. Barr to make the full report public and provide its underlying documentation and findings to Congress. Attorney General Barr must not give President Trump, his lawyers, or his staff any sneak preview of Special Counsel Mueller's findings or evidence. And the White House must not be allowed to interfere in decisions about what parts of those findings or evidence should be made public. CBS News Washington correspondent Paula Reed reports from the White House. The report was delivered by a security officer to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein this afternoon. He passed it to Attorney General William Barr within minutes. The White House and the president's lawyers were notified beginning at 430. And at 5 p.m., this letter was delivered to the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. In it, Barr wrote, the special counsel has submitted to me today a confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions he has reached. Barr added, he may be in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. The report is described as comprehensive and very few people have seen it. The Justice Department would not comment on its length. Washington has been anticipating the report for weeks, with camera crews watching every movement outside special counsel Robert Mueller's offices in a nondescript building in downtown Washington. Even the president didn't know when it was coming. He spoke to reporters on his way to Mar-a-Lago this morning. I have no idea about the Mueller report. I'm going to Florida. But that didn't stop him from criticizing the probe. Uh, there was no collusion. There was no obstruction. Everybody knows it. It's all a big hoax. It's, I call it the witch hunt. In a statement, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said the White House has not received or been briefed on the report. The president's attorney said they were pleased Mueller had delivered his report and said Attorney General Barr will determine appropriate next steps. According to the law, it's up to Barr to decide how much of the report to make public. Earlier this week, the president said he should release the whole thing. Let it come out. Let people see it. But before Congress, Barr has only promised to follow the law. My goal will be to provide as much transparency as I can consistent with the law. Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a statement, it is imperative for Mr. Barr to make a full report public, and the White House must not be allowed to interfere. And 2020 presidential candidates took to Twitter to demand the report be released now. I want to go ahead now and bring in CBSN political reporter Caitlin Huey Burns, CBSN legal contributor Kerr Dougal, who is also here, former assistant U.S. attorney in the New York Eastern District. We've been talking about this extensively about how uh, monumental this is in the history of the legal proceedings here in our country. Just kind of touch on the importance of what is actually happening here. So um, really what's at stake is, um, as Major said earlier, our core um, institutions. Will they hold up? They are under the most intense scrutiny, um, you know, in our history right now. Um, and the key principle at stake is whether or not um, no one is above the law. Does the law apply to all of us um, or are there special exceptions? That's that's really what's at stake right now. So in addition, you know, do do we is Congress going to step up and take its role of, of oversight? Uh, you know, um, you know, do we think that um, that uh, we've gotten to the bottom of these core concerns that we have? Um, will there be transparency? I mean, these are all core functions, core parts of our credo as a Republican form of government um, for 240 years. I mean, we really, it's hard to overstate how important this moment is. Caitlin, let's talk about um, where this may go for Congress. Do you think mm -hmm. they could force the hand of the attorney general to release more of the report if they, if their appetites are not 
you know, fulfilled with what he chooses to release to them. Oh, certainly. And Democrats control the House now, so they are in charge of the various committees of jurisdiction. And they have been saying for a while now that they want everything to come out uh, from this investigation. You've also seen some Democrats point to James Comey. And when James Comey came out during the 2016 election to talk about his findings about Hillary Clinton's emails, they're kind of evoking that as now the standard set uh, and wanting to uh, have transparency here. You also hear some Democrats calling for uh, William Barr and Robert Mueller to come before Congress at some point to testify about these findings so they could glean more information from that. And then as we've been talking about, too, there are all these other threads involved in this, from Michael Cohen uh, to other actors involved that we're waiting to see what comes down from those probes going on in the Southern Districts, for example. And you also have little bits of information that have come out that other committees could start to look into further. And let's bring in CBSN political contributor Molly Hooper. We've seen a number now of 2020 Democratic presidential candidates. Many of them are lawmakers themselves that have put more mm -hmm. pressure on Barr to make as much of this report public as he can. Do you think that that is a legitimate request? Well, well, they have put pressure on Barr, but again, Barr is somebody who's about procedures and about Department of Justice regulations. And I think what may have more sway with Barr is when you hear or you see six of the the House Democratic Committee chairmen who just issued a who just released a statement, including Judiciary Chairman Nadler, who basically said, "Listen, the Justice Department must now release to the public the entire report submitted by the Special Counsel because." Um, you know, if, if there is information in that report that the president has engaged in criminal or other serious misconduct, then they cannot conceal that information. And because the Justice Department believes that they cannot um, indict a sitting president, the concern by these committee chairmen is that, for some, you know, in some case, um, they made the president, the information that would be out there that could indict him, won't be made public. And so they're saying, you know, to withhold evidence of wrongdoing from Congress because a sitting president cannot be charged, is to convert Justice Department policy into the means for a cover-up. Now, that may hold a little bit more sway with Bill Barr, and it's something that I know Adam Schiff and Nadler and these other committee chairmen will be pushing for as they request, you know, a briefing of the, the entire, the entire uh, Mueller report. So, Karen, I want to ask you this. We touched on it a little bit earlier. Typically, people that are not indicted of a crime, if they and their names show up in this report, their identity is protected. But there was kind of a left turn when Comey talked about Hillary Clinton and her private email server, and then she never faced any charges. Do you think that that set a precedent that maybe now we are going to see more information come out and other names released because that happened originally? So I need to be very, very clear about this. We've all been describing this rule correctly, that in the general case— 99.9% .9 of the time, if somebody is the subject of an investigation but they're not charged, the Justice Department says nothing. There is a very important exception to this policy, and it's been on the books for a long time, long before Mr. Comey gave his press release, uh, his press conference in July of 2016, where it's a matter of intense public concern. The Justice Department is, under its own policy, it is entitled and may it's a judgment call. It's a discretionary call, but they can alert the public to a danger, for instance. They can, where there's intense public scrutiny, they can make an announcement about an unindicted uh, individual. And it's particularly here, I just want to touch on what Molly said, right? Uh, turning um, the policy into a, into a cover-up. One part of the policy says the president can't be indicted. That's Justice Department uh, practice or policy. To then turn around and say that, well, because he wasn't indicted... We can't say anything. It just it, it creates a sort of an impossible situation. Um, the, 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 the other core thing to remember here is um, the president is a unique individual because he's the president. He's got this giant bullhorn. He's been using it on, on Twitter. He's been he's been saying all sorts of things publicly about this investigation. And so now to, to not hear the rejoinder, to hear what the professionals in on Mueller's team have spent two years doing with the best um, techniques, the best evidence gathering ability and the best facts to not hear what uh, the result of that investigation um, would be, I think, would be completely unsatisfactory to to the public and ultimately to Congress. Let's go to bring in.